We are now live. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Kinsella. So I will call the Tuesday, November 16th uh, meeting to order. And this is for the purpose of uh, 2022 budget deliberation. Uh, so yesterday we were able to conclude with Mr. Eamon uh, giving us an overview of the operating budget. And as indicated, we will begin jump right into Infrastructure and Planning Division with uh, Mr. Richard Gagnon. Hopefully he's available with all the snow we're having. Uh, him and maybe some of his directors are out clearing streets and looking after our citizens. But uh, if we're ready to go, um, Jeremy, are you doing introductions of people? Uh, to your worship, yes, I would just like to introduce Mr. Richard Gagnon to present the public works overview and budget. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eamon, and thank you, your worship. Uh, good morning, your worship and members of council. My name is Richard Gagnon. I'm the public works director, and I'm presenting the 2022 public works budget located on, uh, I believe it's section five of your budget binder. Assisting with this presentation, uh, Mr. Brian Rogers, Managers of Roads and Utility Services, Janelle Hart, Manager of Parks Services, and Stuart Gerber, Transit Supervisor. I will open saying that, as you know, we are basically within a foot of snow everywhere. And then uh, I would like to acknowledge all the public works staff working right now to make sure that our city remains safe, removing the snow from our street, from uh, uh, our sidewalks and trail, and also for those who are uh, picking up all the, the waste and garbage at the residential. It's going to be a little bit of a long day, but uh, we're on it. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge all the staff who are involved in providing services during uh, uh, such a difficult day. Um, Public Works oversees the operation and maintenance of our road system, city parks, transit services, as well as, uh, as well as utilities, including water sewer waste management. Under our roads, parks and transit business units, we provide a total of 13 programs as listed in 5.3 uh, of your budget binder. A few examples include cemetery operation, playgrounds and outdoor venue maintenance, Snow clearing and ice control, something that will be popular today. Local and commuter transit services, just to name a few. Please note that the utilities section managed by our department will be addressed a little bit later in a separate uh, presentation found in section nine, as uh, this is a function founded under the founded under the utility rates. In 2022, our department will be focusing on completing a few projects initiated in previous years. Parks will be focusing on completing the Fort Center Park Phase 1 design and Class 2 pricing, as well as the new natural playground. Transit operation is also scheduled to be transitioned to the new Regional Transit Commission in 2022. In budget 2022, our focus is on continuing the implementation of our roads growth plan, also investing in a West River Edge area through the development of a master plan, tree planting, and securing ongoing funding for activities at this popular site, and providing also additional snowbank rinks in the South Fort neighborhood. I'd like to highlight a few significant program change changes in 2022, either financially or in the delivery of our service, this can be found in page 5.3 and 5.4 of your budget binder. Starting with our trails and pathway maintenance program, in note number two, the city is scheduled to start maintaining the Highway 15 pedestrian bridge across the North Saskatchewan River in 2022. The cost is shared with uh, Sturgeon County. The cost of the city to the city is tw in 2022 is $17,000. This item was approved by council uh, earlier in 2018. Under our playgrounds and outdoor venue maintenance, in note number four, you will see additional costs for adding winter activities to the West River Edge area, such as creating and maintaining and monitoring the skating loop, uh, creating an ice slide, and the one-time cost associated with developing a West River Edge master plan. 
These will be discussed further later in this presentation. We also anticipate upgrading the South Fort Meadows outdoor rink in late 2022 at a cost of $15,555. Additional operating costs will be occurring in 2023 when we are operating this new facility for a full year in 2023. In roads, the cost of the roads growth plan budget is allocated to four road programs. So please refer to note five, six, seven, and eight for the detail, the detail cost breakdown uh, in these programs. In note number seven, additional revenue for the light turning program is about $20,000, which is anticipated due to the fee increase associated with inflation. Please move to the transit slide, please. Thank you. The city manages a local transit service around the city and a commuter transit service to Edmonton. 2022 shall see these two programs transi transitioning to the Edmonton Metro Transit Service Commission. In reference to Note 9, our local transit service program projects one-time reduction in revenue for advertising and fare due to the effect of the pandemic. This is this is for a total for a sixty two thousand four hundred and fifteen. The same applies for our commuter service program to Edmonton with a revenue reduction of twenty one thousand nine hundred and seventy four. This represents about twenty percent reduction in revenue that what we used to see prior to the pandemic. We made a one time contract adjustment a decrease of 84,899 to offset these revenue shortfall. This is possible as ETS decreased their rates in 2021. Public Works brings forward five budget requests for council consideration in 2022. I will now present budget request 320061, roads growth plan, starting on page 55 of your budget binder. The total cost is 99237 over the next two years. It includes the wages and benefit for one full-time operator at $75,205 in 2022, and the remaining amount of $24,030 in 2023. The request supports four roads program, roads and bridge maintenance, snow clearing and ice control, traffic control and lighting, and storm water drainage and ditches. These program falls under quarter, quartile one and two. In general, roads program score high in the following items, demand population serve and safe community. This request is important to public works and the roads business unit as it provides resources to maintain service level uh, as the community growth. This is year two of a multi-year plan. Please note that this budget request is also aligned with cattle project 22020 that you saw yesterday for a loader, for the purchasing of the loader with bucket and snow blade in 2022. Uh, Mr. Brian Rogers, manager of roads and utilities will join me in answering your questions. Okay, thank you. And if we can keep our questions more specific to about the service level, um, I believe we'll probably discuss all the personnel requests at the uh, towards the end of the budget or somewhere through the budget. Uh, is that correct, Mr. Fleming? That we'll hear all of them. Are you with us? Uh, yes, through your worship, there isn't an intent to present. Um, all the personnel requests as a grouping there, they go with each department and the director can speak to them at the time. So. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. So on this one, um, Councillor Harris, you're first. Um, I have no questions at this time. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Blizzard. Are we be able to ask questions about anything he presented or just this budget request? So, Mr. Gagnon, are you going back the items that were in the specific adjustment notes? Are they going to be included throughout this presentation? 
yes, uh, if you want, uh, because I'm the first one here with operation, what we can do, if you have any question regarding the previous note, that's okay. Uh, we can discuss that. And then if you, after that, we can uh, discuss the road growth plan. So I did not take a pause uh, after my general comments on the budget, so. Okay, so I would open it up to either or. Yeah. So I'll go back. Um, Councillor Harris, do you have anything on the uh, uh, adjustment and uh, notes? No. Okay, all right, Councillor Blizzard. So on this one or the previous information provided. Uh, just a couple little questions. One is the uh, tree planting. Um, I walk around West River's Edge. Do we do anything to try and prevent beaver damage, you know, killing our trees that were just planted? Um, Your Worship, to Councillor Blizzard, um, when we have uh, complaints regarding um, the uh, any beavers in the area, uh, basically these are handled through um, uh, either parks or our road uh, program or uh, stormwater because it may affect that. And basically uh, it's uh, referred to um, a contractor that will basically either relocate or, um, or eliminate the problem. Okay, I'm just wondering, there's no thing like, you know, for rabbits, you can put a chain at the bottom of a tree. You can't do that for beavers, they go higher? No, not at this time. We don't uh, handle it that way. Okay, and one more, uh, West River's Edge skating. Um, the skating thing was excellent last year. Do we have the washrooms open later to account for people skating later into the evening? I believe our washrooms at West River Edge, Councillor Blizzard, are open until 8 o'clock p.m. Okay. But the skating, isn't it open till even later than that? I'm just wondering if we could align if people are using it or do we monitor that? Uh, last year, there was a, a trial, so basically, I think we had people up to about nine, ten o'clock at, at that time. Um, I will. Uh, this is if we do align that, we're going to have to basically have to have discussion with facilities to see if they can provide that service a little bit longer, uh, okay. and we can adjust our service level that way. Okay, okay. nothing on this request. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Noyan. Good morning. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Richard. It was, it was very comprehensive, and I appreciate you referencing the pages in this this budget so we can follow along. My question has to do with tree planting. There's a hundred thousand dollar allocation for tree planting. According to the map, it looks like the the, the trees uh, for for 2021 it says to be planted are basically going along where the natural area currently is. I'm wondering if uh, it's been considered. If if there is the budget uh, in the reserve to plant trees, and that's what it needs to be used for, that's an assumption. If there's a better place to put these trees, and also if maybe we could take uh, some of the trees from north of West River's Edge Pavilion, where there's about the equivalent of a small forest, and and use those instead of uh, using the reserve. Uh, I'm just wondering if these ideas have been considered. Um, you were shipped to Councillor um, um, Ryan just before I get into the details here. Um, my presentation is not fully completed and I'm going to be basically talking about tree planting that program a little bit later in my presentation over the next few slides. Okay. Um, I, was, I basically stopped uh, in the middle here of my presentation to address some of the uh, questions that may occur about my previous statements and then this road growth plan as well. So kind of like what we did with the uh, capital budget. So unless uh, you would like me to complete my presentation fully so I can basically go over all budget requests and then open to all questions if needed, uh, I'm open to, uh, to, um, to suggestion here. I see. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait for the, the rest of your presentation. I didn't realize that. Thanks. Okay, so what I might suggest, uh, Mr. Gagnon, is if it's something that's not in the uh, further behind in the um, in your presentation, we, uh, we can address that. But if it's that and just let us know if it is. Just say it'll come yep. come shortly, and then we can move on from there. Otherwise, there may be something that isn't that's smaller. Okay, uh, Councillor Noyan, did you have another question? Uh, that'll be all for now. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Thank you, um, Richard, for your presentation. And like you rightly said, today's a terrible day, and we're glad that those staff are out there, you know, trying to make our lives better, right? 
Um, so my question is, um, it seems like you're trying to completely phase out the contracted services, um, um, and not, well, not program, the, the portion of contracted services for roads and making them staff. And my question is, does that make us cost effective? Because if you're getting staff, you're, you're going to have to pay for their benefits. You're going to have to get equipment, like you said, you know, because we're having to hire all the staff. We're going to have to get equipment that they're going to have to use. And as they buy, the, we, have, we buy equipment, we need to maintain it. We need to replace it. So does, that's in my head just sounds like additional, additional, additional costs. And you have a, a growth plan for the next four or five years and the number of people you're going to be hiring, including equipment. Um, so but why is this a better solution than the contracted services, which we currently do? Because, um, I mean, I, we're, we currently are meeting service level, right? So why is this a better deal than what we currently have? Your worship to Councillor Bitaye, what we're looking at is addressing not only uh, you know some of the pressures we have now, but also uh, uh, the future, the growth. So we uh, city service need a core of of people and equipment to provide services, and we don't rely only on contractor to do the work, especially for roads like days like this. A good example is uh, a day like this, and uh, if we rely only on contractor, they, and if municipalities are like this, uh, then everybody will be pulling, uh, you know, to get contractors to get the work done, and it may be difficult. So you need a minimum of staff and a minimum of uh, equipment in order to maintain the roads of our city. Um, I would like to maybe bring uh, Mr. Uh, Rogers on the operational side of this and maybe discuss a bit about, you know, uh, the benefit of uh, the staff and equipment over uh, the contractor, if that's possible. Good morning, Your Worship Council. Uh, through Your Worship, Council of Toy, um, Mr. Gagnon is correct. Uh, just a quick snapshot of, of today. Um, I've redirected some of my utility staff to help out with snow operations today. So by redirecting two of the utility staff, there's a couple of things we've had to put off on the utilities operations, which is the water and wastewater side. So I've got a gentleman out in the loader that's going to go to the fire hall. I've got another gentleman that's in a plow truck. Um, we've had a, an, a, an incident today where, where we've had a very heavy snowstorm. And, and as a group here, we work amazingly together. And I'm fortunate to have a couple staff on the utility side that came from roads. So we, we, we balance off back and forth. So we're at that point where I'm always looking for some help. Um, there is a good balance between contract and, and having your staff. Um, I can contract so many things, but also if you get into certain events, unless you have a service agreement in place, which we do with a local contractor right now, um, when you get something bigger, everybody else is looking for those contractors also at the same time. So you, you'd have to have something in place long term. The benefit of having some staff full year is I'm, we're just focusing on the snow portion of it, but that equates into the summertime. Um, as my staff get get up, we, we're, we have good retention. They get more holidays. They get more time off. We still have jobs we need to do. Those jobs don't change. Those jobs, jobs increase with the, with the size of, of the city. Um, this year, we, we took over some of the, the line painting. Um, we did some some line painting in house. We've got a small line painter. We did some parking lots, some crosswalks. So that took back from a contract cost uh, in a different aspect, not on the snow side. In the future, I'd like to look at doing some more of the small concrete work, um, basic sidewalks, stuff like that. When it gets a little more intricate with curbs, grades, things like that, we'll still go with the contract. Um, there is that fine balance and we will never be without contracted services. It's just in what aspect can we use them? Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, one of the things you, you had mentioned in your agenda in the in the package is that we need to hire people also to cover people when they go on vacation. And actually, this is something I noticed in most of the staff requests. And so, maybe for that reason, maybe I can flag the the um, all the staff requests um, because it's something I noticed with. Um, um, we're asking for staff that would come and cover for people going on vacation. And so that's, that's to me, doesn't really make sense. So I, I, can, I really like to understand that. Um, but my question though to you, my second question is, 
Um, one second, actually, let me just quickly look at it here. So is your next question regarding staff as well? No, it's regarding this specific um, request. One second, but um, but I guess I'm going to flag all staff requests. Okay, well, as we go through, I'll, uh, we'll check with, uh, I'll just make a note and then I'll have to ask at the end. Um, so then uh, everybody else has a chance to ask questions. But uh, you've had a little more than two, so I'm going to uh, move on. Okay. And Yes, no, one question and my second question is, um, so you had said that um, I, I understand the convenience part of it. Okay, we like for the convenience of it, you know, we want to, you know, move all these contracts and services to staff. But what, in terms of the costs, what's the difference in like the financial impact to, the, um, to, um, to our bottom line? Is it the same? Is it more? As we as we um, start to hire that that make this contracted contractor staff. Your worship to Councillor Bittori, I will just uh, take a first uh, and hopefully I understand this question. Uh, and when we look at contracted services, we try to isolate something that needs to be done and that can be done in a short period of time or something that is not ongoing. So. For example, like today, we're going to have most likely contracted services to help us to clear the snow, right? With this, so it's a short-term thing, and maybe a day or two. Yes, yeah, so and, and, and that works. And and the cost of that um, as a benefit only for the period that you use them. So if we have contracted services for a month or five days or something like that, that's what you get the benefit on. In this case, it is more than just a contract to maintain certain area like snow removal. This is about the whole maintenance of the entire road program. And 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 this is about meeting growth, meeting growth with um, a minimum of staff that we need in order to basically provide the service on an ongoing basis. So this is where the benefit is. In terms of costs, well, uh, there's we pay wages and, and, and as you know, we also pay uh, benefits and everything else. We train our staff that a health is, there's a health and safety that is required and they need the tools to do their work done to get so, the work done. Chef, you know, you're, not, you're not answering my question. My question is in terms of the financial impact, because what you've said is that by 2024, we're going to fully yeah. phase out the contracted services 100% to staff. So my question is now that once they become staff, is the financial impact the same as as when they were contractors, or is it more, is it less? My first evaluation will be a little bit more. I don't think it's going to be even out. Uh, I think that what we had uh, added was $160,000, I believe, last year. And that was mainly for, if I recall, well, snow removal. And then if you look at uh, basically uh, four staff coming in, just wages and uh, and uh, and benefits and everything else, it will be more than 160, but your benefit will be longer than just snow removal like we're using that, we may use that money for. All right, thank you, Richard. Okay, thank you. And as the chair, I'm going to ask when I uh, indicate that more than one question has been asked that it do be, uh, that it is respected, because quite often there's two or three questions within one question. So um, please respect that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Macon, you're next. Um, thanks, Richard, and thanks, Brian, for your comments as well. I don't have any questions on this budget request. Mayor Ketcher, I would just... Um, I guess recommend when we're done one group, could we just ask if there's any questions on the whole? Um, I do have some other questions, but I think they might be answered later on. But if we get a chance at the end of each grouping to ask any further questions, then that would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, and as we get into the individual requests, that's what uh, we were doing yesterday as well. Um, this one, he just didn't take a pause. So uh, that's why we ended up with two of them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly. No questions on the on the roads plan and um, we'll see what happens in the next presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have no questions on the roads plan. I do have one on your page 53, the 17,500 for the pedestrian bridge. Um, we don't even know when that's going to be open. So, um, 
how do we have confirmation that we are going to have to maintain it and the cost? Your Worship, to Councillor, uh, uh, to Your Worship, um, the assumption we had is that the bridge will be uh, open uh, in uh, October, on the fall of 2022. So basically, that's the portion to cover that. So this is so there'll be more costs. There'll be more costs going into. So you're saying that's 25 percent. I will ask uh, maybe Mr. Schaefer to confirm, but I believe that uh, it's uh, it's close to uh, maybe uh, 30, 40 percent at this time. Um, Your Worship, so with, I, based on that, um, sorry, when we set the budget up, um, originally we didn't have a, a hard date for year of opening or date of opening, so that is the full year um, projection for, for maintenance um, when we put that in there as an operating impact. Um, so it, it, we're not expecting another hit unless we, we missed on our estimates, but I believe that that's a fair estimate of what it is going to cost us to do the, the snow removal and the maintenance we're required to on the bridge. Um, for on an annual basis, um, but without knowing exactly when it was at the time, um, it was put in as a full year. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Harris, are you still with us? Okay, I've lost you on my screen. Uh, do you have, uh, I'm going on to around two. Do you have any further questions? I do not, thanks. Okay, I'm just going to look for a show of hands. Does anybody have anything else on round two? No, nope. okay. So there was a question about flagging all staff. Um, is there uh, an, uh, any objections to flagging all staff to have them come back for the question? Okay, not seeing any. So, Mr. Dance, basically the uh, full complement of new staff requests that would come back as a flagged item so that council can discuss them as a whole. All I'm right. Madam Mayor, may I ask a question about that? Yeah, you can. So, we're basically flagging everything. So, what does that mean? We're going to do budget twice or what? Well, the process that was set in place was that we would flag any items and then um, hopefully we don't have the entire budget flagged, but uh, this is a request for the summary of staff, new staff, so then we will deal with them as a whole at the end. So if we flag everything, then yes, we will, um, we will definitely be doing budget twice. So hopefully that answers your question. Well, as long as we get through it all, that's good. If, if everybody's questions are addressed in that manner, that's that's wonderful. Thanks. Okay, thank Worship, you. Can I just, just because, did you mind if I make a quick comment here? Is that all right? No, you can make a comment. Is Amanda, sorry to bother you, is Amanda in the office today? Uh, nope. Uh, oh. Jeremy's here. Do you need? Yeah, I need some help. Okay. Not right um, now, but as soon as you're done. Yeah, so just on the on the process, like, we just flagged a whole bunch of things that haven't even been presented by the director yet. So, um, which is fine if that's how council wants to do it, but I just want to distinguish between, um, like the intent of flagging something is because you believe there's a high likelihood that, um, you want to, you want to have a, re to move a motion on it and debate it. Um, but it sounds like we're flagging things because there's a bunch more questions and I would just encourage council not to flag something because you have more questions. Now is the perfect time to have questions and, and some deliberation. And then if you've gone through all that and you've got all the information that you want and you're saying, and you're thinking, well, I want to, uh, you know, eliminate this or increase it or decrease it. Then that would be the point where a flag would be important. But I mean, to, to flag a bunch of things where we haven't even asked questions yet, probably it, to Councillor Harris's point, that's going to like, we're already looking at adding additional days to the budget based on the way on the number of flags we've already had so far. And so with, with a flag like that, um, I would say we're almost guaranteed to have additional 
uh, budget days. So just try to keep the flagging to the intent, which is that more than likely there will be a debate on it. Um, that'd be my recommendation to council. Anyway, anyway, we can, we can accommodate whatever works. So, okay. So before you go off screen, I would invite you then. So with councilor Abitoye's question that she had, perhaps you're able to answer that on, on the entire staffing request where she asked the question regarding, um, uh, hiring staff to fill in for vacation and leaves. So, um, if. If staff are unable to ask answer that, then uh, perhaps you can jump in. So, which may eliminate the flags. Sure. Um, so I would say, like in my review of all the staffing requests that we've had, um, typically staffing requests related to growth, either either because of the demand on your services or um, because of the growth, the physical growth in the community, which is typically what would get the roads uh, group. Um, it's probably on our end that we shouldn't just describe it as being for vacation coverages, but the fact of the matter is, um, if when your staffing levels start to get tight, that is when the supervisors feel it the most, right? All of a sudden the summer comes around and two or three people like the rest of us, they all say, we want to, we want to go and take two weeks off or three weeks off. And they tend to feel the pain of a short staff of a short staff group when the vacations come around, but that doesn't change the fact that the additional resources are needed uh, throughout the course of the year. So I don't think in it for any reason we're adding stuff specifically for vacation coverage. I just think that's when the symptoms um, sort of present themselves the most. Uh, but typically the underlying cause of most or all of this is, you know, for roads every year, we take on a certain amount of new um, linear feet of street sidewalk. Uh, we take on new park space. We're about to take on a new recreation amenity in in Southport Meadows. Um, those are typically the drivers of the new staff most of the time. Okay, Councillor Abatoye, does that answer the question, which may eliminate the flag? So, um, so this. I didn't, I didn't notice this just for roads. I noticed it with um, municipal enforcement and some other staff requests. So this came up a number of times. Um, yeah, I think it's in there at least three times that I can remember. And and I could probably put that back on me for not reviewing the plan request. Well, not, I reviewed them all very closely, but for allowing the explanation to just sit with vacation coverage, because like I said, that's typically when they, when the pain is, is uh, the strongest, yeah. But you're right. It, I do know it does appear in there more than once, for sure. Are you okay to remove the flag on this one? And then, if there's a specific one, as it come forward. Um, can I can I just sit on it for a bit and and let, let's just keep go, moving on and and then I can come back to it. Yeah, for okay. sure. Okay, thank you. And if Troy, could you text Jeremy to ask him to come and help me with something? Thank you. All right, we'll move on to uh, West Rivers Edge tree planting, Mr. Gagnon. Thank you, Your Worship. So I will present this plan request, seventy two zero one one four. And after my presentation, if you have any questions, then we can go back to the round of questions after this one. So um, the West River Edge tree planting starting on page 511 of your budget binder. The, this is a one-time cost of $100,000 to be funded by the River Valley Enhancement Reserve. This budget request supports the tree maintenance and horticulture program and score in quartile three. This program scores high in demand, population serve, and thriving recreation, culture, and parks. This project is important as trees we introduce in the area will benefit in many ways. They enhance the air we breathe by capturing CO2 and releasing oxygen. Trees capture and filter rainwater and they provide habitat for many species of animal, bird, birds, and insects, and benefit the social and mental health of uh, park users. 
The project consists of planting 150 to 200 trees in the West River Edge area. This is the last year of a five-year five-year tree planting program, as recommended under the 2015 Recreation Facilities and Park Master Plan update. A map showing where trees were planted in the past is available to you on page 513 of your budget binder. And this is uh, Hart, Manager of Park Services, will join me in answering your questions. Second, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Blizzard, you're first. Um, I guess just one question. Are we making sure that the trees fit into the habitat of the area that we don't 10 years down the road find that, gee, these trees aren't the right ones for this planting? Your worship to uh, Councillor Lizard, I will uh, ask uh, Mrs. Hart to answer your question. Uh, good morning, uh, your worship and members of council. Yes, that's correct. We're looking for trees that um, can withstand the the winds that are down there, especially and also uh, they're native to Alberta, so more poplars, aspens, that that type of tree. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks. Okay, hey, thank you, uh, Councillor Noyan. Thank you, Your Worship. My my question still stands, uh, Richard, and I can I can repeat it, but I, yeah, I just see that the the plan for this phase of tree planting is right next to adjacent to an old growth existing forest. Uh, so I I don't really understand this initiative, and and I believe. It, it does require some explanation. Um, your worship to Councillor Noy, and I'll give you maybe some uh, background on, on this project that comes from the 2015, uh, I believe it's the uh, uh, Recreation and Facilities Parks uh, Master Plan Update. It was identified through the uh, public consultation and then uh, that uh, tree planting uh, will be welcome in the uh, West River Edge area. Um, the area uh, before was a, uh, I believe, I believe was used uh, for uh, for a purpose of uh, removing rocks and uh, and uh, and now has been reclaimed. So in a sense, it's a way for us to reforest. Uh, the area. Um, some members of the community felt that uh, trees will help, uh, especially with uh, in the future, with uh, in the long term, uh, for those who are skiing, helping with uh, basically reducing winds and and different things like that, and also the the overall benefit that I talked about. So um, over the last four years, we invested a hundred thousand dollars from a reserve fund to to do exactly that to bring about 150 to 200 trees uh, in the area. Uh, we planted some uh, close to the um, uh, facility, the West River Edge facility, uh, also close to the uh, uh, Nordic Ski Club trails, as well as a little bit also in the uh, dark park. So that's basically the idea. And my second question then would be, have you considered using the trees north of West River's Edge in this $100,000 if you do plant 200 trees is $500 per tree for the cost of the tree and then the installation, there is the equivalent of a small forest that was planted north of the, the road. And those were saplings, I believe that were planted. Why couldn't we transplant those and, 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 and save money that way? Uh, your ship to uh, Councillor Inouye and I will maybe defer the question to Mrs. Hart if that's a possibility, but normally the tree that has been planted there, uh, they may come from a different program uh, involving maybe industries. So, uh, and for a reason, uh, they've been planted where they are now, but I will basically maybe defer the question to Mrs. Hart, if there's anything that uh, you need to comment. Three worship to Councillor Noyan. Yes, that's correct, Richard. So um, the uh, the forest of the the pine trees that are planted up and, and around the uh, wetland area did come from a different program. We do thin that that area out. Um, we started doing that this year um, to try and and vegetate other areas. And our still our focus is down and around the south end of west of West River's Edge and the dog park. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor uh, Abatoye. Any questions? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for this. Um, I think this is an important program, um, especially with um, when it comes to the benefits it has um, to the environment. Um, but my question is, I know that we we um, deferred this program. I think it was in twenty twenty. Um, what difference did that? Did it have any impact to that area as a result of delaying that? Um, uh, exercise for one year. I will, uh, your worship to Councilor Abitori, I will uh, leave it to Mrs. Hart to answer. I believe that uh, the, we're now, uh, we basically delayed for one year in terms of funding, but the, the work has been ongoing in order to, to complete where we should needs to be after four years, but I'll leave it to Mrs. Hart to comment. Yeah, through your worship to uh, Councilor Abitori, uh, there was no impact. Um, fortunately, these are growing growing organisms so they're just um another year of growth and then of course the the delay of the finishing the completion of the fifth year um trees that haven't survived in the program um from years past are all under warranty and so we are working at replacing those trees that um from the a death rate that we, is typical um but there's been no significant impact to the program no well, that's that's great because you answered my second question, which is what, what um what's the success rate? Well, thank you, appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Any questions on this one? Uh, I either missed or didn't get asked for a second round on the last budget request, so I'd like to just go back and just ask a question on that. Um. And apologies, but it's important, I believe. So the roads growth plan at the bottom of your request of years 21 to 26. When I do a quick add, we're adding close to $500,000 worth of expenses in that period. Um, I'm ignoring the snow plowing because we added that last year, or pardon me, the contracted services, and that will come out. So I just left those two alone. And the total budget for for roads is like approximately a million dollars for the current year. Uh, it's a significant projected increase, and and it would appear to be out of line with the growth in the road network that that you forecasted. I wonder if you could just add a little color to the to the planning and and your thought process, please. Worship to Councillor Kelly. Um... Overall, when you look at this plan over five years, here's what we're trying to do. To bring about four staff on site and two pieces of equipment. And um, that's pretty much, uh, and, and some of the operating costs you will see are not just staff costs, but also operating impact to those new equipment that we're gonna bring. So that's basically what it is. So four staff, one grader and one loader. Big picture, that's what it looks like. Um, and and why four? Why not three? Why two? Um, the the reason is we we're looking at our our staff right now. We have about uh, units of uh, four operators. We have about we operate about three units at this time of four operators in um, in, in in regular time, especially in the winter. So at this time, I mean, on a we're gonna have two units working during the day, one unit working night. And what we're trying to do now is just to meet growth and to help having a unit of four coming in with two pieces of equipment will help us to achieve that. That's the big picture. Thank you, that helps. I appreciate the comments. Um, now for my second question, back to the trees. There was a mention and some discussion around, the, I think the concept is a urban forest adjacent to the parking lot at the pavilion in West River's Edge. And, and some mentioned to moving it and then a comment from admin that in fact, those things, those, those forests get thinned. The thinning process, is that a movement of the tree from one location to another? Your worship to Councillor Kelly, I'll ask maybe Mrs. Hart to uh, answer this question. Yeah, so through your worship to Councillor Kelly, uh, yes, it is, um, just to thin them out so that we can uh, gain the benefit of those those trees elsewhere. It's not to thin it out in the sense of losing the impact of that forest. Um, there are some trees in there that are that are struggling, and so if we can space them out a little bit more, they there's a better survival rate. 
Well, and I agree wholeheartedly. It was my observation over the last summer that those trees are going to choke themselves out if we don't do something. So as long as we're making use of the trees and they're going to show up elsewhere in the community, I'm very pleased with that. Thank you. That's all my okay. questions for now. Thank you. And I have to get back into rotation. After yesterday, I was just straight from, from Councillor Abatoy to Councillor Kelly, and uh, I miss Councillor Macon. So, Councillor Macon, do you have any questions? I don't have any questions on the tree planting. I'm happy to see we are nearing the end of this project. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harris, any, I don't have any questions on that one. Councillor Harris? Okay, it looks like I've lost him. Okay, all right. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next one. So we're gonna finish up um, these next three and we'll stay with this process. But when we jump into the next presentation, we're gonna go back to um, the way we did it in previous years where he's gonna present all of the requests and, and they used to have it on one page and then present them and then we could ask questions on any of the those. Um, that might move us along a little bit faster in case there's questions on some or the other. So um, let's finish up these three and then we'll get into a little bit different process. Thank you, Your Worship. We'll now move to plan request 720205, outdoor winter activities. West River Edge Skating Loop and Ice Slide starting on page 515 of your budget binder. The ongoing cost is 88,162, which is broken down into the following items. Park staff wages and benefit to create and maintain the skating loop at 29,662. Portable floodlight to provide lighting on the skating loop during evening hours at $25,000 a year. Contracted services to create also a nice slide of $30,000. And other small items such as maintenance of equipment, protective equipment, some staff training at $3,500. This budget request benefits the playground and outdoor venue maintenance program, which scores at quartile one. This program scores high in results and attributes such as reliance, well-planned and maintained infrastructures and thriving recreation, culture and parks. We would like to emphasize the importance for our city to host and offer a diversity of outdoor experience that benefits our residents and visitors. The West River Air Skinning Loop was introduced in 2020 last year to provide additional outdoor recreational activities while our indoor recreation facilities were closed to the public due to the pandemic. It was an initiative that became quite popular and was well received by the community. The ice slide is a new item for 2022 and could be relocated each year on a rotating basis on a toboggan hill in the city for example, including the hill at West River Hedge or the downtown Rotary Amphitheater Hill or any other neighborhood hill deemed large enough to accommodate such a nice slide. And once again, Ms. Hart will join me in answering your questions on this project. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan, anything on this one? Thank you, Your Worship. I do have a question, uh, two questions. The ice slide, is is this one of these structures that uh, is tall or is this is this a ground level slide? And, and if it is $30,000 for somebody to stand there with the hose to make a, a frozen slide, it seems like quite a bit to me, although I do like this this initiative and the idea of it. Just can you talk about the structure of the slide? Your Worship to Councillor Nguyen, I will ask Mrs. Hart to provide a bit more information of what we we found in terms of. Uh, so through your Worship to Councillor Nguyen, uh, yes, this is a ground slide. Um, the initiative or the idea of the initiative came forward from uh, Sylvan Lake last year. They created one uh, with a company out of out of Edmonton here. Um, the the intent of the slide is to try and create turns and little bumps and loops and not loops, but. Um, not, nothing that's straight down the hill. And so think of it kind of like a little bit of a luge bobsled kind of thing on a, on a mini scale where you would just slide on your bum down the slide. Okay, excellent. My second question is, is there a plan to, for the city to be involved in hosting any events at, at, at these new venues? 
Your Worship, uh, to Councillor Noyan, that will be a question that uh, I may uh, delegate to our uh, folks at Recreation. Um, I believe that there's an intent there, but uh, they're the one who, who create the programs. So uh, maybe uh, I'll ask Mrs. Yanch or um, Mrs. Kat, Mrs. Kawi to answer this question. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Noyan, um, we would love to be able to do events down in those areas. The biggest thing is we're still a little bit short staffed with our programming staff recovering from COVID-19. So it's just balancing when we have the staffing and when we're able to offer those programs. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Abatoye. Anything? I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Macon. Um, no questions on this one. I think it'll be so well used and money well spent in my opinion. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Yeah, a couple, please. I'd like to follow up on Councillor Burgett's comment from a bit ago about washroom timing. Um, I would for sure support those comments. I believe it's critical that when we have a facility such as the skating loop, that adequate washrooms be provided. Absolutely critical. The timing has to be equal. I, I don't know how you guys accommodate it, but I, I, I don't see any discretion or leeway on that at all. It, it's fundamental, basic human need. Um, I'll leave it at that and let Councillor Burgett address it in her way. Snowbank rinks. Last year, we had an increase in inventory of snowbank rinks. Is it anticipated that We'll have the same number of rinks this year on top of um, these these new initiatives that you're talking about in the budget. Uh, you were shipped to Councillor Kelly. Uh, I believe that there is an additional skating loop coming in and uh, close to downtown. Uh, I believe it's the Elk Park uh, coming in this year. So that will be an additional one that we have uh, from last year. Um, and then there's two that we have that we're proposing in the, the upcoming uh, budget request that I have there that I can talk a little bit more about it. And we are aware again, um, as of last week, there's about 12 requests for an additional one. I believe it's in the Forest Ridge uh, area. So um, that's we can discuss that at the next uh, budget request that I'll bring forward if you want. Absolutely. I didn't realize it was tied to that one. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the only question that I have is, um, uh, does the ice slide not kill the grass each year? Your worship, to, uh, your worship, I will ask maybe Mrs. Hart to answer the, the question regarding ice and, and uh, the maintenance of grass. To your worship, uh, yes, this is a potential. Um, we haven't seen too much of the grass being impacted by the uh, snowbank rinks um, just in the last couple of years. Um, so we're hopeful that the ice slide won't won't impact that, but we will uh, we'll monitor this. In addition okay. to Mrs. Hart, um, if we rotate the location of the ice slide uh, every second year, every third year to one place, then the impact should be lower. Okay. And the other question, uh, how are you going to deal with liability uh, with putting an ice slide in if anybody gets hurt? Your worship, uh, I believe, uh, like uh, any activities that we have, uh, this is a use at your own risk type of uh, approach. And then uh, what we do on our side is we uh, monitor the area, like uh, uh, all the hills that we have where people go and slide. Uh, we do a, a check on them. Uh, I believe it's on a weekly basis. And then that will be part of that uh, check on our side. But uh, uh, it's a okay. use at your own risk basis. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Harris, any questions? Um, no, I think I think this will be an interesting uh, addition to the service level. Um, but I uh, don't have any questions. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Blizzard, any questions? Oh, good job, Council. I think most of my questions were asked throughout this uh, uh, round, um, except for one, um, would there be opportunity? Maybe I know sometimes I walk down there and that rink, the parking lot was just packed from whatever ice fishing, the different stuff, uh, maybe to have, whether it's community group or something offer hot chocolate or some kind of little stand 
food for thought, I guess, more than a question. Okay, I know that one was uh, asked uh, before, not not in this group, but it's something that they can maybe take away and uh, investigate. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll uh, move along to the uh, next one. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I will now present Plan Request 720217, West Rear Edge Master Plan, starting on page 519 of your budget binder. This uh, budget request supports the playground and outdoor venue maintenance program, which scores in quartile one. This program scores high in results and attributes such as reliance, well-planned and maintained infrastructures, and thriving recreation culture and parks. The one-time cost of $60,000 is to be financed under the financial stabilization and contingency reserve. This project is important as the development of a master plan will capture the ideas and aspiration for the West River Edge recreational area, clarify priorities, outline a vision, how it can look like, and guide the city's future spending and operation. The West River Edge recreation area has become a popular destination for the community. In normal time, the pavilion hosts meetings and events, and the outdoor space Spaces are, are used for a variety of activities, including cross-country skiing, bargaining, snowshoeing, skating, skating, ice fishing, fishing, walking, running, biking, boating on the North Saskatchewan River, and non-motorized boating activities on the Fort Lyons Community Fish Pond. Through the priorities on recreation spending survey performed in 2021, the public ranked West River Edge amenities as a high priority. And we believe that uh, having a master plan in place to look at its future development is a necessity. Mrs. Hart will join me in answering your questions. Okay, thank you. Councillor Abitoye, do you have any questions? Um, so just regarding master plans in general, um, so when we, we have, we do have a rec, a culture and recreation master plan. So wouldn't that cover something like this? Your worship to uh, Councillor Abitoye, um, I can speak to the 2015 Recreation and Facility Parks Master Plan, and uh, Mrs. Yanch may also want to add to to, to my uh, comments here. Uh, the, uh, the the this one, that's the latest one that I'm aware of, uh, that address uh, West River Edge, and uh, basically it capture ideas and aspiration, uh, provide some costing on potential projects we can do there. But is this still current? Is this something that we still want to see? Uh, and this is one in 2015. Um, there's uh, maybe a need to better define when this plan talks about adding trails. And we had that discussion yesterday. Um, and I think it was trails in 2022 and trails in 2024 and, and that specific master plan. Now, this has been consolidated in one amount in 2023. How does that look like? And th this is where the, the, the plan, the current 2015 plan misses is a little bit more details about how that specific area can be uh, enhanced. And that master plan was for the entire city, which is not just for West River Edge. It was basically yeah. for many amenities. So uh, I think we need to, with the the popularity of this new uh, of West River Edge, we need to zero down on how do we want to, how this is going to look like in terms of future development, future trail, future amenities, and as we add in this, what does that mean also in terms of programming? Yeah. No. Um... Like I, I don't I'm not arguing what you what you're saying, but I'm yeah. just thinking like if, if we had to do a master plan for every facility in the city, then I don't think I I I'm thinking how cost effective is that? Right. Well I'll I'll just let it go. Okay, thank you. Uh Councillor Macon, anything on this one? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Uh thank you. Richard, maybe you answered my question on the number of snowbank rinks forecasted for this coming winter, um, but I thought you said you were going to touch on it in this presentation, and I didn't. I didn't catch that. So, it, did I just ask for clarification on my on my original question on that yes, question? Sir. Your worship to Councilor K is going to be the next slide. This is where I'm going to go. On the next slide. Yeah, it's I believe that five five dash twenty three. 
this uh, the West the, the the snow bank rinks was added as a walk on item for council. So I don't think it was uh, captured in the past into the into the document. And I think I apologize for that, Councillor Kelly. This okay. is maybe a page that you're missing. Um, I'll pay attention. I don't have it, and I was unaware that there was one because I was scrolling around looking for it. So thank you. I can be patient again. No worries. Um, it's coming. Thank you. Uh, What I would like to suggest is that this master plan for West River's Edge be expanded to be a master plan for the River Valley so that we have a unified long-term approach to how we treat our River Valley. And for that reason, I'm going to request that this, this plan request be flagged so that administration can think about that for a day or two and we can have a a further discussion when we come back on council um, last day or whatever it is for these meetings. Okay, thank you. I'll just make a note here and I'll come back to that. I'm next in the speaking order. So I guess the question that I would have to um, Mr. Fleming is if uh, we wanted to expand this for the uh, river's edge, what would the cost be? Uh, yes, for your worship, that's what we'll take back and consider it'll it'll definitely increase the cost. Um, I think there's actually a lot of merit in that idea because uh, we have discussed doing something like that. Um, it hadn't it hadn't really bubbled up to the top of our um, to you know the top of our list yet to put in front of council. But um, I think there's probably some merit in that idea. So what we'll do is through the course of the flag coming back is we'll take that away and consider what the new cost will be. But given the amount of space we're kind of talking about, I would imagine we, it, you know, it could get up into the hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollar range. But it, it, if it provides us with some value, both in terms of planning the existing river valley, and we've also got some planning to do in the new annexed areas, um, you, you know, it could help us out. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harris. Any questions? I do in relation to the West River's Edge master plan. I think what uh, Councillor Kelly asked uh, makes makes some sense, and I think it can be done in a coordinated manner. But my question is, uh, with respect to the master plan, uh, there have been some significant changes to the drainage uh, pattern coming out of Forest Ridge, which then comes into the area by the dog park and then down into a holding pond. So I understand, and this is my question. Um, how are we going to coordinate um, that particular issue with the drainage channel and the whole um, kind of naturalized wetland area that maybe is down there uh, to integrate into a, an outfall into the North Saskatchewan River? And what will that likely do? Has that uh, has administration even thought about that or do they even know about it? So that's my question. Your Worship to Councillor uh, Harris, uh, let me ask uh... Mr. Schaefer, maybe to provide some information about the work that is being done right now in that regard. Um, Your Worship, Councilor Harris, uh, there is some significant impacts that we, we've we've approved and, and and developed in terms of the uh, the drainage out of it's actually Windsor Point uh, Forest, which goes to the north, but same area. Um, so the the plan um, is that there will be an outfall constructed um, from the so right now the Windsor Point drains into the dog park pond, just to give it some geographic location. Um, and then the outfall will be on the pond just to the north. So those two ponds would be connected so that as the water rises, it gets to a maximum level before it discharges to the river. Um, so there's um, that is in the plan and is part of the approved uh, stormwater management plan for Windsor Point. So, so following up on that, so it, it it's part and parcel of the fact that if we do a master plan, we will consider the drainage implications. My second question, and uh, you can maybe even ask that, was any reference made back to the uh, original and revised reclamation plan for the golf course uh, development that was supposed to take place in that area uh, following the completion of gravel extraction operations? Was there any reference to uh, those previous studies? Was was that at all instructional in any way, shape, or form? 
Your Worship, to Councillor Harris, uh, I do not believe that uh, this this aspect of golf course is still considered in this area this time. No, I don't mean the golf course, but anything that came out of that plan relative to reclamation. Were, was there anything in that plan that was uh, fruitful or could conceivably inform uh, the West River's Edge Master Plan? Your Worship, to Councillor Harris, I believe it can. Uh, I will need to refresh myself with this. Uh, uh, the, the the study or the work that you referred to. And then uh, basically, if we work with a consultant, we'll basically provide them with all that information. Yeah, that's that's all I'm asking for. I don't, I don't need a definitive answer right now, but just something as a heads up because there was good work done on that reclamation plan. Yep. Um, and uh, it, it could conceivably have some value. So if that's referenced as you guys move forward on this, that would be all I would like to see happen. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Blizzard, any questions on this one? No questions. Thank you, Councillor Noyan, any questions? Thank you, Worship. I just wanna say I'm, <clears throat> I'm on board with uh, looking at the master plan for the River Valley and West River's Edge. I, I just have one quick question, and it seems like the the uh, the, the alignment of the, this master plan, <clears throat> or rather <clears throat> its conceptualization is is based on revenue generating opportunities that have been identified as as a potential for this uh for this building is is that kind of correct you were shipped to councilor Nguyen. Uh, we have not yet defined the entire uh purpose of this master plan saying that um i don't think that revenue generation was the purpose of, of uh, doing this plan more likely it was about capturing the opportunities of future development that will meet the demands and the needs of our community. Great, thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm assuming, okay, so there was a request to flag this and uh, the flag would be uh, when it comes back for discussion, it would have the cost of uh, to do the complete River's Edge master plan. Um, is everybody comfortable with that? Okay. That appears to be so that would be the uh, flag on that and the request. So we'll move on to the next one. Thank you, Your Worship. And this is our final budget request. Um, and uh, this is a walk on request, which is not, I believe, recorded in your budget binder, but was distributed as, as an additional item for consideration. An outdoor winter activities, two additional snow bank rinks at an ongoing cost of $10,000. And uh, this budget request benefits the playground and outdoor venue program. This program scores high in results and attributes such as reliance, well-planned and maintained infrastructures and thriving recreational culture and parks. This project is important as is it provides a safe alternative to the residents who use the storm, uh, the city stormwater pond for recreation. In previous winters, well-meaning residents created unauthorized rinks on storm ponds in their communities. In 2021, an assessment of the storm water ponds for recreational use was completed. The assessment concluded that these ponds were not safe for recreational use. During the upcoming winter season, additional efforts will be undertaken to ensure that ponds are not used for recreation. This will include consideration of the educational campaign and monitoring of the ponds under the sewer bylaw C24-21. As the community recovers from the pandemic, safe outdoor recreational activities will remain an important amenity for supporting positive mental health. The two new uh, snowbank rinks will be located near areas where recreational activities were seen on stormwater ponds in the following parks, the Hethel and Allen Allard parks on Bremner Crescent and the South Ridge parks on Reading Way. I would like to also add as of last week, uh, we received about 12 requests from residents to add another uh, snowbank rink um, in the Forest Ridge Park. So this is not affected by the uh, storm pond uh, issues that we, we, we're finding, saying that we have uh, several requests. So in a sense, council, if they want, they wish to, you can consider adding three uh, additional snow bank rings at uh, 15,000 overall. So that will conclude my uh, 
presentation. Mrs. Hart will uh, join me in answering any question you have on this item. Okay, thank you. So I'll go to questions, but just as uh, what Mr. Gagnon had indicated, I guess if uh, we want, if council decided they wanted to add the third one at a cost of 15,000 rather than flagging it, I would just put a motion on, or somebody put a motion on if they chose to do that, that way we would actually deal with uh, it at this point in time. So I'm just throwing that out there for anybody, but uh, starting with questions, I've got Councillor Macon. Um, the Richard, the 12 requests that you talked about, they were all for the same rink. Is that right? Your worship to Councillor Macon, that's correct. Okay. Um, uh, I wouldn't be opposed to putting on a motion. I guess I'll hear what others have to say. I know that these rinks are extremely popular. I'm glad to hear uh, that we're going to put rinks in places where people were on the storm. Uh, ponds because I don't think that we're necessarily reaching um, all of our residents uh, to get them to understand the severity and the danger of, of skating. I don't think that that's been widely accepted. So um, I'm glad to see it and I'll listen to what others have to say about uh, the additional, maybe. Okay, we'll ask for questions, but I can come back to you for a motion if you like. Uh, Councillor Kelly. Yes, so I'm going to ask my question one more time, Richard. If we add the two that you're proposing, that's an addition to what we had last year, and that will bring our total snowbank rink inventory to how many, please? Your Worship, to Councillor Kelly, I'll ask maybe Mrs. Hart to do the count here. We have a map, I believe, that uh, can help to uh, understand that. Here we go. Yeah, so through Your Worship, to Councillor Kelly, uh, we currently um, flood six locations. Um, these two additional locations um, would bring that up to eight. And then if you decide to go with the the last minute request here, um, we would have nine snow bank rink loca uh, locations around the city. And these are basically snow bank rinks. And then we, on top of that, we have two outdoor rinks and also the skating loop that we have to also maintain if council wishes to go this way. It was my recollection that we had more than six snowbank rinks last winter. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, that's correct. We added um, one down at uh, Henderson late in the season, um, but but the, these were the locations that we had. So then back to my question, and I'm sorry, this is a third question, but I still don't understand. The two rinks are in addition to the inventory that we had last winter. Your worship to Councillor Kerry, yes. Uh, understanding that this year uh, in 2022, uh, in 2021, we're gonna add one uh, in, uh, I believe the Elks Park. And Mrs. Hart can add to that. I think this was already approved. So that adds to the inventory as well. A uh, three worship to Councillor Kelly Elks Park uh, was included uh, last year and will be again this year. So we do have our our six snowbank locations. So six to eight. Yeah. Okay. Um, whoever puts the motion on for three, I'll support it. Thank you very much for your for your responses. Okay. Thank you. I have no questions on this one, Councillor Harris. No, I'm I'm glad to see this is happening. There were some problems in South Fork, and I did talk to a resident that was concerned about the uh, skating and hockey on uh, storm ponds. So, um, will will this address that particular area? It was a municipal enforcement issue. It was a parks issue. It was a safety issue. Uh, how are we addressing that particular issue to make sure the people that were using that rink last year or before are going to be Kind of shunted over to a more appropriate location. Your worship yeah. to Councillor, your worship to Councillor Iris. I think that this through an educational program. Um, my understanding is that uh, we have information on our website, but we need to get this information 
to the residents who are close to those areas, especially the ones that are backing up to the stone pond, because this is where we see most of the users, those who have properties that are backing up to it. So my understanding is there will be either a letter or a door knocker that will be put uh, to, to their door, or to their residents, so they will be able to get information about not accessing those areas for recreation and the risk associated with that. There will be also information to them on that door knocker or letter uh, that will indicate uh, where can they go for recreation in a safe way um, and the location of those new uh, rinks that uh, they, uh, they can access basically if it's council approves them uh, to this process. So uh, well, I, 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 support, to them. I support the education thing and I think that's important, but uh, we need to have a concerted program brought to council so that we can address that issue uh, to the satisfaction of everybody, the people that want to skate on things and the people that don't want to have people skating behind their house. So I put that in into administration's bag of tricks to make sure that we address that in not too distant future. Thank you. Okay, they will just take that as information for now. Thank you, Councillor Blizzard. Any questions on this one? Uh, well, I was going to make the motion, but I'll let uh, Councillor Macon do that since she brought it up first. But uh, yeah, I think this is a low cost option for um, free outdoor activities. Uh, we have a long cold winter and the more we can do. Um, trying to see if I have any question. I think I'm okay with this. I don't think I have any questions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we can dis uh, save discussion and debate for the motion if it's coming. Uh, Councillor Noyan. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my, I have two questions. Do you feel that that the general public is very well aware of these rinks and that and that they have corresponding ample usage? Uh, your ship to um, Councillor Noyan. I believe people are aware of their neighborhood and then what their parks are offering. Um, I've I've seen uh, a good amount of people using these parks in the past myself, just uh, going around and looking. I know the West River Edge skating loop was very popular. I've seen up to 100, 150 people there um, for the for this other uh, activity. And for those who cannot reach there, then their neighborhood, uh, either the, 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 the rinks uh, that we have or the snowbank rinks provide some fun activities for the family. So uh, I think it's great value added to the community for uh, cost. Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks. My, my my question, I guess, was just on awareness because last winter I was I I was not aware personally of how many of these <clears throat> snowbank rinks that we had. So um, yeah, so I just want to want to make sure that uh, you're you're, you're or, you, yeah that, that they're being used effectively. I guess is what I'm saying, and, and encourage the whatever marketing and, and awareness for for them that needs to be done. Yeah, worship to Councillor Nguyen. We can basically promote these through uh, our website and using our social media to get it out there for people to, to know about them. Great, thank you. And my other question is about the frequency of maintenance that is is required and also given to the, the snowbank rinks, just, just for my information. Your worship to Councillor uh, Nguyen, I will ask maybe Mrs. Hart to talk a bit more about the maintenance program of these snowbank rinks. Uh, through worship to Council Noyan, we have um, staff on on board that uh, maintain these rinks daily. They clear snow and flood them as well. Um, not flooding daily, but as needed. Wow. Uh, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Abatoy. Any questions? So just because this wasn't part of the package, um, what's the source of funding? Uh, your worship to council every two years, source of funding is a tax, so this is an ongoing cost to the tax. So, property taxes, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, I'm coming back to Councillor Macon. Did you want to do a motion or a flag? It's your choice. Um, I'll do a motion. Uh, could we put the uh plan request up on the screen? The budget request, I should say. Go. Uh, I'll make the motion that we increase request 72-0153 to $15,000 to include a snowbank crank in the Forest Ridge area. Thank you. Would you like to uh, speak in favor of the motion? 
Uh, I think that these winter venues have been really well received and this particular area received a lot of uh, requests and I think that it will be great for the community. Okay, thank you. So it is open for discussion and debate. Um, Councillor Kelly, anything? Thank you. I'm good with it. I think it's great. Um, so for Councillor Noyan, as your little guy grows and your wife becomes part of the Mums of West Park or Mums of Downtown or something, she will learn that uh, where every activity is that's going on in this community. It just right. it's, yeah, we already have the little bob skates for him, so you can you can walk now, so now I can skate. <laughs> anyway, I'm just mentioning that that there's uh, some really good venues to get information out. So fully support this. Councillor Harris, anything? Nothing Councillor Blizzard. So this five thousand dollars per rink that is the cost of the uh, staff for doing them. You were shipped to Councillor Blizzard. There's a, a portion of staff, but the, the main cost is water. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Noyan. Anything on discussion and debate? I guess just learning the, the the frequency of maintenance and and then also considering staffing requests by public works. I I think, yeah, we just need to be cognizant of every addition of service that that we use and and potential out, outlying costs of 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 these new initiatives as well. But that that's all I'll say for now. Okay, thank you, Councillor Batoy. Anything on discussion and debate? Um, no, I, I support you. I think it has um, more benefits than costs. Uh, but my question, though, is so what does this take us to in terms of uh, property taxes? I think this would be a question to finance. I think we currently sit at 1.4 million. So I would say that uh, probably on this, they will keep track of any changes that uh, go along. And then they will tell us uh, when we get to our flagged items. Okay, sure, I can wait till then. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, anything on close, Councillor Macon? Nothing further, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Ms. Exley, are we using our iPads or are we doing it by a show of hands? Your Worship, oh, please use e scribe for voting. Okay, the motion is now closed. Please use your e scribe to vote. Please cast your vote. I don't have e scribe up. And so I vote in the affirmative. Okay, thank you. I your worship. I'm just waiting for Councillor Abatoy. I voted in favor. So that is carried unanimously. So let's take a seven minute break till 1030 and we'll come back with fleet facilities and engineering. Okay, so back at 1030. Please, uh, Councillor Blizzard, please uh, put your video down. Thank you.
If everybody would like to uh, start joining me, we will resume in one minute. All right, we have everybody and uh, I'd like to uh, thank Richard for being my uh, test for the first one and uh, discover that uh, what we're going to do for the next ones, Mr. Schaefer, do your entire presentation. So make sure you write notes uh, for any questions that you may have for the entire presentation. And uh, then when he gets to the end, uh, then you can ask questions on any of them. Okay. So take us away, Mr. Schaefer. I'm not stopping till you get to the end of yours, and then we will go to full questions. Thank you. Good morning, Your Worship and members of Council. My name is Grant Schaefer. I'm the Director of Fleet Facilities and Engineering. Supporting me today is Chris Enders, Manager of Fleet and Facilities. We are here to present the 2022 budget overview for fleet facilities and engineering, which can be found in section six of your binder. As our department name suggests, the department made, is made up of three business units. Fleet maintains and, and replaces the city's mobile equipment and fleet, fleet assets. This helps ensure that city departments have the equipment they need when they need it in order to meet their program needs. Facilities maintains the city's building assets as well as provides custodial services to city facilities. This again ensures that facilities are available to support city staff and community programming. Engineering manages the majority of the city's capital projects, provides engineering review for new development and supports city departments with their engineering and procurement requirements. In total, the department manages 13 programs, which can be found on page 63 of your package. In 2022, um, FF&E will be focusing on key areas within our program portfolio. We'll be reviewing our lot grading program to ensure that the implementation process is meeting the intended goals of the program. Um, this will include resident education, builder and contractor information, and the inspection review process. We are currently updating the transportation section of our engineering standards. We plan to update further sections um, throughout 2022 and into 2023. We'll review and refine the facilities asset management plan to ensure that we've captured the, de the details sufficiently to ensure we have adequate funding to complete component replacements when they are due to be replaced. Program changes are seen throughout the engineering business unit. The driver of the changes um, is the addition of a new engineering coordinator, which uh, will be discussed later in my presentation, as well as there's a change in development engineering to reflect lower budget permit revenue that we've seen over the last several years. There are changes within the facilities program as we're proposing to reallocate funding from contract services to create a new electrician position. This is a budget request, which again, I'll be presenting uh, later in the presentation. As well, a reorganization of duties in 2021 resulted in reallocations of life cycle contributions from culture and recreation to facilities. The changes in uh, fleet programs are a result of operating impacts from the addition of vehicles and equipment within the capital budget as well as budget increase um, of about 17,000 to the cost of fuel in 2022, though given the price today, um, that might've been a little optimistic. Um, moving forward, I guess, into my uh, first uh, uh, budget request, which is page 65 of the package, is request 320038. And this is the addition of a new engineering coordinator to the engineering business unit. This position will assist engineering and fulfilling our program responsibilities in regards to quartile one programs, such as capital construction and development engineering and quartile two programs, such as traffic safety, log grading and capital procurement. The engineering business unit is com uh, currently comprised of a manager, two engineering coordinators, one engineering technologist and uh, two engineering students, which are the equivalent of a 1.2 FTE. The department last added the position position, sorry, in 2014 with the addition of the lot grading program. The planned capital program over the next number of years continues to grow with planned major and complex projects. These include Veterans Way, the JRC modernization, secondary alternate water supplies, um, as well as aquatics planning construction. These complex projects require more time and commitment from project managers to ensure that the projects 
deliver on the expected outcomes and that impacts to user groups and the general public are well understood and minimized as much as possible. The engineering group is already in a position where pro uh, projects are prioritized and studies on engineering studies are typically delayed until late in the approval year. This allows us to focus on construction, meaning um, in most cases studies are not complete until the year after approval. With the addition of major complex projects and the continued, gro continued growth of neighborhood rehab, there's a risk of some of the other smaller construction projects having to prioritized and delayed to ensure that the major projects continue to move forward. As well, as more time is required to manage the capital programs, our turnaround times for development engineering will increase. Development pro uh, developer projects under the same time pressures as our internal projects and time reviews allows them to continue working through the construction season. This request it, uh, totals $129,745 and is spread over two years, 100,000 or just over 100,000 in 2022, of which 5,500 is one time, um, one time to be funded from the Financial Stabilization and Contingency Reserve, an additional $30,000 um, in 2023. Uh, next is uh, budget request 720207. Um, this is the reallocation of funds to support the addition of an in-house electrician to the facilities management team. The facilities uh, business unit analyzed our current contract services costs over the last several years. This analysis identified that the city would be better served by the addition of an in-house electrician rather than relying 100% on contract providers. This reallocation of funds will allow staff to be more responsive to user needs and tackle projects as they arise rather than waiting to bundle projects together in order to build a contract while relying on contractor schedules. Money is being reallocated from contract services to wages, as well as to supplies and materials to directly support the position and material needed. Money is also being reallocated for the ongoing maintenance and replacement of the vehicle required to support this position, which presented yesterday as Capital Project 22009. This is a full-time position with 2,080 hours. Um, of which approximately 1,500 hours per year would be expected to be uh, performed as an electrician with the remaining time assisting with facilities maintenance tasks um, in other buildings. If funding remains as it is in contract services with contract electricians, the equivalent of about 1,000 hours of work could be performed by contractors with the same amount of funding as a full-time employee. This request supports the building maintenance and operations and the facility lifecycle programs, both of which are core to L2. The total cost of the program is, or of this request is $3,500 one time in 2022 for computer equipment funded from the financial stabilization and contingency reserve with ongoing costs being funded through reallocation of contract services money. Um, this includes my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. So for the entire presentation, you may ask questions. Councillor Kelly, you're up first. Uh, thank you, Grant. I only have two relatively small questions, or at least questions, relatively small parts of your report. Um, engineering coordinator, the lot grading program, that discussion, That's in response, I assume, to the issues that we had in the last year on lot grades. Uh, Your Worship, Councillor Kelly, I would say that's probably the, the correct correct assumption to make. That uh, while it's part of the programs that a coordinator would look at, the the taking an in depth look at the lot grading program um, would be a response to some of the issues we saw this summer. And why would there be a decrease in permit ribbon revenue of a budgeted thirteen thousand dollars? Again, under your note seven. Uh, yep, your, your worship at Councillor Kelly. Um, so over the past several years, we haven't reached our budgeted amounts um, for permit revenue in terms of, and that includes uh, lot grading service connections and um, the, the the bigger development, the development engineering or development agreements that are done by the developers. There, uh, there's engineering fees there as well um, that we haven't achieved um, where we thought we would be for the last several years, we, we did budget a decrease. Um, I will note that this year we're back up where we were, but uh, I'm not sure if that's a continued trend or just a one year blip at this point. Thank you, Grant. I have additional questions when we're ready, Mayor Catcher. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, so the only question that I had on this one was, uh, you've got in there, uh, because of the veterans way and the, um, uh, modernization for some reason, those don't go forward. Does that reduce the amount of, uh, work that would be required or is there sufficient amount of work to uh, still cover all of this? Uh, your worship, uh, I believe there's still a sufficient amount of work. Um, our neighborhood rehab programs have been ramping up and we, with 22 being or projects in 2020 being delayed. We're still a little bit behind in terms of where we're at for, uh. Current budgets, um, and it's just the volume of work that's been coming in um, and all the projects taking a little bit more time with, with processes that have changed internally as well. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harris, any questions? I was just looking at uh, your current uh, staffing complement is two engineering coordinators. So then it would be three with SS? That's correct, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blizzard? No questions. Thank you. Councillor Noyan? Just one question. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I, I might have missed it, but fleet is encompasses every vehicle, every piece of equipment across departments in Port Saskatchewan, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, thanks. That was my only question. Thank you. Councillor Abatoye? Uh, thank you, Grant, for your presentation. Um, so my question is regarding the in-house electric electrician. So the reason I brought it up yesterday was because an electrician can only only do an electrician's job, and I don't I don't see I don't know if an um an electrician can actually do forty hours of electrician work. You get what I mean? But I think you kind of allayed my concerns because you said something about him doing a certain number of hours. Um, electrical work and what was the other thing you said? Um, yes, your worship, Councilor Batoy. So the, the when we look at what the electrician would do. It'd be about we think about fifteen hundred hours a year of actual electrical work, um, with the balance um, being spent um, helping the other facility operators in terms of maintaining the facilities. Whether that's mostly, I guess that would be the non-electrical work of the facilities maintenance. Right. Okay. Now, now that makes sense because um, the reason I brought it up again, like I said, you can't. Get, an electrician, an electrician cannot get 40 hours of per week of electrical work you get. So that's why it didn't make sense to me, but he's going to be supporting other facility and um, other facility operation operators. And that makes sense. So my second question is, what is the actual cost then? Because it said this year, so we're, we're actually moving money from contracted services to, um, to fund this, um, position. So what's the actual cost for this position? Uh, the, the value of the position, I believe is about a hundred. 10,000 with all the benefits and everything in there, but that is just a transfer of money from an Contract. ongoing transfer from over. So there's no additional tax funding required. Okay, thank you. Councillor Macon. Thanks for your presentation, Grant. Um, just one question. Uh, I think I heard you say it, but I might have misheard. When was the last time you hired an engineering coordinator for this um, department? Uh, your worship, Councillor Macon, 2014. Okay, that's, I thought that's what you said, but I just wanted to double check. Thank you. Thank you. I know there was a request for round 2, uh, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you uh, again, grant a, a question on a rather minor line item in your report. Um, under your note 11, there's a reference to standby compensation for winter repairs for an amount for to have a mechanic on standby for emergency repairs. Is that a new program or have we always had that? Um, your worship, Councillor uh, Kelly, we've been doing it for uh, the last number of years. We just haven't had a budget line for it. Um, so it's a it's something we've done to make sure that we can support the uh, the seven day a week um, operations uh, during the winter. Um, but we haven't actually had a budget line item for it. I appreciate your answer. Why do we need a budget line item for it this year then? Um, the worship of Council Kelly is just to make sure that we're capturing the costs um, accurately. Okay, thank you, Graham. Hey, thank you. There weren't a lot of other questions. Okay, I, um, so I'm just going to look for hands for if anybody has another question. Okay, Councillor Abatoye, you had one more. 
Yes, just one quick question on service inspections. And I'm just looking at the programs we under the programs we manage on page 3-15. Um, I see that we, we we have some revenues, we generate some revenue from that specific program. Um, but what are, why are we reducing why we so I see, I also see like a reduction in, in the proposed budget. Why are we taking money out of that up there if that's where we are generating some revenue from? Um Leadership to Council Arbitrary, that was um, in response to what we've actually been able to achieve in terms of revenue over the last several years. Um, it doesn't mean we're not, we're not reducing the service because then that's not going to impact our revenue. Um, no, your worship to Council Arbitrary, it's just the volume reduction. We haven't seen the volumes of, of new home builds over the last several years. Um, and it's, shown, it's we just haven't achieved what we'd originally budgeted. So we're just bringing the budget down to match what we've uh, oh, actually okay. seen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Schaefer. That looks like it'll do it for you for now. So I will uh, thank you. And at this point in time, uh, we will go to planning and development. And I would invite Craig Thomas to join us. Same process, go through your entire presentation. We'll ask questions at the end. Thank you, Your Worship, members of council. Good morning. My name is Craig Thomas, Director of Planning and Development. I'm joined today by Sri Shindi, Manager of Current and Long Range Planning, TJ Auer, Principal Planner, and Stefan Brown, the Safety Codes Team Lead. Specific details are found in Section 7 of your budget binder. Planning and Development Department works with citizens and community leaders to build consensus on how the city should grow both in the short and long term. This is accomplished through the coordination of a variety of land planning functions that range from creating a long-term vision for the city to reviewing all new development proposals to ensure that they reflect this vision. The planning department is comprised of three business units, current and long-range planning, development planning, and safety codes. We manage 13 programs, which include statutory plan development, uh, development permit review and issuance, subdivision review, and safety code inspections, just to name a few. <clears throat> 2022 will be a busy year for the Planning and Development Department. Last year, Council adopted Our Fort, Our Future, the City's Municipal Development Plan. This is a comprehensive and forward-thinking plan focusing on how the City will grow to a population double of what it is today. As a high level plan, it sets out strategy to achieve the policy goals that it lays out. That strategy consists of several implementation items that are to take place in priority over the next 10 years. My team will focus on two implementation items in 2022, which will include ensuring the land use bylaw is in alignment with the municipal development plan, as well as a mature neighborhood strategy. I'll talk more about this in detail later in my presentation. The next area is the effective operations of the safety code services business unit. This year marks the end of an era for, era for the department as we shifted from using an outside agency to in-house inspectors to provide all of our safety code services. This change is showing enhanced services delivery from both a quality and customer service standpoint. <clears throat> With the transition of safety code services to in-house inspectors, four programs are affected. This includes safety code inspections, safety code compliance, permit review, and regional planning and intermunicipal collaboration. The most significant change to these programs is not so much related to cost, but rather the change in terms of how these programs will be delivered. Shifting to in-house inspectors has demonstrated higher level of service, greater attention to detail, and the ability to respond to matters more quickly. As part of this initiative, the department has uh, the department has partnered with Strathcona County to share services where needed. The arrangement has been very beneficial thus far for both the city and the county. Not only is this offered increased capacity, it also provides shared mentorship, creativity, and knowledge exchange. 2022 will also see changes to four programs as a result of <clears throat> as a result of staffing adjustments. The affected programs are statutory plan development, uh, development agreements, land use bylaw, and subdivision application review. 
The staffing adjustments include the reallocation of a position from development planning to the current and long range planning business unit. Also includes the completion of the intern program and reallocation of personnel costs in light of transitioning to in house safety code inspectors. These adjustments were made to increase efficiencies by focusing on resources where they're needed the most. We do have one. Uh, we do have a one time request in the amount of 382,470 dollars. Funds will come from the financial stabilization and contingency reserve and will be spread over 2 years. The scope of this project is to create a wholly new land use bylaw that aligns with our newly adopted municipal development plan. The land use bylaw is the primary implementation tool for achieving the objectives of our municipal development plan and as a result was identified as an immediate implementation project. Land use bylaws regulate development on privately owned land and set standards for development within a municipality. The intent is to create a document that is simpler, clearer and more efficient as it will have fewer districts uses and have succinct and necessary regulations. More importantly, it will depart from the outdated land use regulatory practices and create tailored regulations and approaches for each policy area that's identified within the MDP. Thus, it will be more user friendly, applicable and reduce red tape. The project also includes the mature neighborhood strategy which was originally intended to be a separate project in the municipal development plan implementation. Redevelopment in older neighborhoods can rejuvenate mature neighborhoods and maximize the use and viability of existing services and facilities, <clears throat> but it can also be viewed as intrusive by existing residents. The objective of this component is to identify how best to revitalize and ensure sustainability of the city's older neighborhoods while respecting their unique qualities and characteristics. This will be done by engaging and working with the community as a whole to determine regulatory strategies in these areas. The project is anticipated to be complete by mid to late 2023. Similar projects in other municipalities are common led by consultants with varying degrees of support from the planning departments. For the Municipal Development Plan, administration led the project with consultant support. This approach was very effective as the project came in under budget and produced a tailored document specific to the City of Fort Saskatchewan. Administration intends to adopt a similar approach to the land use bylaw project. And to support this approach, the budget includes a request for a temporary 18 month position as well as consultant fees. The plan request supports the land use bylaw program, which is identified as a quartile one program. The program scores high in demand, mandate, and population served. It also scored high in well planned, well planned community. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that council may have. Hey, thank you. I'm first in the speaking order and I do have two questions. So the first question that I have is, um, you said you would bring in a 18 month position. Um, you've also said that it's very difficult to get planning people. So where do you anticipate? Uh, do you anticipate any difficulties in hiring somebody for that period of time? Uh, Your worship, we are actually going through a process right now of filling a vacant position that was um, uh, uh, as a result of uh, Matt Sidden's leaving. Uh, through that process, we did actually have a very good response. Um, there is a, a planning program within the city of Edmonton at the University of Alberta. Um, I know that there are that that there has been, um, I think, some um, a buildup of, of planning talent within the region, uh, and that's really based on the the recent posting that we had. So I, I am confident that uh, that that uh, that that particular posting would uh, uh, would receive quite a bit of response. Okay, and the second question that I have is within the land use bylaw, is that where it talks about uh, what kind of um, security developers have to put forward? And, uh, and is that being updated as well? 
because there's new types that are available through banks? Uh, Your Worship, right now, the the project is certainly in its infancy. Um, we'll, we, we will be looking at a number of different approaches to regulating land use. Um, that could certainly be built into the land use bylaw to some degree. We haven't con we haven't made that consideration at this point. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harris. I have a couple of questions in this area. First is, what would you suggest we're going to see as the most innovative aspect of the new land use bylaw um, through the process to conclusion? Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, Councillor Harris. So. The objective right now is that we have a land use bylaw that aligns with our municipal development plan. So what the municipal development plan does, which was, which I would say is a little bit unusual or a little bit maybe innovative for, for MDPs, uh, is it sets out a, a, a number of different policy areas or, or geographical policy areas. Um, so it identifies that the older part of Fort Saskatchewan is much different than the newer areas. And therefore, they warrant uh, different approaches to uh, regulating land use. So the idea in the land use bylaw is to kind of use that as a, uh, a template or a framework. Um, and each of those policy areas or, or uh, place type, so to speak, um, we would look at different approaches uh, that would be relevant to those particular areas. So we did some work this year to kind of investigate what those approaches might be. Um, and then in 2022, uh, we would investigate that further and start to create those, those uh, approaches to the particular policy areas. So along those lines, council will get involved um, in a context of collaboration as you uh, start to peel back the layers of the onion on that? Uh, through you, Your Worship, certainly with a project like this, it is a wholly new plan. Um, so we're we're we want to basically do a rethink. Uh, it's very important that we understand what the overall greater public interest is when we are creating those um, regulatory approaches. Um, it is also very important that we keep council up to date in terms of our progress as we go. Great. Um, I have a couple of more on the safety codes, but I'll do those in the second round. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blizzard? No questions right now. Thank you. Councillor Noyan? Thank you, Craig, for your presentation. Uh, it's very clear to me that this is a, this is a critical document uh, that, that contributes greatly to the success of, of your department. Um, just becoming aware of the the refresh projects that were done 2014, 15, 17, and 20, I guess that makes it quite clear that that wasn't enough and that we do need to start from scratch. My question, I guess, is maybe what, and I think you alluded to this a bit, uh, but what what do you feel are the, the largest challenges facing the in implementation of our, our land use bylaw as it, as it sits currently? Uh, through you, Worship Councillor Noyan, um, I think it is important um, when you're looking at a land use bylaw that it, it's um, it, it, it's it's pragmatic and it's appropriate. So, and I think that's where I think some land use bylaws fail is because they use the same approach across the city. Um, so, I think it's important to treat the different place types uh, or policy areas um, differently. Um, and, and again, that is, that is a key objective. Um, like I mentioned before, that this would be a wholly new um, document. So we would be starting from scratch. Um, whereas in, in, with refreshes and updates, you're basically building off of the same template that you already have. Um, so what's key in this project is that we are engaging the community and it's not just consulting with the community, it's doing a fulsome engagement. So we really understand um, the, the various interests or the, the collection of various interests and, and how to create policy around that. Great, that, that's some great perspective. And, and, and yeah, I, I look forward to potential collaboration on this for, from a council standpoint. Thank you, Greg. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Questions? Thank you, Craig, for your presentation. Um, no, the land use bylaw, that's that's really important work, and I definitely look forward to that work coming forward. Um, but my question is regarding the safety codes officer. So you had talked about um, some collaboration with Strathcona County. And I'm just wondering, has anything come out of that? Um, what sort of efficiencies did you find um, with, were you able to find within, um, within um, combining your services together? Sure, thank you. Through you, your worship, Councillor Abatoye. So we are uh, just over two months, about two and a half months into our um, arrangement with Strathcona County. Um, and since then, that's also when we've also fully transitioned to in-house inspectors as well. Um, so what we're finding is um, that I think most of all, what's really helping is the collaboration and just the, the information and knowledge exchange between the two departments. We'd like to be in a position in about a year from now where we are at a point where we are, are very much self-reliant and, and we just, you know, we can, we can still have that arrangement with Strathcona County. Um, currently, they're providing, it's, it, it's called part three, which is, um more the commercial industrial more the complex type inspections um our, Stephen brown our our safety codes team lead um is working towards having that same credential um so it's invaluable to have that that mentorship with it with with our 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 inspectors our in-house inspectors so it is it is turning out to be very uh, very productive and effective Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, do you say we're hiring three safety code services inspector for one seventy nine thousand uh, dollars? Through you, your worship. Um, so we will be um, uh, when we're fully staffed. We will have three FTEs that are our safety code officers. The arrangement, as it was before, is um, so in in twenty twenty we had budgeted one hundred ninety six thousand. For an external agency, uh, that contract ended in uh, the end of August of, of this year, uh, and we anticipated that that contract would have been quite a bit higher. Um, that the the previous arrangement that we had it also included a full time manager of safety code position as well. So combined with the uh, what we were paying an external agency plus the um uh the staff member that we had to manage the program uh it's about the same okay all right thank you dr thomas hey, you can call me craig <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh councillor macon uh thanks for your presentation greg um i'll just make a quick comment that i've um got to personally see the efficiency and the um the strengths that come with having uh, Strathcona safety code. So I really do appreciate their expertise. Uh, I think that was a great move. Um, Craig, you alluded to it a little bit with Councillor uh, Harris's questioning. Um, when you do a big, I'm just curious, like with this big land use bylaw and, and changing like the whole document like that, um, I feel like there's a lot of moving parts and that I worry that some things can get lost in in um, the changeover from one thing to another. I mean, when you typically change something in the land use bylaw, it gets come, it comes to council, right? So when you're changing so much, is there the possibility that things get lost or do you kind of bring chunks along the way to council to, to say, this is what we're doing and this is what we're doing? How do you, I'm just trying to understand how that looks when you're changing such a important document in such a big holistic way. Uh, yeah, through you, you worship Councillor Macon. Um, that's a great question, and I uh, maybe maybe Mr. Hour can help me out, but uh, I'll take the first crack at it. We've done a lot of work right now, and uh, a couple of years ago, when we brought on the principal planner position, the intent of that position was to manage and coordinate projects associated with growth and we kind of felt that with the mdp project and the implementation projects that that would create um that that position would would 
uh, be, vis be busy for a very long time. We were able to do a lot of groundwork and planning this year um, to kind of understand how this project would happen and what, um, I guess, what, what administration's role would be versus what the consultant would be doing. Um, so we have laid out a lot of that groundwork. It would be a very similar approach, um, but probably a little bit more in depth and a little bit more detailed um, as the municipal development plan project. Um, so with that, we kind of had a very succinct uh, laid out plan for how it would work, um, how we would update and engage council as well as all of the other interest groups. Um, and uh, and and yeah, but the intent would be, I think, to um, keep council up to date as much as possible. Um, and uh, um, so maybe I'll stop there because I, I kind of feel that I'm rambling a little bit, but I'll I'll see if TJ has anything else to add on that front. Um, thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Greg, and uh, through your work to Councillor Macon. Um, with regard to the, the project approach, uh, Craig is absolutely accurate. Um, and in terms of thinking uh, regarding things getting uh, lost, I, I think the analogy of uh, a vehicle is, is fairly appropriate. Um, so when you're attempting to tune up a, a car to meet your current needs, over time, eventually things are um, going to get a, a little bit misaligned. Maybe your family grew, all, all of those types of, of things. Whereas if you're setting out that process to select a new vehicle, you're able to sort of lay out your priorities as we've done in the MDP, and you're building that custom to fit what your current identified needs are. Um, and then fortunately with the land use bylaw, we have the backing of the uh, Municipal Government Act legislation that lays out those musts and mays for the, the process. Um, so having done a lot of that uh, research and work, we've been able to, to lay out uh, and ensure that we are not missing things, but actually getting that uh, clear alignment with our current objectives. Thank you both. Hey, thank you, Councillor Kelly. No questions, thank you. Hey, thank you, I'm just, uh, can't remember if anybody needed a round two, I see one hand. Okay, I just see one hand, so I'll go to uh, Councillor Harris. Um, so, Craig, um, how has our safety code certification changed with this alignment with uh, Strathcona County? Uh, you've mentioned that obviously one of our senior safety codes folks is, is getting certified to deal with the industrial inspections. Is it? it and how has that certification changed and is that costing us more money or is it saving us money or is it improving efficiency? Uh, through your worship to Councillor uh, Harris and maybe I'll I'll ask if if needed uh, for uh, Mr. Brown to join me. But um, so right now where where we're at is we would have um, one. Um, uh, safety code officer that that has the discipline of doing residential building inspections. Um, he also is able to do some commercial industrial. Um, and then we will have fully staffed plumbing and gas and electrical. So that that would take up about 95% of the inspections that we we would do. Um, the plumbing and gas inspector that we have, he he also intends to get a dual discipline, so he would be competent in in building as well. Um, and uh, with the electrical, we are still um, we do need to fill that position. But um, generally speaking, if we had an electrical inspector uh, inspector that had a dual discipline of uh, of building, that would be very helpful, and I think that would be ideal. Um, and right now. Um, with, with the Strathcona inspectors generally are, uh, the, the capacity that we need from them is with our, our, our part three, which is the commercial industrial. Um, we also do have two casual inspectors, um, that provide support for us, 
uh, for things like if somebody's sick or on vacation, that sort of thing. Um, so right now, because we don't have an electrical inspector on staff, we we are drawing from a, a uh, from that casual pool that we have right now. So under the current uh, under the previous regime, we had a contract with the inspections group, and they provided a full range of competency to conduct all of the inspections that we needed. Um, why is what we're doing now better than that? Um, because we could have adjusted the contract for the inspections group or any other safety codes inspection uh, operation to provide the service we wanted, correct? So why is this better? That's what I'm trying to understand. Sure, uh, through you, Worship, uh, to Councillor Harris. So a couple of things, one, is the cost is about the same. And I would suggest that there is always an unknown because I think we we did have a very good deal with the inspections group before, but that that contract came to an end and we did we we forecasted that uh, that contract would have been much higher. So based on the contract that we had, we would be about breaking even. Um, the the main thing is the level of service so there is um a lot more attention to detail having in-house inspectors um leading up to this and it was about two years ago when we we really started thinking about whether or not we should be transitioning um and we did some work we did talk to uh, municipalities within the region that have in-house inspectors um and got a sense of of the type of work that they do and the type of oversight uh, with respect to um, the inspections. And, and what we found was there's a, there's a sense of ownership in the work that they do. Um, and there's a sense of pride, which is different than that of, uh, of, of uh, contracted inspectors. So there is, there is a difference in terms of the level of service and efficiency. I'll leave it there and I'll ask Mr. Mr. Brown to, add some color to that. Well, well, I'll tell you what, that's fine, Craig. Um, I don't need anything more. I've done a lot of work in the safety code space as a consultant, and I would say it's appropriate uh, course of direction. I think it's uh, long overdue, so I support going forward in this on this basis, so thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I see there's uh, additional questions generated. Is it just Councillor Noyan, or is there anybody else? To know if I need to go through rotation, no. Okay, Councillor Noyan, question. Thank you, Worship. Okay. Just quick, simple questions uh, for you, Craig. Uh, when was the concept conceptualization or the the need for a brand new uh, land use bylaw identified? This was 2021 here, with, within the last year, I would assume. Uh, through you, Worship, to Councillor Noyan. Um, I think really the major uh, the major thing was the completion of the uh, municipal development plan. Um, a key, a key implementation item within the strategy uh, was to update uh, or or take a comprehensive look at at the land use bylaw because the municipal development plan sets a different vision um, and has a much different um, approach. Uh, it just makes sense to to do a new land use bylaw. Also, and I think it was mentioned before, we've always taken the approach since the last ma since the last major update, which was in 2013, is to constantly refresh the land use bylaw. And kind of through that process, what we found is um, there are there are inefficiencies that are built into the approach that we're using right now. And so we felt in order to to uh, update it, uh, it was necessary to do a wholly new one. TJ used the analogy of a vehicle. Yeah. Um, I would say a refresh is is a tune up, um, whereas this would be a whole new car. Okay, and and uh, uh, another quick question uh, in in this uh, in this proposal, you you say that you are going to work with the community. Uh, what what is what, what would that actually look like? What's what's maybe the plan for that a bit? If you could, I, I know that's a bit that you could probably talk about that for a long time, but maybe simple. sure. And that's fair, um, your worship. And and so I'll I'll maybe do an overview. And if TJ wanted to add a little bit more to it, but 
When we create a plan, we want to do it um, for the overall greater public interest. So typically, or, or maybe I wouldn't say typically, but in order to do that, we really have to drill down and understand what the community values within their particular community. Um, and usually what happens is there's a lot of different interests that we have to consider, but what we want to try to do is understand that overall greater public interest. So that does take a lot of work um, going out into the community and, and trying to establish what that is. If you just do an open house, you're probably going to get the same people that go to open houses and you're not going to get a very good understanding of what the, the overall community wants. Um, so there is, there is quite a bit of necessary work that's involved in that. TJ, if you wanted to add anything. Um, yeah, uh, through your worship to, to Councillor Nguyen. Um, uh, I can start with a, an example of some of the, the work we've already uh, begun um, with council direction uh, earlier this year. We expedited the uh, bit of the mature neighborhoods uh, portion of the project and have actually started working groups uh, with residents of, of our mature neighborhoods, consulting them on uh, the development patterns that make sense to analyze in clusters and then meeting with them to um, familiarize ourselves with their understanding of their neighborhoods, their priorities within it, um, so that as we progress, we can reflect those uh, adequately in the regulations and ensure that those are um, honoring the unique aspects of their neighborhood and ensuring that those are preserved through redevelopment cycles. Um, and so that type of work would continue uh, as we start to look at other areas of the city as well. It looks like you have your work cut out for you. Okay, so I think we're good. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thomas. So that will conclude yours and we will move on to economic development. So I would invite uh, Mr. Mark Morsey to join us. Thank you, Your Worship, and good morning uh, to you and members of council. And uh, same thing, you'll do your entire presentation. We'll take questions at the end. That is correct. So uh, again, good morning. My name is Mark Morrissey. I am the Director of Economic Development and joining me here today will our Economic Development Officers, Reed Bodwin and Stacey Oste. And it's my pleasure to present the department budget for 2022, uh, which can be found in section eight of your budget documents. So just some, uh, a selection of department highlights, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, the department leads the implementation of the downtown action plan, which is designed to activate underutilized space and encourage investment in our downtown core. Uh, this is a document that council adopted in July. Uh, another major program area for our department is business retention. With the onset of the pandemic, our department shifted a number of resources to biz business support services, which included the launch of the Support Your Fort campaign to encourage residents to support their business community. The feedback for this program has been overwhelmingly positive and the campaign will continue uh, to provide assistance to local businesses as they recover from the in impacts of the pandemic. Of course, as health restrictions hopefully begin to ease, we are seeing an increase in the number of potential investors uh, that are looking in this region. Uh, in 2021 alone, there have been four investment decisions within the city, particularly within the industrial sector. Uh, each of these is in the tens of millions, if not more, uh, in terms of capital investment. And I, uh, this number does not include the recent announcement from Dow, which is to build the world's first net zero cracker in Fort Saskatchewan, which is effectively tripling their production. So in terms of program changes, most of them are going to be fairly minor, uh, just a reallocation of resources to reflect 2022 priorities and our work plan. There is one budget request, which I'll speak to in a moment. Uh, so during the pandemic, uh, department allocated resources and staff time to supporting businesses, as I mentioned. This included waiving the business license fees, the Support Your Fort campaign, additional funding for new grants to help businesses adjust operations. So for 2022, as hopefully we see these restrictions ease, we will be shifting resources and staff time accordingly uh, and placing an increased emphasis on investment attraction and downtown revitalization. And you can see these allocations in note one of the, the budget document. Uh, in August of 2020, uh, the shareholders of Edmonton Global, of which the city is one, uh, voted to increase their operation or the organization's budget. Uh, this increase was phased in over a, a two year period. And as such, you will notice an increase to our annual contribution to that organization. 
Um, yeah, this is, in, is highlighted in note four of the budget document. I should note that this is the final year of the phased increase and we do not anticipate any further increases to Edmonton Global's fees at this time. Uh, for 2022, the department is also uh, proposing to restart the annual contributions to the Economic Development Reserve and this is in request 610063. In previous years, the department has allocated a percentage of business license fees into the reserve to support uh, initiatives for local businesses. These contributions were halted at the end of 2019 to fund an increase to the tourism hosting grant. But since early 2020, the reserve has been accessed for various initiatives, including um, increased funding for business support grants in 2020 and 2021, as well as funding the implementation of the downtown action plan. These, uh, this has re depleted the reserve and our current uncommitted balance is 181,800, which does not include the contribution proposed for next year. Uh, the department is proposing to allocate 10% of business license fees to the reserve on an ongoing basis. And for next year, we estimate that amount to be around 21,009, as is highlighted in note three of your document. I should note that this reserve supports uh, the program area of business license and economic, uh, economic data management, which is this in the second quartile. This program scored high on demand, cost recovery, and reliance. And this reserve also supports program areas of business retention and can actually be accessed by other departments for initiatives that support the overall business community. Uh, these past two years have demonstrated how valuable this reserve can be, so the department feels it's prudent to rebuild the reserve for future years. And as that's my only budget request at this time, it concludes my presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you very much. So we'll go into clarifying questions. Councillor Harris, you're up first. Mark, what would you suggest is the most significant benefit from adding $49,101 to your budget from last year to this year? It's in, the, it's, it's in the budget, but tell me, what do you see as the most fundamental benefit we get from increasing your budget by 50 grand? Um, considering almost all of that uh, amount is going to the Edmonton Global increase, uh, we it's it's a requirement of the of being a shareholder in that organization good and that's ultimately i guess what i'm looking from any manager in in the budget presentation what's the value for that additional increase so thank you that's what i was looking for thank you councillor blizzard no questions thank you councillor noyan Your Worship, yeah, just just a quick question because I I believe that it has to do with your the twenty two thousand uh, from business license revenue. I believe you had in twenty twenty one waived business licensing fees in Fort Saskatchewan. Is that something because of pandemic that you're looking to do again? It doesn't seem like it is, right? Just I might be misunderstanding this. Your Worship, through, through, through to Councillor Noyan, uh, that's correct. In 2021, we did waive business license fees as a result of the pandemic. Um, it is not something we're proposing for 2022, uh, and therefore it, it's reflected in the budget as such. Right. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry, so why aren't you proposing it, given that we're still in this pandemic and we want to encourage small businesses in Fort Saskatchewan, I guess, is a good question. Uh, so your worship through to Councillor Noyan, the fees were waived in 2021 um, simply because it was the right decision to do. Um, we recognize that waiving a, a $100 renewal fee for a business is not something that's going to make or break anybody. But given that businesses during that year had been forced to shut down because of health restrictions, um, they had paid a license, so they were unable to operate for through no fault of their own. So for that reason, the city felt it best to re to to kind of give them a, a break on their renewal fee because they were forced to shut down and could not operate. Uh, given the current level of restrictions, that is not the case. Uh, so this, I mean, it, it is something that we could consider if council feels it's it's necessary and, and God forbid we hit a, a fifth wave, but at this time we're not proposing it. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Abatoye, any clarifying questions? No questions, but thank you and kudos to your team for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Macon. I don't have any questions. Thanks for your presentation, Mark. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. 
No questions. Um, also, thank you, Mark. Thank you. And I have no questions either. Thank you very much. So you are finished at 1124. You get my big trophy for being the fastest one today. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so it's 1124. We will move on to utilities. And then after utilities, we will take a lunch break. So Mr. Gagnon, full presentation, and then we'll go into questions at the end. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and members of council, I'm Shaw Gagnon, Public Works Director, and I'm presenting the 2022 utility budget located in section nine of your budget binder. Assisting uh, with this presentation, Brian Rogers, Managers of Roads and Utility Services, Brad McDonald, Infrastructure Strategies, and Sadie Miller, Waste Program Supervisor. Public Works will oversee the operation and maintenance of utilities, including water, sewer, and waste management. We manage a total of about 18 programs as listed on page 911 of your budget binder. These are funded under the user fees and utility rates. A few examples of programs include the water distribution system, the bulk water station, sanitary sewer collection systems, as well as the transfer station programs and residential collection and disposal program for waste, just to name a few. In 2022, our focus will be on completing current projects, such as the transfer station enhancement, as well as its rebranding and adjusting our operation around this site. Another major priority includes our work on the secondary water supply. Our goal is to provide information on option costs and recommendation in 2022. We will continue our discussion with industries who are looking to access our utility services as well. I will now highlight uh, some of the changes to the 2022 budget per program. Please refer to page 911 of your budget binder. Under the water supply program, in reference to note number one, we anticipate an increase in water supply rate charged by the Capital Region Northeast Water Commission. And this comes pretty much every year. At this time, we assume an increase similar to last year meaning about 5% or 8.6 cents per cubic meter. Uh, this will result in an increase of $220,500 in costs as the highlighted in note number one. Under the sanitary sewer transmission program, which uh, captured the cost of treating sewer, uh, in note number three, we anticipate that the Alberta Capital Region Wastewater Commission rate will increase by about 4.4% or six, 6 cents per cubic meter. This will result in an additional cost to the city to treat sewer of $141,600. We also project a decrease in industrial volume to be sent to treatment, which will then result in a cost reduction of $318,000. Regarding our residential waste programs, Inflation and growth projection was considered in our costing for collection and disposal of our waste and organic programs. Our recycling collection and disposal program is projected to decrease as we change the disposal facility in 2021. Please refer to note four, five, and six for details. At the transfer station, a budget request is brought forward to add seasonal staff to cover vacation, training, and leave from current permanent staff. Cost allocation is distributed between three programs reflected in notes seven, eight, and nine. Under the organic drop-off and disposal program, the disposal of yard waste requires us to now haul this material away. The additional cost is $51,300 and details are in note nine on page nine and 12. Regarding the utility user rate, now note 11 shows an overall utility rate revenue adjustment requirement. So budget 2022 see an overall increase for an, uh, an average residential bill of 3.4%, uh, which represents $3.93 per month. This is our lowest increase over the last five years. This increase are mainly driven by our regional water and wastewater commission projected rate increase for 2022. But please note that the final rates charged by the Water Commission and the Sewer Commission 
uh, and paid by the city will be made available to us officially by the end of May. So what you got here for rates for water and sewer that is charged to us may change. We will then review our budget and water rates and, and, and sewer rates and provide new information to council at the December 14 regular council meeting. The utility department uh, has one budget request starting on page 913 of your budget binder. Project request 430020, transfer station seasonal staff at a cost of $25,100. This budget request supports our four programs at the transfer station, which all rates in quarter, quartile three. In general, these transfer station programs call high in population serve, demand, cost recovery, well planned and maintained infrastructures. This budget request will help cover vacation, training, and other permanent staff leave and support operation also at the transfer station. The cost of the request is $25,100 and will be offset through an adjustment to the revenue collected at the transfer station based on the three year uh, actuals, which is about $26,260, and also a decrease in overtime cost of $8,000. So the net Impact is a positive $9,250. This concludes my presentation, and our team is available to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Blissard, you're first for clarifying questions. Uh, we've had now the uh, collection of organics for four years. Do you have an average bill? I know when I get my bill, it says, you know, based on 14 cubic meters use of water and whatever the average. Do you know what the bills would be in 2018, 19, 20, and 21 for an average family? Because I do hear sometimes that people are saying, you know, it's jumped quite a bit over the years. So I'm just curious what that would be. Uh, Your Worship to Councillor Blizzard, I think that we just need to go back to the archive and pull those uh, average bill increase, and we can do that for you. So uh, we'll just need to get back with the information. but. It's it's uh, it's there. Okay, thanks. I'd appreciate that. Um, oh, that's you. it for now. I'll let the others talk. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, Councillor Noyan. Thank you, Worship. Uh, yeah, it's interesting to me for uh, the transfer station and saw an increase in, I guess, as usage and, and materials by fifty percent. So that's yeah, yeah, annual tons. So with the when the new transfer station becomes open, my question, Richard, is: uh, Are you are you working on, um, uh, I guess, a fee guideline and, and rates guideline for potential new services that we offered, and and when will council be able to see this? Your ship uh, to Councillor Noyan, uh, I don't believe that the intent is to increase the service level, or uh, there may be uh, an intent to maybe uh, be a little bit more efficient on other matters that uh, we're dealing uh, with right now. So I will let maybe uh, Mrs. Miller to uh, address the programs at the uh, new transfer station or the updated transfer station. Sure, thanks, Richard. Uh, through your worship to Patrick Nguyen, um, we are restructuring the fees at the transfer station. Currently, we provide a volume based fee and under the new station, we're going to have a scale. So it'll be a weight based fee and council will be able to see that new fee structure in the fees and charges bylaw that's coming up in the budget deliberations. Uh, as for increases in services, we will not be increasing services related to the paid portion of the site. But we do anticipate increases in services on the recycling side, which are all free. So, um, things like styrofoam recycling will be introduced. Um, we're expecting some new items to be able to be collected through the upcoming extended producer responsibility regulation, things like that. So, everything that will be added in terms of service will be considered a free service because it's on the recycling side. Okay, great. Thank you for that explanation, Sadie. And. So, yeah, just a, a further question, I guess, to that is that we should see, probably see a value because we, we have a scale uh, in in, ca in capturing uh, some of the increased costs to a larger, more comprehensive transfer and recycling station. As you said, Richard, that's not a service level increase that, that is proposed right now, but I would highly recommend that we go in that direction. 
Was there a second question there? Oh, should we go in that direction? <laughs> He's just smiling at you. <laughs> Your Worship, the yes. in terms of service level, I mean, right now, uh, and the project that we have, which is uh, the transfer station, and the announcement we have done there is to you know, to, to to bring it to it to. Uh, to a level that will ease the, the current service that we have. If there's any request to increase the service level, uh, we can have a discussion with council to see what it looks like and what's the cost associated with that. And then council can make an informed decision on that. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Okay, thank you. And just for your information, Councillor Noyan, all user fees are in section 21 that we will be dealing with later in the budget. Okay, uh, Councillor Abatoye, you're next for clarifying questions. I have no questions. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Councillor Macon. No questions. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Uh, yes, I have multiple questions. Sorry, Richard. Um, water meter reading and meter maintenance budgeted for the coming year. Uh, an increase of $12,000 to a total of $432,000. I don't know what's in there because I thought and I was comfortable thinking that our water meters read automatically now with the new system. Yeah, you were shipped to uh, Councillor Kelly. I believe the change in that program is related to a, a reduction in the fees and charges. I think that we took away uh, one of uh, the fees that we were charging for connecting and disconnecting um, and uh, for the customers, and which overall resulted in a decrease in revenue. So I think that's I, And I understand that. I'm sorry, my uh, question was poorly worded, so I'll rephrase uh, it. What do we spend four hundred and thirty-two thousand dollars on for meter reading when they read automatically now and it's digitized to do that? Your worship to Councillor Kelly, for, I'll, I'll provide you with a bit more detailed uh, information if it's okay, unless uh, someone from finance can provide a little bit more information on what is. That specific program in terms of costs, and uh, there's an aspect of staffing. I know that for sure because we do need to maintain a few things. But uh, I see Mrs. Andrew Co here. Yeah, I'm just pulling up the program. Um, you know what? Okay. You can get back to us on that. Sure. Rather than hold up today, I'd mm -hmm. like a little bit of detail. So, so take your time, please. Um, I still think I've only asked one question. So, organics collection and disposal. A rather hefty inflationary increase. Um, but can you give us a little more color on that, please? Yes, um, Councillor Kelly. Uh, maybe Mrs. Uh, Miller can talk a little bit about uh, some of the changes and the, the costs associated with that. Through your worship to Councillor Kelly, the region is in a bit of a state of flux right now when it comes to organics. Uh, as was discussed in previous years, we do have limited facilities available for disposal, um, but that is slowly changing. Right now, the budget increase is purely a conservative estimate so that we're not relying solely on one facility. Our primary facility right now could potentially be unpredictable, and we don't want to count on that facility being available to us for the full 12 months. So $106,000 budgeted increase for organics, and that's an anticipated increase in case something bad happens in the next year? Through your worship, exactly. Um, again, just a conservative estimate in case uh, we can't fully rely on our primary facility and our secondary facility is significantly more for disposal rates. Um, Mayor, thank you, Sadie. Mayor Catcher, um, please come back to me. Hey, I certainly will. Um, um, my question is regarding the styrofoam. You indicated that we will have styrofoam bins there. Um, so I guess the question is, um, when will they be available? And the second question that goes with that one is, uh, if we want to divert styrofoam from landfill, should we be telling people just to 
hold their styrofoam until the bin is there now so that we can actually get it out of landfill? Your Worship, we can get that styrofoam recycling system in place right when we have capacity. Uh, as you can see, the site is still under construction and we're really hesitant to introduce new services when we're not sure if we're going to have the space to accommodate them. So right when we know uh, that space will be available, we'll be releasing an RFP. There are a couple different recycling technologies available in the region uh, and we'll get that hopefully in spring, but it is dependent on construction timelines. Oh, and in terms of your second question, um, residents, if they do have the space, are more than welcome to stockpile. Uh, but again, I'm not entirely sure when that program will be introduced. So it just depends on their storage capacity. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Harris? Will the department be providing information to uh, council relative to what uh, the minister announced yesterday? um relative to the producer responsibility um program and how that's going to impact us i understand the regulations won't come in until sometime later next year um will we get a more definitive kind of update from administration on that and what that will do uh, what that will mean to our recycling program your worship to council iris yes we can provide a briefing on this or if needed, uh, at a cow uh, committee of the whole meeting, we can provide information as well. Yeah, I, I realize it's a bit of a moving target, but uh, I think that would be good to at least provide some sort of an update to council going forward, because that will definitely have an impact on on uh, how we are managing recycling. So I, I, I don't know what that means, and it would, uh, would be good to, to find out more about it as we go. So thanks. Okay, thank you. So I know there was a request for a round two. I'm just gonna see if anybody else has more questions. Other, okay, so I see another hand. So Councillor Blizzard, did you have anything further? No, you're good. Uh, Councillor Noyan. Yep. Yeah, my question has to do with that 1.5 cubic uh, million cubic meters of water that industrial customers in Fort Saskatchewan are sourcing outside of our city distribution. That is a massive number. It, it, I'm, I'm curious where this water is coming from, why they're sourcing outside the city. And it, it seems to me like this could be an opportunity for the city to gain more profit uh, off water. Um, can you, yeah, can you speak to that? Uh, your worship to Councillor Nguyen, which page are you referring to into the document? Oh, it's page 9-1. Nine, it's at the bottom indicating that we have more wastewater than uh, than water being sold because of sourcing outside of the city. Okay, and, uh, and, and the reason is like industrial water normally comes directly from the river and is treated by the industries in general. So this is why uh, maybe there's a, a difference there. Okay, so yeah, this this isn't. Yeah, this and, isn't and it's not, it's, water. No, that... no, the, the the industries are not using water from uh, from like a third party or something like this. It comes directly from the river. They have uh, a permit to do that, and they will use the water for the process. And then after that, it gets discharged uh, for one of our industry uh, into our wastewater system. And and this 1.5 cu million cubic meters. This is this is probably the plant sites that are using this. I would assume. Yeah, we have one industry that are using that. So absolutely. Okay. And we, we the, is there an opportunity? Absolutely. We are uh, talking with another industry who is interested to uh, connect to our wastewater system at this time. But I cannot release more information than that. Great. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Councillor Batoye. Did you have anything further? Yeah, just a quick question for Sadie or um, Mr. Um, Gagnon. Um, the organics drop off and processing. So you said that we no longer keep large quantities of this material and we are holding them off site. So why is that? Mrs. Smitter, please. Through your worship to Councillor Abitoye, we've decided to stop processing materials on site. So historically, we would actually take the yard waste yard waste materials from the transfer station and turn them on site to produce the compost product. 
Um, mm -hmm. It was very difficult for us to market that product. So it kind of just sat on our site and took up valuable land. Uh, so we're now sending these to a processing facility off site and we are able to bring material back for free. So when the new transfer station opens up, we are going to have a, a spot with grade A compost for residents to take. Uh, and it will be free of charge actually. So uh, we're still providing that service and offering that resource, uh, but it'll just look a little bit different. And it's just coming at a little cost too. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sadie. Thank you, Councillor Macon. Did you have anything further? You're good, Councillor Kelly, back to you. Yes, thank you. It's been my experience now through, this is I think the fifth budget that Utility rates in general have been rising every year of my in the last five years at a rate significantly higher than the rate of inflation. Would it be possible for administration to provide some history, like perhaps 10 years worth of rate increases on our wholesale, not, not, not for what Fort Saskatchewan is charging, but our wholesale cost for water and for wastewater and for solid waste? Uh, And Mayor Catcher, I have concerns with the response I got to my two questions the first round. And I would like to deal with those and we can't deal with them if we can't discuss them. So I'm going to request that this particular section be referred for future council discussion once we have a little more information. Okay, do you want it uh, flagged so it comes back on day three? Or I guess the I'm question sorry. That I have. Yes, absolutely. I used the wrong word. Flag, please. Yes. Okay. Okay. And I just need to make sure, um, Mr. Dance, did you capture the questions that uh, Councillor Kelly had? Because. No, Your Worship, if you could repeat them, Councillor Kelly, are you specifically talking about the history of the utility 10 year rates for wholesale costs or something different? Um, if we could have that by then, it would be helpful, I think. No, I'm referring to the two questions I had. Um, let me scroll to the proper page. Give me a second. There we go. Um, the water meteor. The $432,000 budget amount for water meter reading. Okay, yeah, I got that one. Explanation and um, the $100,000 organics adjustment, inflationary adjustment. Okay, so, okay. And it's because of those I'm requesting the flag. Thank you. Okay. And then you're finished with your other questions. Uh, you know what? Let's get some more information. And we'll beat it up again. Okay. Thank you. I'll uh, check on the flag in the moment. I have no further questions. Councillor Harris, did you have any further questions? You're good. Okay. Does anybody have any opposition to uh, that uh, being flagged so that we can have further discussion and debate on it? Not seeing any, so that will get flagged and come back through the flagging. Okay, so uh, just going to double check. Is there any other questions on this section? Otherwise, we are at 12 minutes to 12. I'm not going to try and push another section in. Uh, Councillor Macon, I'm just going to check with you. Your CRAS meeting was cancelled. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so um, if everybody's okay, are we good to be back at 1230? Would that be sufficient time or do you need longer? Forty five minutes. You're on mute, Councillor Kelly. I can't hear you. You're on mute. I'll try again. Forty five minutes, please. Okay, so 45 minutes. Okay. All right. Okay, we will be in recess and we'll return in 45 minutes. Thank you.
Was that a request to start at uh, 1245 or for 45 minutes? I think I kind of missed something. Nobody's on, um, so I'm missing. Or you didn't miss anything. My my point was poorly worded. I meant to say and thought I said start again at 1245. Obviously, a 45 minute break or a 43 minute break is of no consequence. Yeah, no, that's what I was wondering, but people aren't on. So another 10 minutes, I'm guessing. Uh, I, I don't know. I thought we were starting at 1230 because that was about 45 minutes. A confusion. You're on mute. Uh, remind council that we are live streaming. So this time Thank you. I was just going to say that and I do apologize. I was on and then I spilled my water. So I had to quickly, I didn't want everyone seeing me having to mop up my desk. So uh, we're about one minute late. So I will invite uh, all of council to please rejoin us. I think we have everybody. Okay. Didn't you say twelve forty-five? Because my my clock it's twelve thirty-seven. <laughs> no, I said forty-five minutes, which would make it twelve thirty-five because we left before twelve o'clock. So with that, we do have uh, all of our council. So hopefully all of our administration uh, has uh, rejoined us as well. And uh, we can continue on and begin with uh, culture and recreation services. So I would invite uh, Diane Yanch to join us. Good afternoon, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Diane Yanch and I'm the Director for Culture and Recreation. With me today is Jessica Weller, the Culture and Heritage Supervisor. Please refer to Section 10 in your budget binder for budget details and plan requests. The goal of this department is to enhance the quality of life of every citizen in our community through recreation and culture. We offer experiences that create a sense of place and pride in the community. Our programs provide opportunities for children, youth, adults, and seniors to stay active, whether physically, mentally, or creatively. We continue to look at ways to make our programs and facilities more inclusive and accessible. Culture and Recreation has 30 different priority-based budgeting areas. Some of those areas include aquatics, public art, community events, facility bookings, fitness and wellness, the Fort Heritage Precinct, arenas, our sheep grazing program, which is probably the most unique, tourist fields, performing arts, and the new one of truth and reconciliation. Culture and recreation will continue to recover from the impacts of COVID-19 in 2022. With the implementation of the restrictions exemption program at all culture and recreation facilities, we hope to see our participation rates rise to pre-COVID levels in 2022. The Dow Centennial Center is not yet back to pre-COVID hours of operation. The Dow Centennial Center is open 15 and a half hours per week less than in 2019. The pool is open four hours less per week. We will continue to monitor and make adjustments to hours of operation and staffing levels to meet demand. We do hope to open reopen child minding this month as soon as we can hire um, enough casual staff to open our new reduced hours of operation that were set in 2020. Youth sports and lessons are starting to return to pre COVID levels, social gatherings, school participation and adult participation are slower to return. This is seen in the impacts to the fitness center, fitness and wellness programs, as well as the theater and pool rentals by schools and curriculum programming at the Fort Heritage Precinct. Casual staffing in these areas are adjusted to meet demand. Part of the COVID-19 recovery is looking at building back better, finding efficiencies, looking at areas of service where improvements can be made and looking at what the new needs of the community are. 
Truth and Reconciliation is a key initiative for culture and recreation in 2022. In 2021, we started to build relationships with local elders and community members. We met with Indigenous consultants, held training staff, um, sessions for staff, and honored the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Information on, up, on the upcoming plans will be presented later in the presentation. Culture and Recreation will be looking at five areas this year for program efficiency or service level improvements. One is the indoor field. The busiest time of year is October to March for soccer and March to May for dance. Daytimes in summer are pretty quiet. We will explore new opportunities for the field to maximize field use. The second is fitness in the wellness program area. We will view, review to ensure optimum amount of drop-in and registered programs. The fee structure will also be reviewed to ensure consistency and efficiency between all recreation and culture programs. The third area is city camps. We will look at the needs of the community and compare them to what the programs offer. We will look at the opportunity to expand programming to both fall and spring breaks. The fourth area is to access programs and services. Child minding was moved out of the area and put into its own priority based budgeting program area. We will also re review the program of uh, everyone plays to make it more efficient and user friendly. We will increase marketing of the program to reach residents who may be in need of these supports, especially as we recover. The fifth is a new program area, Truth and Reconciliation, which will be the final uh, plan request in this presentation. Plan request number 72-0112 is the Municipal Partnership Agreement with the Town of Bruderheim on page 10-7. This program aligns with community support and falls in the second quartile. The funding source is the Financial Stabilization and Contingency Reserve. From 2016 to 2020, the City of Fort Saskatchewan had a municipal partnership agreement with the Town of Bruderheim in regards to ICE users at the Carol Mashmeyer Arena. $30,000 a year was paid to Bruderheim, giving our ICE users second pick of primetime ICE right after the local Bruderheim users. In 2021, we continued this agreement at $5,000 per year, a significant decrease from the 30,000. The municipal agreement will continue for an additional two years for the 2022-2023 ICE season and the 2023-2024 ICE season. A review of the program will be completed at this time. This agreement showcases how neighboring municipalities can partner to the benefit of both communities and their user groups. Request number 74-0095 is Truth and Re Reconciliation on page 10-9. This request re supports the Truth and Reconciliation Priority-Based Budgeting Area as an in quartile 2. The budget impact in 2022 is 40000 and the funding source is the Financial Stabilization and Contingency Reserve. This is a multi-year project and budget requests will be brought forward each year as we develop relationships and discuss projects and programs. The plan request shows estimates for the following six years. The City of Fort Saskatchewan is committed to truth and reconciliation. The City recognizes the need to support all Indigenous communities, understand the truth of Canada's colonial history, and celebrate and uplift Indigenous voices, culture, and tradition. In March 2021, City Council expressed support for truth and reconciliation work in Fort Saskatchewan at a municipal level. Council ejected administration to continue researching and consulting with Indigenous stakeholders for the remainder of 2021 and to prepare a plan for consideration with the 2022 budget deliberations. As mentioned previously, we started to build relationships with the local community members we met with Indigenous consultants, held training for staff, and honoured the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. We also incorporated truth and reconciliation work into an existing full-time position. In 2022, truth and reconciliation efforts will focus on training for staff and council to ensure the city has an understanding of historical and current issues. Training will begin the journey of fulfilling the truth and reconciliation commissions calls to actions related to municipalities and emphasize the pr principles of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. 
Truth and reconciliation is about relationship building and not to find timelines and goals. It is critical to approach all efforts in collaboration with Indigenous residents and neighbours based on how the relationship progresses. Therefore, the actions taken in 2022 will largely depend on what is identified during this relationship building process. Some initial plans include continuing to build those essential relationships, continue to participate in lead regional collaboration to share information and resources, continue to offer training to all city staff and encourage truth and reconciliation training and awareness into job specific portfolios. Truth and reconciliation will be offered to elected officials and senior leadership. We will also begin looking at amending the Fort Heritage Precinct story to better highlight Indigenous history. Land recognition guidelines will be developed and we'll work with a consultant to complete an oral history study that may include traditional land uses and names. Some of the truth and reconciliation work will be aligned with our diversity and inclusion work. And that concludes my presentation. Jessica and I will be available to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will begin with uh, Patrick, your top of this uh, question period. Thank you, Worship. <clears throat> yeah, two questions. My first question has to do with uh, initiatives for the uh, turf field in the DCC to uh, encompass maybe a broader spectrum of of programs or, or services. Can you just speak to that, what, what that would look like? Um, through your worship to Councillor Noyan, we, in the life cycle, the turf is up for replacement in 2023. So we want to make sure we are um, looking at all options before we start that process. So whether it's moving some of our fitness programming into there, maybe it's having a removable surface um, so that you have turf in one season and a different surface in another. We just want to make sure we're looking at all of the options in 2022. So we're ready for 2023 when that turf needs to be replaced. Excellent. Thank you. And in regards to truth and uh, reconciliation, it's about costs. Uh, I, I really like where the city is going with this and thank you for your work in, in this matter. Are there federal grants available to municipalities or a federal granting program that is per perhaps in the works that it's on our radar? Uh, it, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, your worship through to Councillor Noyan, not that I am aware of right now. I know AUMA does offer programming um, assistance for training, so we can absolutely look into that program. I am not aware of any federal programs. Jessica may have additional information. Councillors, uh, through your worship to Councillor Noyan, um, to echo Diane's um, sentiments, there are specific grants that exist for uh, specific areas of, of work. So, for example, um, if we were to move forward with um, revisiting the museum story, then we could um, look for, for grants for those specific projects. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Abatoye. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so my first question is regarding the um, agreements we had with Wood IM. Um, did your negotiation skills just get, get really good or did, are we losing something? Through your worship to Councillor Abatoya, the, the 30,000 was um, in partnership when they were replacing their ice plant. Um, so that's why the dollar amount was significantly higher. Um, okay. Now that that's, that programmer is finished, we uh, negotiated a a more reasonable rate for what we receive. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, my other question is regarding pool, the pool, um, and lesson times at the pool. So, I put up a post asking people just you know to send me questions, and I got a number of people um, that said, um, "Can we expand our existing lesson times? It's really hard to get lesson times for my kids, especially for people that work." You know, um, um, really hardly any time after six p.m. and um, weekend. So. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Abatoya, we do have lessons on Saturdays um, for those that can't make the times during the week. Um, the problem is some of the design elements of the pool. Um, we can only offer certain lessons in certain parts of the pool. So even if we had 
we couldn't just increase the number of lessons. There isn't space. So we have to find times that work for everyone and then try to balance that with lane swim, aquafit, swim team, and all of those other users in the facility. We try our very best to balance. So in other words, we need a new pool, eh? That wasn't a question. Just kidding. Councillor Macon. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Diane. Uh, I only had the one question about the town of Bernerheim, so it was answered. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Uh, yes, thank you. When we did the budget a year ago, we set some of our budget to accommodate for anticipated changes due to COVID. It's my recollection. Is that correct? Uh, Your Worship, due to Councillor Kelly, we budgeted at um, about 75% return for COVID. Last year. Last year. And now that we're hopefully seeing the fourth wave end, it looks to me like you're budgeting for a return to COVID because all of these lines are, are reductions in revenue due to COVID over and above the 75% for last year. Uh, through your worship, those adjustments last year were only one time. So the adjustments you're seeing this year are from the base budget before the COVID adjustments. So we're per, we were being conservative. I think the pool we're estimating at 85% re return, um, but at the Dow Centennial Center, we're estimating a 65% return over the year. Hopefully that's being very conservative and we see higher returns than that. And thank you for that. That helps a little bit, that comment. Um, so when I look at the 21 approved budget column, that approved budget column for your entire department does not include the adjustments for COVID that we made in last year's budget. <coughs> Through your worship to Councillor Kelly, I believe it includes some of the ones like the stat holiday reductions and the changes to child minding. Um, I'm not sure on the other question. I'd have to get back to you. Mr. Fleming's on the line. Would you like to comment? Yeah, through your worship, <clears throat> that column does not include adjustments that are considered one time in nature. So it would any adjustments we made that were meant to be permanent are included. And any adjustments that we made last year for COVID on a temporary basis where they get backed out of the budget so that you can see the base again. That's okay for utilities where there was no COVID effect, but for rec where there was large COVID effect, it makes it hard to understand this, um, Troy. Let me let me ponder this for a minute or two. Thank you. Come back to me, please. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm next in speaking order. So, um, my question was with regards to page 10 3. Once again, the 2021 approved budget um, versus the proposed budget. So, it's $613,000 more. Um, so, there's $247,000 more for fitness. Um, wellness is $60,000 more. Aquatic spontaneous use is $41,000 more. And aquatics program is, I think that's a six, $64,000 more. So you've got some fairly big numbers in child minding at 53. So when you add those up and you're at 600,000. So can you just speak to the difference? Uh, through your worship, uh, child minding is easy one. Um, it's actually been backed out of another programming area. That's why you see the 53,000. Um, it just got moved. So yeah, that's why you don't see anything in the 2021 and then you see it in 2022. And most of the others, it's a revenue reduction. Um, you'll see it most impacted in the fitness center um, under the Dow Centennial in Min budget. That's where your admissions are and we are predicting lower admissions. Um, quite significantly at the DCC. Um, so you see it most in the fitness center, but you'll also see it in other areas throughout as we recover that those revenue reductions. There's not any increases in costs. It's all in revenue reduction. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Harris.
I think you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, so, Dan, uh, when was the last time you did a comprehensive review of fitness center users, whether they be runners or whether they be actual users of the the Apple Fitness Center? Um, because uh, I haven't seen anything that would suggest that we've engaged those users appropriately. Uh, so, when was the last time you did that? Through your worship, okay. Councillor Harris, in 2019, um, before I took on the culture and recreation position, um, they did a service level review. So that would be the last time there was significant um, consultation with those groups or even communication with those groups. Um, the most part for the last two years, we've just been dealing with COVID and all of the different restrictions, opening closures. So is it a time, is it a good time to now engage the people that have come back? Mind you, there are substantially less numbers of people using the facility because I'm over there every day. But there is some dissatisfaction with uh, putting the track back in the way that it's been done. So what are we gonna do to engage all of the users to get a balanced uh, response from them relative to what they wanna see by way of utilization, base distancing, things of that nature? I respect the fact that we are putting the track back in, so we're gonna be jammed back in there um, so what, what are you going to do to engage people? Um, through your worship to Councillor Harris, hopefully come December, we may have time to engage with um, the users who have returned. We have seen an increase in the last two weeks. Um, you're going to notice that as soon as the snow falls um, and the weather starts to turn. So hopefully we see those numbers increase. Um, when we look at the region, we're seeing our numbers in line with our vaccination rates. Um, so hopefully as our vaccination rates increase, so do as our return to recreation facilities. Um, and I believe Heather has something to add. Afternoon, through your worship to Councillor Harris. If that is a request that you would like us to consider engaging our users, we can take that away and bring that back. Well, I I'd, I'd would have hoped that we would have done that before we put the track in. Uh, back into say, but everybody that I've talked to, and I've talked to 80 or more people in the last number of weeks, and they really want to say what they want to see there. So if we do that, we sample all of the users to get an input, whether they be runners or whether they be seniors that just walk or they're active users of the fitness center, that would be a very telling thing relative to what we need to do to change. Okay, I think they will take that away as information. And and I'm just prefacing it because I want to see it done properly because I don't think it's been done properly up to this point in time. And that's not a criticism. It's just something I don't believe has been done. So that's my uh, two cents on that whole issue. So good luck. Okay, thank you, Councillor uh, Blizzard. I'm kind of on the same wavelength as Mayor Ketcher. I'm looking at all these numbers and maybe you can explain them a little bit more, but there's a lot of them that are going up quite a bit. And when they go up, it's an ask, right? A bigger amount that's gonna cost us. So looking at, just picking one, um, I think I was looking at the fitness center. Last year, it would have cost us 44, is it thousand dollars? Are we going? Yeah, forty four thousand. And now it's going up to two hundred ninety two. So you're saying that two ninety two is because you're expecting less revenues this coming year, like in twenty twenty two. Does Shannon want to take this one? Yes. So the major bulk of the six hundred and thirteen is actually um, part of their revenue reduction. And um, we have a funding source from the reserves to help fund um, the, re the reduction. And then we have a bunch of expenditures that we've also reduced to help offset. So um, what was unfunded after we did the expenditures was 559,493. Um, so it's basically due to the revenue decreases. And then the remainder would be the two new plan requests. So the partnership with Bruderheim and Truth and Reconciliation. Which aren't a huge part of it, actually, no. when you look at the big number. So if numbers bounce back, we could see a substantial lower amount of that. Correct. Because okay. they'll offset each other. All righty. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. We're going on to round two. Uh, Councillor Noyan, anything further? Yeah, I just have a question about the, <clears throat> the I guess, the usage of our Bruderheim Arena, uh, or the Bruderheim Arena, and maybe you can just bring me up to speed on uh, what this actually looks like in, in terms of like maybe how many community groups, clubs, organizations use it, and 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 how how often? So how 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 many people are are served by this this regional partnership? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Noyan, I could provide a report that outlines all the hours used, but predominantly it's used by minor hockey. Um, all the hours they use at Bruderheim um, count towards their non prom prime time ice usage when it comes to ice allocation and the policy that goes along with that. They use um, Bruderheim on average 20 hours or so a week. Um, so it is it is quite a number and it's usually some of their lower level users that are out there. So that probably is about five nights a week then. Yeah, okay, excellent. Yeah, that gives me some perspective and it's okay with the report. I just wanted to get a, a, a better clarity in my mind and that's all for me. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Councillor Avatoye. Um, thank you. Um, so just back to, I kind of feel like um, just the way um, this um, report is written can be a little confusing if you're not an accountant or you're not a numbers person, because once you see the, um, you compare 20 and 21 and 22 numbers and they're not, they're kind of, you know, they're significantly larger. Um, there's actually stories to, uh, stories to why it's, it's um, different. And I think that's where the significant adjustment notes explains it. Um, but to my question, um, and just back to the fitness center that Councillor Harris was talking about. Um, so um, regarding the, um, those equipment and, and just, you know, um, um, the space in between them, how, how are we seeing um, all the municipalities? Are they, are they like bringing them closer now due to, you know, um, people being vaccinated and all of that? How are we seeing that in, com in comparison to other municipalities? Your Worship, through Councillor Abitoyu, we were incredibly lucky with our facility and being able to close a portion of the track to space the equipment out. In a lot of other fitness centers, um, what they did was just remove pieces of equipment or shut them down. We didn't have to do that. Um, so now we are starting to reduce from three meters to two meters back to more normal spacing and other municipalities are already there um, what they've done is taken away the red tape off the machine so you can use every single one instead of every second one okay so we're definitely not different from others um and you know i actually support doing um um you know going to the users and really i'm asking them about what they want but i also hope that we will um, be making decisions based on what we actually need to do and not just based on what some people say. Um, my second question is concerning um, something that's, that I think has been brought forward is just um, programming for kids with disability. Do we have anything like that? Through your worship to Councillor Abitoy, we do at a, a variety of different facilities. Um, for example, sport ball at the DCC, you're able to bring in an aid with you um, at no additional cost to participate in those programs. We have adaptive swim programs at um, the pool as well. Um, we are also looking at some um, yoga programming for those who have suffered trauma and things like that. So we're always looking to add different programs. Um, we work with Robin Hood Association as well on some of their needs. Um, all people have to do is reach out to us and we can try to make programming work for them. Okay. Um, so they just need to reach out and we can make it work. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Diane. Councillor Macon, you're next. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment about um, Councillor Harris's request for engagement. And Ms. Cowie said, you know, they were going to take that away. And Councillor Vitoy made a comment that she uh, supported that. But I just wanted to. Make, I was just wondering, like, what is it that they're taking away? It isn't the direction of council. So what, like in that situation, like what were you, what would actually be expected to bring back when it's not the direction of council? Or would you be looking more for Councillor Harris to make a formal request that we vote on? So I'll go to Mr. Fleming on that one. Yeah, and <clears throat> through your worship, I, I agree with the point that you're making. I think if we're gonna go out and do some engagement, what I what I said, what I take 
from what we said when we said we would take it away is that we will go and ponder this and, and return to council, but I, we're not gonna take it away and do some engagement because I think the key question here is, what are we, what are we trying to achieve with the engagement? Um, the equipment is going back. Um, as Ms. Yan said, it's gonna, you know, we're more or less gonna go back to a sort of a similar service level from other municipalities in terms of the spacing. Um, so if we're gonna go out and do some engagement, where is, what is that leading to? And um, I'd say that's it's probably something we're going to need to discuss even through the the capital budget more than the operating budget because we have limited space there and and um, we're we're already making the best use that we can with it. So um, I it, it wasn't we will take it away and do some engagement. It's let us take it away and think about it and we'll come back and discuss it more. Okay, that's fair. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kelly. I really struggle with this section on the report. Um, Mayor Catcher and uh, Councillor Blizzard have asked the same question using different words, trying to understand a six hundred thousand dollar budgetary increase or cost increase is extremely difficult, particularly when we don't have the numbers for what I'm going to call the true budget. For last year, I don't have actuals for this year. I don't have the true budget or the refined budget numbers for last year. Um, so, and that was the basis for my question because I honestly thought we had to have something missing. And in fact, we do. We don't know what the one time adjustments were last year. And we're making more one time adjustments this year. We've had experience with COVID. We think we're coming out of it, and we see an extra six hundred thousand dollar hit coming our way. And 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 I'm struggling really hard with that. The explanation I don't understand, and I think it's in part the presentation, not the work of the department, but in the presentation that we have in front of us. Uh, Can would, we ask Mr. Fleming if he's got, he came back on, if he's got a comment on that? Well, you took the words out of my mouth, thank you. By a three worship, I, I don't think it would be a problem to provide counsel with the, um, with the budget from last year that includes the one time adjustments. Um, I, and I, what I think you will see is a pretty similar budget to last year, other than I think we were actually more conservative last year and and just slightly less conservative this year. That's what I believe you will see. So in essence, if you take out truth and reconciliation in the Bruderheim agreement, you will see pretty similar numbers to last year, other than we're projecting slightly increased revenues. Um, the issue, so with 2021, this budget year, we didn't actually need any of that contribution from the reserve to make the budget. Um, but a, a large part of that was, was aided by the fact that we had rec recreation facilities closed for an extended period of time earlier this year and the closure of the facilities and, and not having staff on. Um, it actually saves a lot of money. You lose all the revenue, but you lose even more in in expenses. Uh, the the issue we had with 20, well, for starters, we had to put this budget together earlier on this year, and you don't know what the next year is going to look like. But I think 2022, we expect to be different than 2021 in that I would assume, and I, I, my, you know, we can't predict the future, but it looks like 2022, all the rec facilities will stay open and we're gonna run at what I would describe close to normal service levels. But we are still seeing some program areas that are um, below our regular use. So I think in the long run, we're gonna have to determine, you know, whether or not to make those revenue adjustments or service level adjustments on a more permanent basis. But for 2022, we're saying there may need to be a contribution from the reserve just to offset the fact that people haven't completely returned back to their pre COVID um, recreation activities yet. Um, I would hope that we don't have to actually the $600,000 from the reserve. That's 1 time in nature. I hope we don't have to use any of it. or very little of it, but when we put the gut, the budget together, we have to do our best job of trying to predict. You know, what's what's next year going to look like? So we can't always play with the conservatism we had here and and bring that number down. But it's just a question of of um, 
increasing sort of your risk of, of not making your budget. So I hope that makes sense and I didn't ramble too long there. Um, thank you for that. Where does it say as I scroll and it's probably here somewhere. Um, that the 600,000 is coming from reserve. If you look on, it's not specifically in culture and recreate, sorry, recreation. If you look back in the budget and brief on page, tell you what, three dash nine, three dash nine. Wasting time, gives we're that wasting information. time here. I'd like to flag this. Um, I'd like to see the, the actual numbers that we used for budget 21 set beside these. And if that's possible to have for the next budget meeting day, could we have that? Uh, to your worship, we can definitely do that. And then also, um, as Ms. Andruco said, the numbers themselves are on uh, 3-9 in the budget and brief. So, but we can, not those numbers, but the um, where it refers to the one-time contribution that's on page 3-9 but we can provide the 2021 approved budget with the in, with the adjustments included we can we can provide that thank you and i've got another question or two please come back to me Okay, thank you. I'm next on the uh, speaking order. Um, so this uh, partnership agreement with uh, Bruderheim. So the question that I have with that is uh, last time our users indicated that they weren't getting much priority as far as choosing their, their or getting their times. Is there a certain number of uh, uh, priority users that Bruderheim gets to use first? Because you said local. So is it just Bruderheim or is it Bruderheim and region? Because yeah. if we're paying, okay. Through your worship, it depends on the sport um, and how each different sport has a region or group. So I believe for figure skating, um, it would include Bruderheim and Lamont um, because they only have one club for the region. Minor hockey would be different. It's likely only Bruderheim. I could get those details from Bruderheim on what exactly their, their users are that are considered local. Okay, I think that's very important because when our people are having to drive out there. So I, I guess this second question, I'll come back on a third one after. Um, is there no opportunity to do any partnership with um, with Strathcona County for Josephburg, or are they fully booked? Through your worship, um, we haven't looked at the opportunity with Josephburg. Um, right now, our ice surfaces have opportunities for people to book. Um, they're just not the optimal times that people want. So people could, we have lots of ice available at six in the morning, um, but our ice users are not using it. They want the best times, and that's why they're looking at Bruderheim. Um, there is ice time available here. Okay, but to that second question, is there a possibility to investigate with Strathcona for Josephburg because it is closer? Uh, through your worship, there would be. We would just have to start those conversations in the new year. Okay, now we'll have a round three as well. Uh, Councillor Harris, anything further? Nothing further. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blizzard? Uh, yeah, one, just the tourism, advertising, education, and visitor information. So we've stopped producing the tourism guide. Um, is that because people are just aren't picking it up or was it more didn't want to bother with it? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Blizzard, there's a couple of things on that one. Print during COVID has become not as essential. People are finding other ways in which to access the information they need. Um, and the second part is we weren't seeing the same ad revenue that we were in the past. So we eliminated the guide, which eliminated the tourism revenue, but also the expense of producing the guide. Okay, but we're we're actually losing money because there was quite a few ads. Um, what's the success on that? Do we look at that at all? The advertising education visitor information? How do we monitor what we feel is a success on it? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Blizzard, um, predominantly we keep record of all of the inquiries at the Fort Heritage Precinct because that's where most people go initially for their information. 
Um, and that one is where we have staff available to help. Um, so they keep record of all of the questions that come in and what and who's coming in to ask those questions. The information at the Dow Centennial Center is more self-serve. Um, it's there for you to browse as you see or need. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Noyan. Do you have anything further? Yeah, just a general question. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I just want to know that like the structure of our user or user fee uh, table that it's I think it's an appendix, right? Uh, are we basing our fees on a model from other municipalities? Are we trying to be competitive with them? I guess my question is how how do we come up with these numbers? Do we think we're doing well in this department? Do we, do we think we can maybe offer some services at a lower cost or should we char be charging more for some? Or where where in general do, do we sit in terms of Port Saskatchewan services and their cost to our our community? Through your worship to Councillor Noyan, we try to be, um, we compare with all of our regional comparators. So your St. Albert's, your Sherwood Parks, um, your Spruce Groves, Leduc's, we compare with all of those to make sure we are in line. Um, whether it's the theaters or it's ice, we try to be in line with our comparators. Okay. There is Thank some you. adjustments that could be done in ice. Um, I think we are probably a little low in that area. Okay, we could increase our ice, uh, the, the cost for rental, renting ice, what are you saying? Okay, interesting. Correct. <clears throat> thank okay. You. okay, thank you. Councillor Abatoy, anything further? Um, yes, so I think I'm, I must have mis been misunderstood when I spoke initially. So I do support us engaging with our users, generally speaking, not engaging for a specific agenda. I do not support that. Um, but I do support us engaging with our users, um, just generally speaking. So I just wanted to correct that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Macon, anything further? Thank you, Councillor Kelly. You might be on mute. You are right, I was, sorry. Uh, child minding that $53,000 is now set out as its own service. And I appreciate that. I believe it should be. Um, can you describe the service level that you anticipate to get with a $55,000 expense for next year? Your worship through Councillor Kelly, that was one of the adjustments we made in 2021. So we reduced the hours of child minding. Um, basically, it'll be from eight to one Monday through Friday one evening per week, which would be Wednesday evening um, for a couple of hours, and then on Saturday as well. Um, we would not offer child minding on Sundays. What's our cost recovery for child minding? It would seem to me that shared child minding should be relatively inexpensive for a very good cost recovery on our side. Through your worship, Councillor Kelly, I would have to pull up those numbers from last year's um, presentation. Um, I'm going to flag this in, or wish to ask to flag this anyway. So we can ask that question when we come back, if you don't mind. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, I've only got one last question. So on your uh, truth and reconciliation, that you have with your new initiative. Is the traditional knowledge gathering, is that where you're going to be meeting with the elders and then asking them the questions about what we're doing? Or is this still just staff doing something? Because we've made a commitment, but I'm not seeing that here. Through your worship, that's exactly what the traditional knowledge gathering is, is when you meet with, um, elders or you meet with members of the community, there's usually um, a fee that goes along with that, um, whether it's tobacco or it's um, different sweet grasses or it's an actual honorarium. Um, that's where those dollars are spent is, is when you meet with those um, essential people that we collaborate with. Okay. And then going on with that for my second question. So I am assuming you're going to meet with them fairly soon and that you will have a uh, budget request for what we discussed prior to the election 
her artwork or for something to to acknowledge them? Through your worship, that's correct. And we have been meeting with them, um, but we've been meeting with them to develop a relationship first before asking those questions. Um, once you get that relationship um, in a good place, that's when you start to look into what programs, what projects do they want to see in the community? Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Harris, do you have anything further? Nothing. Okay, Councillor Blizzard, anything further? No. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Councillor Kelly has requested a flag to bring information back uh, on the child minding and to have a more detailed uh, report of the budget increases. Make sure I'm capturing that right so that no. So no, I, I mean, more detail, of course, Mayor Catcher, but really what I'm driving for is the 21 budget as implemented. In other words, put back the one time adjustment so that we can compare apples to apples on, on this particular department. Okay, and Mr. Fleming, is that possible? Uh, yeah, Your Worship, we can do that. Um, we can pull from the 2021 budget document and uh, and provide that fairly, fairly easily. Okay, I just need to make sure when we're flagging something, they know what, what the information is when it's coming back. Uh, are there any uh, opposition to, uh, to flagging those? Not seeing any? Okay, thank you. So those are two specific just requests. Okay. Just your worship. So, to, to Councillor Kelly, or is your intent that both of those are flags, or is the one an information request, and the other one's a flag? I think that they're coming back as a, as a flag so that he can make comments on them. And I, I, my take on it, for what it's worth, is that if we get the comparable budget data. We can have this discussion one more time as necessary, which would also include the child minding, which we're, which I'm also expecting some more information on. Okay, so that that we'll take them as flags then. That that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Miss Shantz, and uh, congratulations on your um, being able to move up somewhere else. Thank you. <laughs> City of Fort Saskatchewan will miss you. Um, so we will end with that one and move on to protective services and have Corrine Rayner presenting, please. Good afternoon, Your Worship and members of council. My name is Corrine Rayner and I'm the Director of Protective Services for the city. Supporting me this afternoon, I have Inspector Mike McCauley, the Detachment Commander for the Fort Saskatchewan RCMP and Sergeant Lee Hardman, the supervisor for municipal enforcement to help me to answer any of the questions you may have. You can find protective services budget information in section 11 of your binder. Protective services is responsible for the carriage and administration of law enforcement related services for the city. The city contracts the RCMP to provide policing services in our community and Municipal Enforcement Services has community peace officers who balance education, engagement, and enforcement to achieve the city's desired outcomes for a safe and thriving community. These officers are supported by a highly skilled administrative team of police clerks and our Protective Services Analyst. Protective Services has 12 programs that we deliver. You can find these on page 11.3 of your binder. A few examples of our major programs are general duty response to calls, the traffic and crime reduction unit, municipal enforcement and animal control, commercial vehicle enforcement, and automated traffic enforcement are some of our major programs. Some of our 2022 budget initiatives and areas of focus are the RCMP have five annual police priorities that it will focus on throughout 2022, and these priorities are traffic safety, crime prevention and reduction in persons crimes, crime prevention and reduction in property crime, youth and community engagement and employee wellness. Vision Zero is also an area of focus for our 2022 budget requests. Our goal is to reduce the frequency and severity of fatal and serious injury collisions within the city. 
We have five specific programs that support this goal, and they are conventional traffic enforcement, automated traffic enforcement, commercial vehicle enforcement program, and the traffic and crime reduction unit. The second goal is to provide high quality administrative support for municipal enforcement and RCMP officers. Our team of police clerks support all of the programs that Protective Services delivers and is the backbone of our department's success in each of these programs. Another department focus is to increase the capacity within municipal enforcement services to maintain their response times to calls for service um, from the community and to provide a better level of proactive bylaw work. We also have changes coming in 2022 for the new dangerous goods bylaw coming into effect along with the new speed limit changes and an increased focus when it comes to the desire to have more commercial vehicle enforcement in the city. In the past year, council requested two reports that have steered the direction of our budget for 2022. The first report was presented to council in June of this year and was for a municipal enforcement service level review to look at the successes and challenges within that department. This review allowed us to look at all aspects of municipal enforcement services and our capacity to deliver all of our service level with our current staffing resources. Municipal enforcement is experiencing increasing calls for service and higher community expectations. We, we are challenged to maintain our current service levels of our growing community and the growing industry around Fort Saskatchewan. The second uh, report requested by council was for an overview of our commercial vehicle enforcement program and the province's dangerous goods program. We were to look, we were to look at how to train and effectively deliver this program to ensure a safe and uniform approach to handling the transportation of dangerous goods in our community. The commercial vehicle in dangerous good report was pre presented to council in March of 2021. This report brought forward a recommendation on how we can enhance this service level. Um, if there is a desire to see an increase in CVSA level one mechanical inspections. Another area of focus for protective services will be to modernize the automated traffic enforcement program. A need to contract out this program was recognized a result, as a result of our municipal enforcement service level review. We've also recognized a gap in our administrative support team that focus on the RCMP programs. I will be presenting four budget requests for Council's consideration for 2022. Our first request is 21-0039 on page 11-5 of your binder. This request is for a police clerk for exhibits and fleet management for an ongoing cost of 86,186 for staff wages. It is spread over two years with 68,000 in 2022, of which 3,000 is one-time funded from the financial stabilization and contingency reserve and 18,186 in 2023. This request supports three programs, general duty response to calls, general investigations, and the traffic and crime reduction unit. These programs score in the second and third quartile as they align with a safe and welcoming community with traffic safety and vision zero and providing effective policing in Fort Saskatchewan. These programs score high in demand and mandated services. Protective services will add one FTE for a police clerk to coordinate exhibits and RCMP fleet management. The reason why this position was deemed necessary is that the increase in volume of exhibits seized for court and the growth of the RCMP fleet has become too much for the current police clerks to manage along with their other critical responsibilities. Exhibit management and the continuity of seized items is a specialized duty that's assigned to police clerks and involves the processing, handling, movement, destruction, and disposal of all seized exhibits. With over 12,000 calls for service per year, we are currently managing 2,500 seized exhibits. The improper handling of these exhibits can result in court cases and evidence being jeopardized 
and there is a need for a dedicated resource to perform this function. The RCMP fleet has grown to 16 police vehicles to meet the demands in the community. There are many complex computer systems, radio equipment, and general vehicle maintenance that require specialized care and repairs to ensure these vehicles are operational and reliable for our officers to perform their duties of public safety in the community. Currently exhibits and fleet management duties are performed by two full-time police clerks in conjunction with their other primary duties of information manager and the CPIC specialist. CPIC is the Canadian Police Information Centre. These two positions are critical to managing risk and information on our police database systems. It is no longer sustainable to have these two clerks perform the duties of exhibits and fleet management due to the volume, the demand, and complex court requirements. Through the city's police, uh, municipal police service agreement with the RCMP, the city provides administrative support for the RCMP. This request will keep policing costs lower by utilizing a police clerk to conduct this work as opposed to a higher paid RCMP officer completing these tasks. The second request is 26-0014. It is for the enhancing um, of the commercial vehicle enforcement program for a total of 130,711 spread over two years with 97,614 in 2022, of which 6,000 is a one-time funded from the financial stabilization and contingency reserve. And then we have 33,097 um, coming in in 2023. There is revenue associated to this uh, position as well. And we will, once we have the position um, fully running for a year, we can come back with revived revenue projections for this position. This request is found on page 11.9 of your binder. The commercial vehicle enforcement uh, request supports three department programs, commercial vehicle enforcement, conventional traffic enforcement, both scoring in the third quartile and municipal enforcement that scores in the second quartile. These programs align with our goal of a safe community and our traffic safety and vision zero initiatives. The program scores high in demand and mandated services. Traffic safety is a priority in our community. With the adoption of Vision Zero in 2018 and a commercial vehicle enforcement program in 2019, um, we have our safe systems approach to looking at traffic safety, focusing on education, engineering, and enforcement. We have been able to reduce collisions by 47% in the last five years. This request will add one FTE to municipal enforcement for a community peace officer with a dual focus on regular traffic enforcement and commercial vehicle enforcement. The reason this request is coming forward is a, is a result of our report to Council um, on how best to train and deliver commercial vehicle enforcement. This request would be an enhancement to our program to have more CVSA level one inspections conducted in our community. These inspections are important for Fort Saskatchewan as our location in the industrial heart, heartland with many industrial and chemical plants as our close neighbors and thousands of commercial vehicle and dangerous goods carriers traveling through the city on an, any given day. Our danger, a dangerous goods incident has been deemed one of our highest risks to emergency management in our community and adding this position will greatly assist the city in achieving its traffic safety goals. With our partnership with Alberta Transportation and the Alberta Sheriff's Branch for Commercial Vehicle Enforcement, we have determined that much of this work falls to the municipality to complete. Commercial Vehicle Enforcement is one of the service levels within municipal enforcement. If Council desires to enhance this service level, Adding a dedicated traffic and commercial vehicle enforcement officer will improve the ability to focus on dangerous goods and commercial vehicle safety. This position will increase capacity to focus strictly on commercial vehicle uh, safety alliance level one inspections. 
These involve extensive mechanical cargo and dangerous goods um, safety compliance checks. And one example of why these types of inspections are important is that so far in 2021, municipal enforcement has conducted 51 CVSA level one inspections. 27 inspections out of 51 did not meet the standards of the commercial vehicle safety regulations. So this is a 53% non-compliance rate for commercial vehicle regulations and safety issues. The most common safety violation is with the brake system. So this is a concern in our community. This new position will also focus on compliance of our new dangerous goods bylaw, which will be coming back to council in the new year. It will increase heavy load compliance that will help protect our road infrastructure. And with the changes to our speed limits that are coming into effect in the spring of 2022, this position greatly increases the education, monitoring and enforcement of the new speed limits set by council. The CBSA level one inspections require highly specialized training and skills and can take anywhere from 20 minutes to three hours to complete. Completing these intensive inspections take away from our ability to keep up with the current demand of responding to calls from the community, proactive patrolling, animal control, and other service levels that the municipal Enf enforcement officers provide. Having one dedicated officer with these skills, training, and certifications to focus on traffic safety and commercial vehicle compliance will greatly improve the daily focus um, on commercial vehicle enforcement in the community. Next slide. Request number 26-0015 is to add casual and relief community peace officers budget to our municipal enforcement services program at a cost of 54,766 for the ongoing wages and benefits. This request is found on page 1113. This initiative supports the municipal enforcement program and animal control, which scores in quartile two. These programs align with the strategic goals of a safe and welcoming community and score high in demand and recovery costs. The other two programs this initiative support are conventional traffic enforcement and the commercial vehicle enforcement program, scoring in the third quartile. This score is high in demand and mandate and the city, with the city's bylaws and other provincial legislation. One of the main objectives of our municipal enforcement service level review was to evaluate our organizational structure um, within municipal enforcement and to ensure that we're properly staffed to provide all of the service levels um, and also that staff retention is a priority. One of the gaps that we discovered during this review was that our current staffing level of seven um, frontline community peace officers covering seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m results in three or four officers working per day. Maintaining our service levels can be a challenge when officers are away on leave, when there are sick time or officers are on training. This could leave um, some gaps within service level disruptions. Um, in order to ensure that there are no disruptions to our service levels, we just need to have some casual staff that we can call upon that can cover off some of those, the, the leave that we spoke about earlier in, in the budget presentation, but it's more to just make sure that we are not um, having service level disruptions as opposed to just covering off vacations and that kind of thing. The approval of this request will help municipal enforcement mitigate um, these types of gaps in our staffing and keep up with the demands within the community for, for municipal enforcement. And our final budget request is 26-0016. This could be found on page 1117 of your binder. This one is for the modernization of the automated traffic enforcement program. This request will have a net positive financial impact of $300,000 and is going to be used to fully contract out automated traffic enforcement program to a vendor. An additional $400,000 is needed for the new contract. The current transfer to reserve of $164,400 for the capital investment 
for these ca for cameras will be reallocated to the operating budget. A revenue increase of $700,000 is expected for the efficiencies created in the program by the end of 2022. This results in our net positive financial impact of 300,000. This request supports the automated traffic enforcement program and is in the third quartile. This program aligns with the goal of a safe community and scores high in cost recovery, demand and mandate. Our automated traffic enforcement program is made up of intersection safety device cameras that monitor and detect speed on green and red light violations. We have nine cameras at six major intersections within the city. And we also use mobile photo enforcement conducted by the municipal enforcement peace officers to detect speed at various locations. Automated traffic enforcement is used to reinforce conventional enforcement in areas where the nature of traffic, roadway, design and history of collisions warrants the use of technology to ensure compliance with our traffic laws. The RCMP provide program direct direction for the automated traffic enforcement program and we do align um, our program adheres with the automated pro provinces automated traffic enforcement guidelines. In June, on June 22nd, um, our municipal enforcement service level was presented to council as part of our review, a detailed analysis of the city's automated traffic enforcement program was conducted. We have identified challenges and opportunities to create efficiency within the automated traffic enforcement program and will and to also improve municipal enforcement's ability to keep up with the, de the competing demands of its service levels. The current program is delivered with a supporting contract with a vendor and all the operations, testing, ticket approving, responsibilities fall to municipal enforcement. Mobile photo enforcement is conducted in-house by the municipal enforcement officers. The city owns the capital equipment for intersection safety device cameras and takes on the risk of the changing technology, equipment malfunction and repairs, and all installation costs are assumed by the municipality. The automated traffic enforcement landscape has been changing with new legislation, reporting requirements, and technologies. With our current model of how we deliver this program, municipal enforcement is responsible for addressing all of these changes and reporting requirements to the province and to our court systems. It is important to note that we are the only municipality of our comparators that owns the capital equipment um, of intersection safety device cameras and has community peace officers conducting mobile photo enforcement in-house. There are two major reasons our request to contract out automated traffic enforcement is coming forward. First is our current technology is out of date and failing. The first ISD camera was installed in 2008 and is 13 years old. Updating these cameras is imperative and will raise the photo quality and protect the integrity of our automated traffic enforcement program. With a fully contracted service, the vendor will own all of the intersection safety device cameras and be responsible for the technology, any malfunctions and repairs and install installation costs will all be assumed uh, by the vendor. The second reason to fully contract out this program is that utilizing our municipal enforcement community peace officers to conduct mobile photo enforcement is no longer efficient or sustainable for municipal enforcement. Through our service level review requested by council, gaps in our staffing resources and capacity to deliver all programs were identified. Municipal enforcement officers have struggled to keep up with the competing demands of their service level. Mobile photo enforcement hours of operation have suffered in order to keep up with calls for service and other requests within the community. When municipal enforcement service services experiences a higher call volume and requests for assistance from the RCMP and other city departments, mobile photo enforcement hours drop off in order to keep up with the demand. With the contractor conducting mobile photo enforcement, they will not have these competing demands and can concentrate solely on mobile photo enforcement in the community. 
Once this request is approved, the automated traffic enforcement program will go out to an RFP outlining the city's parameters for the delivery of our program. We hope to award the contract in early Q1 of 2022. This will have the award of vendor changing all of the intersection safety device cameras with their own newer technology. The benefit of this is that the vendor takes on the capital investment of the cameras and the risk associated to the changing technologies and malfunctions of equipment. The vendor has the expertise of the technology, software, and data configurations to ensure the program is run efficiently and to the province's requirements. Another benefit to contracting out to the vendor is that anytime the province changes its guidelines for automated traffic enforcement, the vendor is responsible for adapting and incurring the costs associated to these changes. The vendor will take on conducting mobile photo enforcement at our approved sites, utilizing their own staff, equipment, and enforcement vehicle. It is important for council to know that the city remains in control of how our program is delivered when it is contracted out. The city and the RCMP set all parameters for the program. We choose the sites and the number of hours mobile photo enforcement is conducted. This new contract will realize $2.8 million in capital savings for the replacement of the city's intersection safety device cameras. The benefits of moving to the fully contracted program are that it will create improvements to our current technology and lower the city's capital investment in taking on the risks of these changing technologies. The vendor conducts the hiring, training, and monthly testing of all equipment. And the vendor also has the knowledge and expertise in the delivery of automated traffic enforcement. And they have the extensive resources needed to keep up with the changes that occur within the automated traffic enforcement landscape. This new contract will increase capacity within municipal enforcement to maintain its service levels within the community and to bring us into alignment with what other municipalities um, do to offer automated traffic enforcement and enforcement services. And that concludes my budget presentation and I'm happy to take any of your questions. Okay, thank you. And that was a very thorough presentation. Um, start of the questions, uh, Councillor Abatoye. Thank you for your presentation, Corinne. Um, and I would agree, like 80, 60 to 70% of um, complaints I hear usually by laws, by law related. So 100% agree with that comment. Um, and, you know, um, I think all day we've heard of, you know, moving funds from contracted services to staff. So I'm saying the opposite. So this actually excites me because this makes sense to me. Um, so, but just my question. Um, so in terms of um, what, where we were before, um, where, we, where we are right now in terms of revenue and versus cost and where we're going to be going to once this is contracted, we're still going to be able to make some revenue there. Is that what you said? That's correct. Okay, so that would be like that would be like the two, two like about three hundred thousand. Your worship, through to Councillor Abatoy, we're going to be realizing about seven hundred thousand dollars in increased revenue with this new contract. Perfect. Thank you. Um, my other question is regarding um, vacancies. I know you had done a presentation to Council um, last um, earlier this year um, regarding vacancies um, within the municipal enforcement. Can you speak on speak to that? Your worship through to Council Abatoya. So we currently do not have any vacancies within municipal enforcement services. Um, in the past, we have struggled and been challenged with staff turnover and some vacancies, some long term sick leaves, that type of a thing. But currently we are fully staffed within our unit. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Macon. Thank you for your presentation, Karine. Um, a few questions. Um, just trying to remember. So this commercial vehicle position in my head, I thought that we had approved a dedicated commercial vehicle position last year that was offset offset by fines. But was that just part of the commercial vehicle presentation that we had? Your worship through to Councillor Macon. 
Um, an, a position was not a, a given for commercial vehicle enforcement. We did have a presentation and a budget request, I believe in 2019, for uh, to add $20,000 for, for the implementation of commercial vehicle enforcement for training. Um, our last uh, co community peace officer was added in 2020. It did coincide with commercial vehicle enforcement programs starting, but it wasn't dedicated to commercial vehicle enforcement. Okay. Um, my next question was back in like 2017 during the election, um, we were given a statistic that said 98% of our automated enforcement was um, fined to non-residents. And I was just can I was just wondering if you had any current statistics of um, how many resident versus non-resident uh, automated traffic enforcement fines that we hand out. Is that something you could get? Your worship through to Councillor Macon, we can provide that to you. We do have that statistic and that's something that I can provide to you. Okay, thank you. Hey, I'll come thank back. you. Yeah, we'll do a round two. Councillor Kelly. Uh, easy questions first, Karine. Uh, the budget accommodates completely the new contract pricing or costs for the RCMP personnel. Your worship through to Councillor Kelly, that's correct. It's, it does show the budget increases due to the RCMP contract within it's separated out under each of our programs. And in terms of a total increased cost due to the um, contract, are you able to share that with council? Your worship through to Councillor Kelly, I'm happy to share that number with you. We've increased our uh, contract cost by $320,000 for ongoing costs. 320,000 per annum. Okay. Um, I'll be completely honest. I'm really struggling with your proposal to contract out what I consider to be enforcement operations. Um, I'm going to wait until I hear comments from my fellow councillors on this. But I just want to put in everybody's mind the increased revenue you're talking about is $700,000 in tickets. That's what the increased revenue is. It's not being found, it's increased tickets. And that doesn't sit well with me. So I'll wait and see what everybody else has to say for the time being. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got, uh, yeah, I've got about three questions, but I only do two right now. The first one I'm going to actually address to Mr. Fleming, because it's more of a phil philosophical one. For the uh, commercial vehicle enforcement program, um, I'm questioning the funding source because you've got property tax revenue and fine revenue. I thought our philosophy was that we wanted to wean ourselves off uh, fine revenue and that it would be uh, paid for so that we, if the fines go down, then we're not hit with an increase in the future. So um, has something changed? Uh, no, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, to your, to your worship. Um, at, the, at the moment, I mean, when fine revenue comes in, it has to go somewhere. Um, with the case of, um, cause, and I agree with you on things like photo radar and that, in the case of commercial vehicle enforcement, I think the intent there is to run a program that will just pay for itself, more or less. If it ends up bringing in more revenue than it costs, then uh, we could have that conversation. But um, this is another example where we were very conservative. Um, we believe that the officer will at least pay for their pay for the costs of the program, but we didn't budget that way in the first year because uh, by the time we get the person hired and get them going, we could be well into the middle or later part of the year. Um, so this is put in pretty conservatively, but I think once we get going, um, you would see that revenue go into the protective services budget in with the idea that it offsets the cost of the program. And this is just essentially making this about safety and not about uh, revenue. 
but that's the question that I'm having philosophically. If we're doing, if we're doing that, why do we just not budget the full amount for the, for the uh, position? And then whatever the revenues are, that becomes surplus that will actually go to a program or something else so that we aren't depending on it. Yeah, that, I think as long as the revenue is tied to the program itself, if if the revenue dried up, then there would be no need to have the cost. Um, so in this case, I think it's I think it's okay to take the revenue and have it offset the cost of the program. If we want to fully budget for the officer and put the revenue somewhere else, we can do that. But then it's a hit on property taxes because the taxpayers have to pay for the officer and then the revenue would go into a reserve or something like that. So um, I think with with this particular program, because it's sort of projected to be somewhere around cost recovery, um, the decision is for the revenue just to go back into the budget. I may have another comment on that later. Uh, Councillor Harris. Um, the city made the decision a number of years ago to obviously get into automated enforcement. Um, mobile stuff, which I don't see much anymore, and then the uh, stuff at the intersections. Um, and now you're proposing to do something entirely different. On the face of it, it looks like it might make sense. But what changed? Uh, because the city made the decision to do it, to invest in it, and uh, we knew full well at that time that there were pros and cons. So what changed? Your worship through to Councillor Harris. Uh, thank you for your question. And essentially we got into automated traffic enforcement 19 years ago. So the landscape um, within automated traffic enforcement programs and how they're delivered has changed in that time. Legislation has changed in that time as well. There was a review that was completed in 2018 of the province's automated traffic enforcement programs. So a lot has changed um, in that regard. For the city itself, um, we started first of all doing mobile photo enforcement in 2003. We added intersection safety device cameras in 2008. And with the city's growth and um, capacity within municipal enforcement, we've added in several different service levels to municipal enforcement um, along the way as well throughout the years. So, so those types of things have, have changed our program. We've, by, by us purchasing the, the equipment um, to do that, um, at the time made sense and was a good idea to help us keep our operating costs, our yearly operating costs lower by having an in-house program. So that is why cameras were purchased and we had our officers completing that task um, in-house. Many other municipalities have decided that this is one, one of our service levels or one law enforcement service level that can be contracted out. Um, the city remains in control of, of the program and we appoint the vendor staff member that they have conducting mobile photo enforcement as a peace officer with the city. So we are in control of that appointment. If the city chooses to pull their appointment for whatever reason, then we are in control of that. Um, yeah, it's a long winded answer, but I hope that that helps clarify. So, um, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate the change in landscape. I was just curious what had changed, and it's nice to look back, as you say, 19 years ago to now, and I realize things have changed. Um, the companies wouldn't be in the business unless they could make money. What sort of profit margin have they got um, from this? Because ultimately, they're not going to go out there and force people to speed. They'll just take advantage, as Councillor Kelly said, it's a ticket and it's ticket revenue and it's 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 a thing. So what, what's their profit margin uh, in this uh, as a private sector organization doing a contract for us? And can you say what that is? Your worship through to Councillor Harris, I can't really sp speak to their profit margins, but for us, we we contracted out based on a per violation rate is how how our fee structure would would look at look like. Um, so it's per violation with the vendor taking on the capital investment and having their um, 
their staff performing that function, it will increase our per violation rate that we pay. We pay or we receive? So your worship through to Councillor Harris, we pay a fee to our vendor currently for the uh, per violation that is issued and that's mailed out to violators of the traffic laws. <laughs> so we keep a margin from doing what we do. We do, yes. Okay, thanks. No, that that's fine. I was just curious what changed and you've answered that question. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Blizzard. Um, so with our uh, enforcement, and I know it's a safety thing because ideally we wouldn't want, well, we do want money, but we don't want any money if nobody sped through different things, that would be ideal. Um, but they do, but do we ever compare? I noticed that there's two communities, Sturgeon County and Leduc don't even do any enforcement. Do we ever compare, you know, what does it help? People say we're just doing a money grab. Is it a money grab? Is it a... You know, does it actually help with safety? Your worship through to Councillor Blizzard, that is an excellent question. And there are, there are lots of studies that have been done on the, the, the impact that automated traffic enforcement has on reducing the severity and uh, frequency of collisions in, in, we have evidence of that um, in our data within Port Saskatchewan. Um, revenue is just a byproduct of people that are not uh, following the traffic laws. Um, so, yes, it does. It does have an impact. It's it's one tool that we use in our traffic safety strategies um, to keep keep up with uh, our goal of Vision Zero. Okay. Do you ever look at Leduc, especially? They're very close to our size, and see a difference in their accidents and their. Um, fade fatalities. Your worship through to Councillor Blizzard. I'm not familiar with the collisions or that kind of data. We can we can find that information out. Um, we do compare to all of our comparative communities as well. Um, when we look at the programs that we deliver and the safety issues that are across um, across other municipalities. I see um, Inspector McCulley. Did you have any additional information you wanted to add? Thanks, Green. Uh, your worship through to all the councillors who have brought these questions up. I think Green's doing an excellent job explaining, but I just want to add a little bit <clears throat> from our perspective. The Vision Zero uh, formula, so to speak, or philosophy, as uh, we've talked about at, at, uh, at length, encompasses enforcement, education, <clears throat> and then safe roads as well. So the enforcement part is a large part of that for us is the is the photo uh, enforcement and the automated enforcement. What uh, needs to be clear, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kareem, but I, as we've talked, this is my understanding, is the changes that Kareem is proposing and protective services are proposing is not going to fundamentally change whatsoever the city's philosophy, the city's thresholds on automated enforcement. So I feel like we're getting sucked into thinking that we're going to be writing more tickets, we're going to be changing our philosophy. The philosophy is actually changing, or sorry, is staying the same, uh, but it's going to give the capacity to fulfill the full philosophy and the full hours that have been um, kind of agreed upon in years past. Does that make sense, Green? Yeah, thank you. And then to speak to Leduc and other communities, um, it would be very, very challenging to compare uh, apples to oranges in that way. Because depending on what type of highways they have, depending on what type of uh, roadways and so on. But what I can share is that since I've been here in four years, our collective Vision Zero philosophy and approach have uh, have produced steady decline in collisions, which is the goal. Thank you, and sorry to interrupt. Hey, okay, you're good, Councillor Blizzard. For now, good for now. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Noyan. Thank you. I have a few questions and I'll just start with a couple of simple, simple items in I'm looking at the proposed line item budget and there is service maintenance contracts and, and the approved budget for 2021 was 339.5 and this year uh, the proposed budget is $903,900. Does that encompass uh, 
the modern modernization of, of speed cameras or or what 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 is that six hundred or five five hundred and sixty thousand dollars that's for going to your worship through to councillor not and you're correct that is a four hundred thousand dollar increase to our contracted service for um contracting out automated traffic enforcement okay th that's what i thought so appreciate that clarification and then i i'm curious uh i'll, I'll get into some deeper questions next round uh, animal control in 2021 was $240,000 proposed budget this year, 30,000. This is a significant uh, difference. And I'm just looking at some big, big figure changes kind of is where my two questions here come from. What, what, what is predicted to cost so little this year as compared to what we've seen last year? Your worship through to Councillor Noy. And so what we've done as we work through priority based budgeting, and our allocations that we have for each program. Um, we did some reallocating of our officers time to that program. So that's why you're seeing a decrease. Um, a de a de decrease there. I'm not sure the 30,000 if the budget team can. I think because we have revenue in that um, in that program as well. So that's the overall expense for the for the program. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll go on to round two. Councillor Abatoye. Um, I have no further questions, but I do support the um, contract and automated um, enforcement. Thank you. Councillor Macon. I mean, the $700,000 that you referenced of the increased fine revenue, um, that was to do with the increased quality, correct? With our current system, we um, were losing a lot of the uh, tickets we could be giving because of the quality or incorrect information. Is that right? Your worship through to Councillor Macon, you are correct. So currently right now with the, the st status of our cameras not um, working properly, we are missing opportunities to educate drivers that they are speeding. So. The, the camera is taking a photo of the of the individual speeding through our intersections, but because of the quality of that photo, we are not able to issue that ticket. So we are missing that opportunity to um, issue that violation. So it's not necessarily we're going to be increasing our enforcement, um, but we will be um, improving the, the, the quality of what we are producing. Okay, uh, thank you for that clarification. And then when you talk about um, bringing on a casual or relief municipal enforcement officer, I'm just curious um, what the market is for that. Is there a lot of um, availability for people to come in and work part time or on a casual basis in municipal enforcement? And um, I guess, how does that work from a training perspective if they're not going to be working all the time? Your worship through to Councillor Macon, we currently do have um, two community peace officers that are on um, casual. Uh, so what we find that uh, the people that apply to these jobs currently have full time community peace officer positions in neighboring communities and they're looking to because of their schedule, they have free time to to have another um, casual job. So that's what we find is we do get qualified. Uh, peace officers that typically are already trained to come on staff as casual. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Um, I'm struggling to see the savings argument as as you discussed with Councillor Harris. If the full 700 is because of poorly documented summonses from the existing equipment, spending $2.8 million that'll last about 10 years. So about $280,000 a year for equipment will resolve that. Uh, you're asking for increased staffing for enforcement and yet contracting out all of this part, including including um, the mobile application. So, so there's a significant increase built into your department in terms of staffing level in this particular budget, is that correct? 
your worship through to Councillor Kelly. We do have two full time uh, requests for staffing. Yes. Plus, you're also adding contracted employees to the situation to the to the department as well. Your worship through to Councillor Kelly. We do we we currently do have a contract for automated traffic enforcement, and so we are increasing that contract. And they will utilize their staff to do that enforcement. Well, let's not talk in circles. You're adding contracting out now for the first time, the mobile application. That was my understanding from your report. Do you worship the answer to the question is yes. Thank you. I don't know why we have to talk in circles here. Perhaps I'm not being clear with my questions. And if that's the case, then just please tell me so and I'll ask them again. Um, I would like to see much better budget explaining how much this program costs us now, the way we are delivering it now, including the application or purchase of the new equipment, and then compare that budget to the budget that we would have with a contracted service delivery. Um, and for that reason, I'm going to request that this be flagged. On top of that, you suggest that we're offsetting the risk and and those sorts of things because the contractor is taking that risk now. No, the contractor charges us for taking that risk. There is nothing free in any of this. In fact, this is going to cost us five hundred and sixty-four thousand dollars more per year at this level. Period. Okay, so That's what it costs us. Okay, um, so I know that's a debate, Your Honor, but I'm trying to drive a point here. This needs to be flagged, and it needs to be flagged hard. We need better information to make a decision on it. Sorry, but we do. Now I'm done. Okay, thank you. So I've just made a note of that. I'm just going to go through the last uh, few people on round two, and then I'll see if there's any uh, opposition to that. Um, so I'm next in the speaking order. The only question that I had left is, and it can be rolled out when, uh, if this comes back as a flagged one. D to go to a contract, um, they have to recover their costs for the equipment and for their manpower. So I guess the question that I have is, for these municipalities that are changing to this, what guarantee is there that, you know, as they get so many of us on there, that all of a sudden, once we have all their equipment in place, we don't see huge con uh, contract increases in like three to five years or something? And Mr. Fleming, you may want to answer that, or you may want to just take that and say, well, we'll roll it into the flag. Thank you, Worship. Ms. Rainer can answer the question if she's got one. Um, I was, my camera was on from before, so. Through to your worship, yes. Um, so we typically will enter into a three to a five year contract with the vendors. So then our costs would be guaranteed for the, the period of the contract. And to just provide a little bit of clarity and give an example. So currently um, we have a per ticket cost of $15 per ticket that we pay a vendor for all of the violations that are issued within the city of Fort Saskatchewan. Once we contract it out, the estimations that I have will increase our per ticket violation cost to roughly 33 or $35 per violation. So through our RFP pro, um, process, we will be finalizing the costing structure um, within the automated traffic enforcement program. It can provide more clarity and refine our costing um, after that. But that's just an example of the fee structure for the contract. Okay, fine. And that may come out as part of the uh, flag as well. Some more information. Councillor Harris, anything further? I support the flag because we're not comparing apples to apples in this context. I think there's a lot of sanity here, but it needs more conversation than in this limited context. So I support the flag. Okay, Councillor Blizzard, anything further? No. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan, anything further? I do have two questions. The casual, uh, your proposal for the casual uh, 
peace officer, right? I'm not on that page. Sorry. Uh, th this seems to reflect a, a question that Councillor Abdoyed uh, asked this morning, this morning about. It seems like it's it's more for vacation relief. Um, is is there and can you describe if there is a real a tangible strain on our municipal enforcement officers because we don't have uh, an extra personnel uh, and 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 does that effectively tra translate into a, a tangible lack of service in, in this department? Because just living in the community, I don't I don't see that. I see them doing their job well and often and see them out. Your worship through to Councillor Noyan. Just to give you an, a, an, a, an example of um, we have three or four officers that are working per day and these are frontline municipal enforcement officers. So. Three of them are on shift per day. Um, if one is on vacation or we have a sick leave and we're down to one officer working to cover the entire city in all of their different service levels. And so if we have a high demand for calls for service from the community and we have an animal um, situation that we have to look after and we are assisting the RCMP, it can stretch officers quite thin um, throughout their day if there's only one officer working for the entire day. And the RCM. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Having casual relief staff, we would then be able to have them come in and assist us to maintain the service level. So, say if we're down to one peace officer in Fort Saskatchewan, when the RCMP can't step in, like due to vacation and sick, and if 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 there is, a, I don't know, a, a, a need of you know, three issues that arise at the same time, like isn't kind of, don't you guys work mutually like that? Your worship through to Councillor Noy, and we do have, um, we are integrated within the RCMP, but the service levels are a bit different with the RCMP focusing on criminal investigations and things. They may not always be available to assist our officers. Okay, my second question is it going to be very direct. Uh, what resources are uh, sorry in your in your 5 priorities that you mentioned of, of policing in Fort Saskatchewan? Uh, you mentioned about crime prevention in terms of property crime. Uh, what resources or tools are you missing to be doing this effectively? Your worship through to Councillor Noy. And so your question is what resources are missing? Yeah, I, I, I do believe that there's a hole in this area and I feel like maybe there's something that council can be doing to support community policing and the initiative or in the capacity of crime prevention or property. And I guess what I'm thinking of specifically is vehicle thefts in Fort Saskatchewan to put, yeah, to give that example. Your worship through to Councillor Noy and I will let uh, Inspector McCulley help answer your question. Your worship through to Councillor Noy and can you be clear in your question? Because I'm you're saying, do I need more resources to combat auto theft? Is that yeah, sure, synchronize? yeah, great simplification. Um, no, I well, there's no budget request for the RCMP. We we're adequately resourced at this time. Um, absolutely. If you the more resources I have, the more I can I can try and uh, tackle these issues. But um, the counts previous councils have been more than generous with members, and I'm not seeking any members at this time. I think. Our numbers are actually on the decline uh, for property crime and have been for the last uh, couple of years. So I don't have a request. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you. So uh, I'm just going to look. Is there any? Thank you uh, for that, Inspector McCauley. Um, I'm just going to look to see if there's any opposition to flagging 260016. Not well, seeing. Sure. Further questions, though, please. Okay. Uh, Okay, we can do that. I'm going to just check on the flag so that Mr. Dance can get it into his recap as well. Okay, so I'm not seeing any opposition to that. So we can do a round three. Uh, uh, Councillor Abatoye, do you have anything further? Um, just one quick question, Corinne. Um, so how many municipal officers do we have? And I, I, do we not also have casual um, police officers as well? Your worship through to Councillor Abatoy, we have eight municipal enforcement um, community peace officers. 
One is the supervisor, Sergeant Lee Hardman, and then we have seven other frontline community peace officers. We have um, a casual community peace officer uh, as well, but casual police officers, no, we do not. So we have, can you repeat what you, the last thing you just said? You, you had asked, and I don't know if you just, just to clarify, did you ask if we have casual RCMP officers? No, no, casual municipal enforcement officers. Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Macon, anything on round three? No, I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Uh, sorry to beat this up, but I need more information on the um, the big request again. Your proposal calls for contracting out the mobile photo radar as well. I, I, I think that's obvious. I'm correct. That's correct. And you indicated, and please don't count this as two questions. This is clarification. You indicated that the mobile part would be paid for by a per ticket rate back to the contracting company? Your Worship, through to Councillor Kelly, the entire contract for automated traffic enforcement will be paid on a per violation um, rate. Which includes obviously then the mobile part. That it's was my question. That's, all. That's right. So, so then my question is, we're contracting out mobile enforcement and paying these people a commission to go do the work. That's essentially what we're doing here. Your worship through to, to Councillor Kelly, that is how the contract is set up. It's a per violation rate. Okay, thank you, Karina. I know I've been a little difficult on this one, but you can sense I'm really not fond of it. So appreciate your candid comments. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Kelly, if I can just clarify that as well. Um, we we do set up all of the sites. So the, the contractor will have to operate based on the hours and limits that we set and at the sites that we suggest that they that they do that. So we are still in control of how long they're out there and we will set limits to the amount of hours that are um, are conducting mobile photo enforcement. Okay, then one more question to you, if I may. These contractors, if in fact we have a shortage and a need for personnel elsewhere, they're not available to go elsewhere within our community to to assist in other in other peacekeeping duties, correct? Your worship through to Councillor Kelly, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Your worship, thank you. do you mind if I, sorry, I know this has been flagged, but I, I wouldn't mind making a quick comment just before we move on. Go right sorry. ahead. Thank you, sorry. Um, so just to give some, some background as to how I sort of came to understand this plan request <clears throat> and Councillor Kelly, um, we actually had Ms. Rayner come back to leadership team a couple times on this one because it's not an easy one to understand. And, and so we talked at length about how to present it and, and whatnot. And I'm, and I'm, I would take responsibilities for some of the deficiency and maybe the clarity around it. We did try, but um, we could do better. So at the essence of this is that there is a need for more officers for municipal enforcement. So it, it leaves you with the choice. You could you could approve two new officers in and we could continue on with the model that we have today. And I'm and so what I'm assuming is that's sort of the business case you would like us to benchmark this again, which is fine. Or the other one is you can contract out this work and it frees up the time that those officers are spending to go into the pool uh, and the capacity of municipal enforcement. So those are kind of the two. There's there's other choices, but at a big picture perspective, those are the two choices. And one of the things that weighs in favor of the contracting choice is that these companies are quite a bit better at the work uh, than municipalities tend to be because of the specialized nature and the evolving nature of the technology itself. And because they're so good at it, um, it allows them to do what they're good at. And we contract, so we contract that piece out. We tell them when and where and how. And then we the, the resources that we currently have dedicated to trying to do this, they get to go and do what they're good at. Um, so that was why we 
you know, this choice was allowed to go into the budget in the way that it was. Um, and then obviously the impact of it is that there should be more revenue because more of the tickets will get written and we will have more um, photo enforcement being done than we're getting to now. So I just wanted to kind of give that this some context before it comes back for the flag. So you have that to ponder. Ben, I think I, I, I appreciate your comments personally, and I don't know about the rest of council. I'd like to see three budgets, one for essentially buying the new equipment and not hiring anybody. You tell me you need two extra police officers, so let's do that particular budget with owned equipment, and then let's do the contracted scenario so we have all three and we can compare the savings. Uh, there are no savings to be had here. It's, it's sorry, but it, there isn't. Um, one more question while I have the mic, and I know I'm taking a long time. The budget analysis says that 564,400 of additional ATE contract. So when you're doing the budgets for comparison, please give 100% revenues and costs for this so that we truly are comparing apples to apples, not just the changes. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. Councillor Harris, do you have anything further on this one? When was the last time we had um, our officers in a mobile unit sitting on Highway 21 or elsewhere doing mobile enforcement? Because I can't remember seeing anybody out doing mobile enforcement in the last year. Your worship through to Councillor Harris, I can let uh, Sergeant Lee Hardman answer your question. Thank you. First, actually, it was on Monday. Did you get many offenders? Second I, question. <laughs> sorry, I don't have that information, but uh, I believe it was around 10 offenders at that time. Okay, so the bottom line is we are still doing it. That's the service level and uh, Unless something changes in the budget allocation, you guys will continue to do what you do. Okay. And that's a question to, uh, to Mr. Fleming more than anybody else, I suppose. That's okay. Forget it. Okay. So I assume the, the answer is yes. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Mr. Fleming, did you want to say the yes? <laughs> Sorry, Your Worship, and I honestly, I was writing something down and I missed the question, so I apologize. It, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, Councillor Kelly has asked for three things. I think if we have a conversation around those three things, we will flesh it out pretty well, I suspect. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councillor Blizzard, anything further? Yeah, just a question. Um, you said right now we have eight peace officers with our supervisor. Um, what's our history on that? I know for years and years, I think there was only one. And I'm asking because we are a growing city. Um, do you know or can you get it? And it doesn't have to be today. I just like to know how when the last position was added, how they moved up in numbers. Your worship through to Councillor Blizzard, I can answer that question for you. So we have added um three peace officers in the last six years. So that, so we added one in 2015. We added another one, and that was to take on animal control in 2015. We added one in 2017 and another one in 2020. So they're slowly been going up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Noyan. Anything further? Yeah, just a, a short, simple question. Uh, I, I don't really understand this. This has to do with our our modernization of the speed cameras. I don't understand how a projected figure of say seven hundred thousand dollars in revenue, which is what you've estimated, how how you come to this number. Maybe you can just help me understand how we know that we're going to cost recover in at, at that figure. Okay, so I maybe uh, maybe I'll jump in because this has been flagged to bring a full okay. business case back. Right, yeah, and and that's fair, uh, Mayor. Um, I just maybe wanted to have a better understanding of of that number and how it factors in now before it it goes to discussion. Uh, but I, I'll have time to think about it when, when when we debate it further. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. So I think we're good. That item, nobody had a problem with that being flagged. And I do believe that administration has captured what is to be brought back. So I'm going to suggest a 10 minute uh, uh, break. So be back in your seats at 2.40. And uh, we will pick up and go till four o'clock today. Okay, thanks. Just put your videos down. And thank you, Corrine.
Okay, if everybody would like to start joining, we will start in one minute. Okay, I think we have everybody with us uh, once again. So we will start with fire services and Heather Cowie presenting. So I would welcome Heather to present. Good afternoon, all your mayor, your mayor and, and council. It is actually Todd Martins, our new fire chief, will be presenting today. Not me. Good afternoon, Your Worship and, and Council. Um, again, my name is Todd Martins, uh, Fire Chief uh, with the City. I'm here to present uh, the 2022 Fire Services Overview, which is located in Section 12 of your budget document. Fire Services is responsible for providing a variety of emergency and non-emergency services to the citizens of Fort Saskatchewan. Fire Services also leads the City in emergency management, disaster planning, and preparedness by collaborating with a number of city departments, industry partners, and mutual aid agreements. Fire service is made up of nine programs currently, and for more information, please see your budget documents. Next slide, please. 2022 department highlights, I'll just touch on a few. Um, currently, we are in um, collective bargaining with uh, the IAFF, uh, Local 5277, um, that started earlier this year. Um, the next one is our station location study, which um, currently is underway with in partnership with Strathcona County. Um, the money we received was through the Alberta Community and Partnership Grant, and we're hoping uh, for completion early quarter one of 2022. One of the biggest changes and transitions is emergency management, uh, which will be moving under fire services and 2022, and I will speak a little more um, later on. And the last one I have um, is the fire service master plan um, for 2022, which will create more efficiencies and provide direction for long-term planning and budgeting um, over the years to come. Next slide. The biggest program change again um, is emergency management and preparedness. Um, with the retiring of uh, director Brad Ward, um, emergency management will fall um, under the deputy fire chief's portfolio and myself. Um, you will see staffing time and uh, reallocation across all of the, the programs and reflecting the 2022 priorities for the work plan uh, with AEMA in emergency management moving forward. Uh, for 2022, I have one budget request. Um, it is request 230034 and can be found on page 12-5. The budget impact is $50,000 for a one time. It is funded under the Financial Stabilization and Contingency Reserve. Under PBB, um, the master plan falls uh, mostly into the quartile three across the nine programs um, and generally scored high in a safe community. Fire service strives uh, to deliver timely and quality service to the growing city of Fort Saskatchewan through the nine programs we provide. As the city that continuous, continuously grows, uh, we also need to look at change. Over the last year, we've had a number of changes from full-time service and the adoption of the 10 minute response time, 90% of the time. And we've made big steps in the right direction. However, we still need to change to meet industry standards and grow. The fire service master plan is a strategic blueprint and would be a critical guiding document to the fire service into the future and will also plan and create efficiencies and provide direct and long-term planning budgeting and ensure effective investment in the programs and the service that we will continue to deliver to the years to come for the next 10 to 15 years this request is important without a master plan operations will continue without a clear approach to growth and we will not realize the effective and efficient service that we could achieve with this new model. And with that, I'd like to thank you for presenting today and I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you. And just uh, remind council, they are in negotiations. Um, uh, so we will not uh, uh, entertain questions regarding the negotiations. 
but uh, may ask other questions. So, Councillor Macon, you're first. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I don't actually really have any questions. I think the master plan is a great idea for fire service. I find often um, I've been surprised by the requests that come from fire service. So I think that with the master plan, it really helps uh, align everything. So um, I think it's a great idea. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kelly. Just to be clear, the the line item budget um, had emergency management and preparation, that staff reallocation, that's over and above or outside of the fire, the, the, the master plan that you're referencing, correct? The, the, sorry, your worship and through to Councillor Kelly, the reallocation um, of the time is from, uh, is the deputy fire chief's position across all the nine programs um, that we have um, currently. Um, the position was um, currently um, just not filled at that time, and, and now we're um, moving forward with the program with emergency management and with Brad retiring. So okay. the, the plan is the additional 50000 Thank you. That makes it clear. And no other questions. Okay, thank you. So I can just confirm with Mr. Fleming. So Mr. Ward's department or wherever it was somewhere else, that zeroed out somewhere. And then that's just moved over into here. Yeah, through your worship, Mr. Ward has been doing work uh, for the last couple, well, 20 months. Is that how long it's been now? But he, he was actually approved in early 2020. So that was a two year project that was approved on a temporary basis with money from the health and safety reserve. And that money ends at the end of December 2021, whatever year we're in now. Um, so his his work ends and it would not it's not included in the 2020 budget. Um, we're actually looking for some creative ways to keep him around on a part time basis to to continue to provide us with data, but it won't be part of emergency management. We'll to figure something else out there. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Harris. So, in the absence of a fire master plan. <clears throat> How will we establish priorities for fire suppression, emergency management, all the other good things you guys do at the fire hall? Um, how, how have we gotten to the end of the, uh, the, the, the trail without a master plan in the past? Your worship and through to Councillor Harris, this is the, the fire master plan that will be all in, encompassing and, and cover a lot of um, extra detail. Um, for the next 10 years. There has been other studies that have been completed. Um, in 2015, there was a, a staffing study, um, of the station location in 2016, with, which was just for Fort Saskatchewan, as well as the fire underwriter study um, that was completed, I believe, in 2013. Um, and there was a lot of information um, with suggestions um, in the fire underwriter study and through those other studies for the progression. Um, as well as a lot of our equipment, um, it, it is geared out based on NFPA standards. Um, and so uh, it, we do have a set time period to replace a lot of equipment and that just rolled over. This new master plan will help with operational uh, staffing, training, administration, um, fire prevention. Um, it'll be, again, that all encompassing for the next uh, 10 to 15 years with the new model that we're currently running with full-time staff. Uh, great, thanks. I, I'm not opposed to it. I think it makes eminent sense to make sure that you've identified both your strategic and tactical um, priorities. So thanks uh, for that response. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Blizzard. Questions? Thanks for your presentation. And no, I don't have any questions. And a fire master plan is probably a good thing to have. Uh, Councillor Noyan, questions? Yeah, thanks uh, all of my fellow members of council. You've asked questions uh, that I was going to, and then thank you for the presentation, Fire Chief, and for your crew to get, uh, giving my son uh, a little red hat uh, a few months ago. Okay, Councillor Abatoye, clarifying questions. Thank you for your presentation, um, Todd. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. How many of the city's firefighters are women? And I'm asking you that because I know the na national number is really low, it's like 4.4%. So I'm hoping at least we beat that. 
of your worship through Council Laboratory. Um, off the top of my head, um, we're sitting at five right now, currently. I, five of what? What's your total? Five, total? five female firefighters. What's your total number? What's the total number of firefighters? 34. 34, okay. Okay, thank you. You beat them. You're at 14.7%. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, very nice to meet you once again, um, Fire Chief Martins. I know this is your, I think it's your first budget on here. So thank you very much. Uh, Additional not question, Mayor Catcher, sorry. Oh, okay, sure. I can see if there's round two. Okay, I'm just going to, I know you've got, one does uh, I just need a show of hands. Is there going to be a second round for anybody else? Okay, I've got two of you. So go ahead, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, um, Fire Chief. This is, I'm referring now in this question to the ten-year capital plan. Two or three years out, there's a very significant request for fire equipment in the order of two million dollars. Can you give me a heads up what that is, and then tell me why? It needs to be replaced in two years. I think you touched on that in your comments, but I'd like a little more detail, please. Uh, your worship, through you, Councillor Kelly. So, in the the ten year capital, yes, there's um, there's two significant purchases, um, and I believe in 2029, there's 1.9 million uh, for the replacement of our um, tower or ladder truck, um, and again, that would be replacing um, based on years. Um, that we'd have it, that would be uh, 20 years of service and that standard when we replace them based on the NFPA standard that we've adopted. Um, the other one is the replacement of a, an engine or a squad um, in 2024 for 1.1 million. And that truck will be at 22 years, again, which the, the standard is 20. So we're, we're two years over. Um, and right now that truck is currently being used as a uh, as backup, um, a training truck and backup in, until we can replace that. Okay, thank you. I think council needs to have a conversation around the the standards we adopted a couple of years ago, but that's a conversation for a different date. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harris. You had a round two question. I did. So, with respect, and and I probably missed it in the last term, but in terms of the study, this joint study we're doing with Strathcona. Uh, what's potential output of that? Confirmation of a site in Fort Saskatchewan or close to Fort Saskatchewan? What's 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 the outcome likely to look like? Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and through to Councillor Harris. So, uh, the study in partnership with Strathcona is, is look at a number of things. Um, how we can work together more efficient. So whether that's level of service. Um, different types of services, um, if it's uh, also a multi-purpose facility, um, whether that's training um, or is it possibly uh, a joint facility with um, other types of um, programs that the city might offer um, with FCSS or, or just for an example, um, but definitely look at how we can uh, partner a little more with the annexation of the land um, and growing toward that other direction. Um, this will help us and, and Strathcona look at some of those efficiency, whether it's an EOC, emergency operations center, you know, backup dispatch center, uh, some of the ideas that have floating around already. So we're hoping, uh, again, the end of February uh, in quarter one of 2022. So, so this level of um, investigation will help to inform the master plan, I would imagine. That that is correct, yeah, Councillor Harris. This um, this plan and the one we're currently doing now, um, significant money from the Alberta Community Partnership Grant um, and time um, will help uh, flow right into the master plan. And a lot of the data um, and the interviews and some of the, the the material we've collected to date will flow right into the master plan. Um, that's the reason it's coming in around fifty thousand. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for your presentation. So we will let you go and we will invite uh, Tammy Lautner for Family and Community Support Services. And just uh, as she's making her presentation, please everybody note, even though they've got grants to uh, nonprofits, that one will be discussed as item eight on a 
on a further down on the agenda. So if we can keep reserve our comments or questions for those ones till that point in time, if we can focus on the rest, that would be great. So I will invite uh, uh, Ms. Lautner to present. Thank you, Your Worship. Good afternoon, Your Worship and members of council. My name is Tammy Lautner. I am the Director of Family and Community Support Services. I'm here to present an overview of the proposed 2022 budget for Family and Community Support Services, also known as FCSS. Please refer to section 13 of your budget binder. FCSS offers programming that meets the immediate needs of our residents of every age and ability by making it a priority to understand and respond to local social needs, issues, and gaps in services. The department fosters collaboration with social agencies and plays an active role in the community, providing access to proactive services that build resiliency and lead to a strong, healthy, and socially sustainable city. The Family and Community Support Service Department has 12 programs. A few of these programs include home support, youth support programs, counseling services, and senior support programs. You can find a list of all the department programs located on page 13-3 of your budget binder. Some highlights that the department will be working on for the coming year have a strong emphasis on mental wellness. Over the next year, we will evaluate the changing needs of the community as we begin to recover from the pandemic. We will determine programming that supports residents by focusing on mental wellness, resiliency, and connection, attributes that have been heavily impacted by the pandemic. Youth are exhibiting heightened anxiety, depression, and isolation because of the pandemic, so an emphasis will be on supporting youth mental health. We will continue the work as outlined in the Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan. The pandemic has made it challenging to work on initiatives in the community. The focus over the next year will be to liaise with community partners and local businesses to understand community initiatives and opportunities for collaboration. The Youth Outreach Program, formerly Family School Liaison Program, has historically been crisis intervention rather than preventative in nature. A more preventative approach will involve having the youth outreach worker present at more community spaces that youth frequent to build rapport with at-risk youth. Weekly shifts at the Bridge Youth Hub over this past seven months have proven successful to connect with youth. The goal will be to build on this over the next year. In response to a desire identified by local youth, FCSS has created a youth council, which was recently approved as a council appointed committee. The purpose of the youth council is to educate and empower youth to provide information and recommendations to council in relation to issues that impact or involve youth. Youth council is an opportunity for youth to learn about local governance and to create priorities and initiatives that are important to them. The department will evaluate and determine the changing needs of the community by consulting with members of the public and our community partners. We will work on creating educational and supportive programming that addresses these needs as we move to a pandemic recovery focus. The department has no budget requests, so that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Kelly, you're first. Thank you. Uh, home support, Tammy, uh, at $160,000 budget. I would have thought that the demand for that particular service would be climbing quite quickly. It, it, can you share any 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 information or color on that particular part of the program, please? Through your worship to Councillor Kelly, uh, yes, we have seen um, a marketed increase in uh, the demand. Um, what we're also seeing with it is uh, complex situations where we're receiving many referrals uh, from home care. Um, where people are needing assistance, seniors are needing assistance in their homes uh, with house cleaning, but they also have complex uh, health needs and uh, mental health issues. And what we're also finding with our senior population is they often don't have family supports that are local. So they really don't have anybody to, to look out for um, needs such as if they, if they need help with their finances or any such things such as that. And if you would please, the Reader's Digest description of the difference between home care and home support. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, yes. Uh, home support provides uh, uh, house cleaning uh, a service and laundry services, whereas home care is a more of a medical focus, so those personal needs, uh, assisting 
seniors with their medications and um, bathing, that type of thing. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, thank you. I don't have any questions on this one. Councillor Harris? Oh, it was clear, thanks. Councillor Blizzard? Hey, Tammy, good presentation, and no, I don't have any questions. Thank you, Councillor Noyan? No questions for me. Thanks for the presentation, Tammy, and keep up the great work. Thank you, Councillor Batoye. Oh, Tammy, they're letting you up so easily. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just two quick questions. Um, so the diversity and inclusion program, you said that's continuing this year. So when are we going to get a report on, um, on just the whole full program? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Abitoye, uh, there's a, a couple of reports that will be coming Council's way very soon. Uh, we have just wrapped up the second phase of our inclusion audit for the organization. So there will be a Council report coming in the next few weeks to Council to um, uh, highlight what the what we have learned from that. Um, the other uh, update that we will be uh, providing to you will probably be in uh, late January, early February, with an update and report uh, what we have already worked on and what we plan to uh, be working on for this next coming year, because we do have one year left of the two year project. Okay, thank you. And just my second question, I just I look at your your budget, and it seems that your youth support program that's your that's the second second largest program um, in your department. And I'm just wondering, can you just just um, just on a um, high level, what, what does that that program do? Because I, I know we just um, recently appointed the youth council and there was YAC. What else um, does that, that um, program do? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Obatoye, uh, what is involved with the youth uh, support programs uh, is the youth outreach. Uh, that I had alluded to. So they provide one on one support to youth and families. Um, she also uh, has uh, regular weekly shifts at the Bridge Youth Hub um, and she provides supports in the schools and in home visitation. We also provide uh, educational workshop, workshops in the community and in the schools on a number of different issues that relate to youth. Um, and then there's also leadership opportunities and volunteer opportunities such as the Youth Council Youth um, Advisory Committee, um, our LGBTQ um, uh, Rainbow Alliance group, and um, events such as the uh, Youth Fest. Great. Thank you, Tammy. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Macon. Thanks for your presentation, Tammy. I don't have any questions either. Okay. Thank you. I'll just ask if uh, on does anybody require round two? Okay, that will you get the award. <laughs> Tell Mark Morse, uh, yeah, you get the shortest presentation now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we will move on to uh, financial services. Jeremy Eamon presenting. Uh, go ahead. Good afternoon, Your Worship and members of Council. I'm afraid my presentation will be a little bit longer than Tammy. Uh, my name is Jeremy Eamon, Chief Financial Officer for the City. I'm here to present the 2022 financial and fiscal services operating budgets, which are located in section 14 of the budget document. Financial services staff joining me online to assist are Clayton Northey, manager of accounting and reporting, Shannon Andruco, senior accountant, and Christelle Mbui, general accountant. Financial services is responsible for all aspects of the city's financial management, including budgeting, investment, planning, record keeping, and asset management. The department also manages fiscal services, which is responsible for debt management, financial reserves, and property taxes. Financial services supports all municipal departments and residents by ensuring the city has the financial means to fund ongoing and new programs and initiatives to meet the needs of our growing community. The department provides the financial services, processes, policies, and procedures required to ensure the city is fiscally sound and is accountable and transparent in the management of public funds. Financial Services manages 11 unique programs in the delivery of services to both the organization and residents. For a listing, please refer to page 14-3 in the budget document. Our department offers a wide variety of programs ranging from accounting services and treasury management, operating and capital budgeting, to utility billing, property taxes, and property assessment support. Some highlights from the Financial Services 2022 budget include an asset management advisor, position to support the city's asset management program. Two external studies are being proposed for 2022, an asset retirement obligation engineering study 
and an enterprise resource planning study. All three of these are new initiatives that I'll be presenting budget requests for in just a few moments. And lastly, next tax season, taxpayers will be given the option of receiving their 2022 property tax and assessment notices electronically by email. Next, I will review some significant changes from 2021 to 2022 for specific programs within financial and fiscal services. Starting with financial services, this information is shown on pages or page 14-3. Within the property assessment and assessment role changes program, an increase of $12,660 or 3% over 2021 is proposed. This change is required to adjust property assessment fees paid to the Capital Region Assessment Services Commission, of which 11,600 is attributed to an inflationary increase in the commission's fees for 2022. Within the asset management program, an increase of 159,599 is proposed to reflect the new position of asset management advisor. This is a new initiative that I'll be presenting again as a budget, new budget request in a few moments. And within the utility building services program, an increase of 15,187 or 5% over 2021 is proposed. The program change is represented by a reduction in utility disconnection reconnection user fees revenue, which is offset by an increase in utility service fee revenue due to inflation and growth. Uh, moving on to fiscal services, uh, this information is shown on pages 14 5 and 6 of the budget document. Within the reserve transfers program, a net decrease of 289,000 or 4% over 2021 is proposed. Significant items within this net change year over year include a 559,000 one time offset for culture and recreation services, COVID 19 revenue reductions, $164,000 reduction due to the automated traffic enforcement program modernization, a $219,000 increase in the infrastructure lifecycle reserves contribution, and a $340,000 increase in reserve transfers due to the local road rehabilitation payback which is pursuant to Council Resolution R150-21. For further details on these and other changes, please refer to page 14-5. Within the Annual Capital Funding Program, an increase of $76,000 or 3% for 2021 is proposed, and this recognizes the operating impact from the Neighborhood Rehabilitation Ongoing Annual Capital Program. Within the Library Grant Program, an increase of 12,220 or 1% over 2021 is proposed, for the library's annual appropriation. And just a reminder, library representatives will be presenting their 2022 budget request to council and will be available to answer questions on November 23rd. Within the property tax and requisition program, an increase in growth revenue of approximately 574,000 or 1.2% 1 over 2021 is proposed. This represents the anticipated additional property taxes to be levied and collected in 2022 resulting from estimated assessment growth in residential and non-residential properties. Within the interest and investment income program, an increase of $25,000 or 2.5% over 2021 is proposed. The increase in revenue is attributed to larger investment balances, resulting from higher reserve and deferred capital grant balances over last year. I will now present three operating budget requests for Council's review and consideration. Mr. Clayton Northey, Manager of Accounting Reporting, and Ms. Shannon Adruco are available online to assist. Starting with request 12-0213, Asset Management Advisor. This can be found starting on page 14-7. The request totals $142,928 and is spread over two years, 110,100 in 2022, of which 5,500 is one-time funded from the Financial Stabilization and Contingency Reserve and 32,828 in 2023. This position is partially funded also by the utility rates. Financial Services is requesting a full-time permanent position to centralize and coordinate the city's asset management functions, provide advisory expertise to departments and asset owners, and support the city's overall asset management program. With a dedicated asset management role, the department will develop a consistent framework for implementing asset management across the organization monitor and track critical data and progress, facilitate necessary training, and provide evidence-based recommendations to senior leadership regarding asset acquisition, maintenance, and repair. Under priority-based budgeting, the position supports the asset management program 
which falls into quartile two, scoring highest in both the demand and population served attributes and highest in the resource management and financial stewardship results. The position also directly aligns with the strategic initiative, ongoing refinement and development of an asset management program under the strategic goal of well-planned and maintained municipal infrastructure. Next is request 12-0214 for an enterprise resource planning or ERP assessment. And that can be found starting on page 14-11. Budget impact is 55,000 one time to be funded by the financial stabilization and contingency reserve. The city's enterprise resource planning or ERP system of software applications manages and integrates in critical functions and operations, such as accounting, utility building, human resources, property taxation, permits and licensing, payroll, recreation, booking, purchasing, budgeting, and reporting. So just about everything the city does is touched by the ERP system. The city's current ERP system at times experiences increasingly more challenging software and support issues. Moreover, it has recently been announced that Great Plains, the city's primary ERP software application, will be discontinuing extended support in 2028. Financial Services is therefore requesting a specialized consultant to be contracted in 2022 to complete a comprehensive review and gap analysis to evaluate the city's ERP system for efficiency, costs, weaknesses and strengths, redundancies, lifespan and alternatives. The re review will identify the city's needs for the next 5 to 15 years and provide recommendations for solutions. The review and recommendations will support the city in acquiring the most flexible, adaptable and cost-effective ERP solution to meet service levels with a growing population. Under PBB, the study supports the corporate application support program, which falls into quartile three, scoring highest in the demand attribute and highest in the operational excellence results. The last time a similar study was conducted was in the year 2000. So this would be a great opportunity to review current processes to ensure we are meeting the needs and expectations of our ERP system both now and into the future. And the last request that I have is request 12-0215 for an asset retirement obligation engineering study. This can be found starting on page 14-15. The budget impact is 100,000 one time to be funded by the financial stabilization and contingency reserve. Beginning in 2023, the city will be required to adopt a new Canadian public sector accounting standard regarding asset retirement obligations. The standard will require the city to estimate and report the value of its asset retirement obligations associated with tangible capital assets. Common retirement obligations include remediation costs related to buildings containing asbestos, lead paint, and vermiculite insulation along with storage tanks. In order to comply with the standard, the city requires external advice to determine the scope and magnitude of these obligations and the estimated future value of assets. Financial Services is therefore requesting a specialized consultant be contracted in 2022 to perform an engineering study to ensure the city has the necessary information to comply with the accounting standard. The study will provide a comprehensive review of all city assets and the estimated cost to meet legal obligations when retiring those assets at the end of their service life. Some of those costs could include post-retirement operations, maintenance, and monitoring that are integral to the retirement of TCA. This information will help the city to identify its liabilities and legal obligations, plan for asset management, and inform decisions regarding the upgrade, expansion, remediation, and retirement of tangible capital assets into the future. Under PBB, the study supports the Financial Accounting, Reporting, Compliance, and Controls Program, which falls into quartile two, scoring highest in the mandate attribute and highest in the financial stewardship results. The requirements under this new accounting standard will impact all municipalities and other organizations operating within Alberta's public sector. And that concludes my presentation. My team and I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm first in the uh, question order. So I'm assuming the asset retirement obligation engineering study, is that mandatory then at this point in time? Uh, to your worship, um, yes, I would say it is. Um, and the reason why it's mandatory is because the accounting standard, that is the requirement that we're following. Um, under our current staffing, 
um, we simply um, don't have the expertise to uh, to do the evaluation ourselves. So in that regard, yes, the study is mandatory. Okay, and on the previous one, the enterprise resources one, I still don't fully understand because if we're if you want 50, 50 or fifty five thousand, but to have a contractor come in to evaluate, how can they evaluate it? Wouldn't our staff be better to evaluate? Uh, to your worship, so the consultant that we have in mind uh, would have the 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 expertise of knowing. Um, you know, the current state of, of ERP systems and software. And so really this, this is the first step of, of, of probably really an examination of, 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 of our full system and probably, you know, it's a multi-year probably approach, but really it's a gap analysis to see where the city currently is at with our software applications. Um, the ERP system, um, I honestly don't know. It's an inventory of software and probably, uh, uh, Mr. Harder, the IT director, would have a better number on that, but it's it's a suite of software applications. And so, what this consultant would do is examine the full breadth of that software. Um, some of which it's probably fair to say we're not utilizing to the fullest extent. Some may be outdated, some may be redundant. And so, really, what this consultant is coming in to do is look at our current system. Um, and, and yes, it would involve staff um, surveys and analysis to, to see how the users are using the software, but also to have that expertise of knowing what are the next steps, how long is our current software going to last, what other systems are out there, and, and be able to make recommendations going forward. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harris, questions? Uh, picking up on that, Jeremy, so we really do not have um, an ERP system. Uh, like I would think something like SAP would be an ERP system, uh, which ultimately has a range of software applications to meet all business needs. Is that a fair set? Because you just, uh, uh, the way I took what you just said is we have a mishmash of this and that, and, and uh, we may have gaps and we may not be using. Is that is that a fair assessment? Well, to your worship, uh, through your worship to Councillor Harris, I think when you think about the the primary um, software application is our diamond um, software uh, through Great Plains, uh, which is manufactured or produced by Microsoft. Um, that's our primary ERP system that runs all of our accounting, our property taxation, our utility billing, and over and above that, it's supported by smaller types of software, Projecto, which is project management, etc. Um, so that's. Our focus is on the the main software, the diamond, but it'll it'll probably also extend beyond that to the smaller applications that we use as well. And I'm really familiar with diamond, so no, I I support what you're uh, proposing there. It makes sense from that standpoint. Now, in the good old days, the departments such as engineering uh, would have ultimately brought forward a uh, a project request to something like that asset management. Uh, so the city has obviously changed the the format in terms of this being a centralized type of thing within finance as opposed to an application uh, within within an operating department. Is is that, am I reading that correctly? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Harris, yeah, I, I would agree with your, your analysis. Um, the, the, the ERP system um, touches on all departments. Um, really, none of the city can, uh, departments can operate without or in the absence of an ERP system. Um, we are superior heading, we meaning financial services are, are making the request, but I'll, obviously it'll be a collaborative approach across the city organization uh, wide. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not criticizing that, Jeremy. I'm, I'm just looking, so there's been a change of the way we um, deal with these types of project reviews. So, so I, I think you've clarified that and it's in the documentation, so thank you. Okay, we will move on to Councillor Blizzard, clarifying questions. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for the presentation. Um, just a couple of questions here for the uh, asset manager position. So I'm looking at 14 9. It says that um, many are creating these dedicated positions. And then it mentions particularly in response to funding from the federal government. So is there funding available for this position or is that something to do with the assets or? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Blizzard, um, no funding that I know of is aware of for the position. Um, there was some funding available to do the 
initial gap analysis study that was done, I believe in 2019, um, through the, uh, sorry, it slips my mind now, but I think it was about 55,000 that was directed towards that study. But no, I'm not aware of any grant funding that would, would cover a position like this. Okay, just the way the wording was. And one more, um, for the uh, $100,000 for the study, um, how do we come up with that? Is that a usual price that we know it is? And can it also be, do we put out an RFP and sometimes they come back lower? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Blizzard, excellent question. Yes, the the hundred thousand is kind of the um, the high scale amount that we we figure uh, would be the maximum, and hopefully through our RFP process, if this gets approved, um, we'll we'll come in lower. But again, this is one of those studies um, that's that's very hard to determine the scope at at this point, um, and so we've we've estimated it conservatively at the hundred thousand, but hopefully the, the money the dollars will be less than that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Noyan. Yeah, uh, thank you, and thank you for your presentation, Jeremy. I have a couple questions. Uh, first is in regards to the ERP uh, assessment. So, if I'm understanding this correctly, 2028 is when our current software from Microsoft mo is moving to a cloud-based solution. So, why is this a pressing issue at the moment? And it seems like it's something that could be brought forward at the beginning of the next council in, in four years, and that would be more timely. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Noyan, um, I, I'll take a stab at the question. Probably our, our IT director, Mr. Harder, would have a, a more fulsome response. But um, my understanding is that the software that we're having right now has, has fairly significant support issues with it um, in terms of, of getting the support that we need to, even just from an accounting standpoint, uh, can be difficult at times, um, and I don't know if that me the, the the problem behind that or the reason behind that is that the software supporter is is devoting their time to other iterations of the software more current. Um, uh, but we do find that it's it's very slow process, and so like I did mention in the in the presentation of the request, we are experiencing some problems with it. So. To delay that uh, that study um, just increases the risk, um, and the closer you get to um, to looking at the problem, leaves you less time to deal with the problem. And uh, ERP systems, um, looking at what other municipalities have done with respect to them, uh, many times they take years to to do uh, to fully develop and to deal with. So I would be hesitant to defer this um, any longer. That basically would be my thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a good perspective. And I'm not an expert in software. It seems to me that, yeah, even if it was 2025, when this, this was brought before council, again, you'd still have three years to, when well, that's th three years to implement new software. And, and you know, I also what, what you mentioned, um, so that there there are there, the software upgrades with this right now are basically ineffective is what you're saying uh three words to counselor noyan uh i would agree with that comment um yes yeah this okay interesting thank you that's your two questions well i do have another question we can move on <laughs> uh counselor abatoye Thank you for your presentation, Jeremy. And just one um, simple one. Um, so this is the um, asset management advisor position. I'm, I'm saying we're taking 5,500 from reserves. What's that for? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Abitoya, those are the one-time setup costs with any time we bring a new position on. I believe that's uh, things like computers. Um, okay. That sort of thing. Okay. Um, my second question is, um, so the ERP software, like I, I get it, it's, it's an enterprise-wide software that's going to help and enable us with whatever, our operations and all of that. But my question is that we're also purchasing an asset management software. So is there going to be a need to ensure that, that the two softwares actually, um, you know, you know, they, what's the word now? Maybe they compile with each other or they work together? You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Your worship to Councillor Abitoya, the short answer to that is yes, absolutely. Um, right now, we're, I believe, in the final stages of the RFP for that. Um, 
asset management software. So you're, that will be um, certainly have to be integrated into this study as well. For Excellent. Assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Macon. Hi, Jeremy. Um, my only question is on the asset management advisor. Obviously, asset management is something that's been important to council for the last few years, and we've been pushing for new policy and a lot of work on that. Is this the missing puzzle piece? Is this what kind of brings it uh, full circle to a conclusion where we have a full asset management program, or is there still uh, work or funding requests that will come in the future to still finish that off? Or is this kind of like it? This is what we need to complete it. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Macon, um, that's a it's a bit of a loaded question. I think uh, well, the way I'll answer that is that this is the main first step in seeing through the asset management program. Um, one of the things that uh, that we're we're dealing with is is a lack of resources, both in terms of time and expertise. Um, time meaning uh, Mr. Northy, and he may want to speak to this as well. Answer this question, but. Um, we're, we're trying to manage this kind of off the side of our desk. It's, it's a critically important program. Um, and we, we don't have the time because we're devoted to doing other things in terms of financial services, but also the expertise, um, this asset management advisor will, will be a certified asset management professional have, um, a degree, I believe in this area. And really, uh, this person, uh, once they're on board, will be able to. Uh, train and be able to facilitate the asset management program throughout the organization. Um, I do understand that a lot of municipalities are, are looking for similar uh, positions right now because of the of the um, of the need and the requirements for this type of position. Um, so I can't guarantee that it won't be a, another request in in a year's time or such. But this is the main one that. That is the is the major step forward in in seeing an asset management program uh, move forward for the city. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you, and thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I wanted to talk about the ERP software a little bit, and of course, I know almost nothing on this stuff. Uh, SAP is a provider, I think, of enterprise software. Is that correct? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Kelly, the name is familiar. I, I believe it is, yes. Okay. Uh, I see a nod from Councillor Harris as well. I would encourage and support your early um, approach to this. I know personally one company with 1,500 employees that adopted this type of new software three years ago and it almost brought that company to their knees. It turned out to be about eight times more expensive and four times longer to get working than, than, than they anticipated. So, so I support all, all of the projects or, or asks that you have, and uh, thanks for the report. Okay, thank you. So I did hear there was one person with a round two. Does anybody else have a round two? Okay, so just uh, Councillor Noyan, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my, my question, just as a new councillor, it has to do with our, our asset uh, asset management, and then the position that that you're you're asking for the, for the advisor. I, I think it's fantastic that you you have this as an initiative, and and I'm actually quite surprised that <clears throat> this has not been already done in, in Fort Saskatchewan. But I'm glad we're on it. Um, so the the asset, basically to clarify how asset management has been working within Fort Saskatchewan uh, so far and is right now is is basically just an adherence to our asset management policy and uh, uh, to our best of abilities and I don't know if you can just enlighten me further I guess uh through your worship to Councillor Noyan uh, you know what I'm gonna pass this off to Mr. Northy um I asked him to uh to join me and I, I want him he's He's the subject matter expert on this, so I'm going to pass it over to him. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Noyan, um, to date, um, or historically, our asset management program has been a highly decentralized process. Um, some where some of our assets, uh, uh, particularly our uh, roadway systems, have been. Uh, operating at a fairly high level of man asset management sophistication. 
Um, and then we have a number of areas that are much lower level of sophistication. Um, we only adopted the asset management policy um, earlier this year. Um, Previous to that, um, we had been working towards that process that for a couple of years um, after doing a review of our asset management practices in 2019. Um, we are, this year we have been developing, we developed a, a steering committee to guide the program. Um, we're doing some, uh, we've been identifying and reconciling some of our various inventories of assets. Uh, and we have been um, developing a doing a needs internal needs assessment to develop the RFP for an asset management software. So this is the final leg of the. This is really the first time council is putting some permanent long or long term funding to this program. Previously to it, it's been one time funding to get us to this stage. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for the answer. Okay, thank you very much. That appears to be everything on round two. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Eamon and uh, Clayton for that. So we will excuse the two of you at this point in time. And uh, we are going to move on. We've got information technology, Trevor Harder presenting. You hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, Your Worship, members of Council. I'm Trevor Harder, I'm the Director of can, Information. Okay. Trevor, can you get your mic a little closer or turn it up? I can try turning it up, yep. Okay, is that better? Okay, we can turn, we'll have to turn you up from our end. Okay, so go ahead. I'll talk louder. Okay. So good afternoon, worship members of council. I'm presenting the IT operating budget for 2022. Please refer to section 15 in your budget binder. There are two priorities for 2022 that I will focus on. Microsoft Office 365 within the corporate application support program is a cloud-based software offering with your office applications and data in the cloud. Included in this offering are a series of collaboration and meeting management tools, defining a new level of efficiencies within work teams. The city's adventure began in fall of 2020 with a pilot group of 25 users, and it has been a successful pilot to date. We are now at the stage, we are now at the stage where we continue to roll out 365 to remaining departments within the city. This is a very resource intensive project, which includes the organization of city network drive data and migration of that data to SharePoint, the data repository of Office 365. This will be done in conjunction with records management. The second priority that I'll highlight is our network security. In 2022, we'll continue to build on and enhance network security as part of the IT security and data management program. Will be a focus in two main areas. The network security assessment will be completed, providing us with detailed security risk vulnerabilities within the network and how to mitigate that risk. The other area of focus will be security education awareness training consisting of self driven web based interactive webinars. The service level for the training is currently three times per year. We have established a baseline and continue to measure the effectiveness of the training with fake phishing emails sent out to all users twice a year. Refer to the programs we manage in page 15-3 of the binder. There's three programs that have significant changes. Corporate application support. The city began its transition from an in-house Microsoft Office platform to Office 365 cloud-based solution in 2020. The transition will continue in 2022 and be ongoing. The system will modernize the workplace, improve data availability, enhance capacity for collaboration and workflow integration, and support remote work. Implementing Office 365 requires significant resources and specialized technical skills. The department lacks the resources to complete the work. Consulting services in 2022 is required to implement, maintain, and provide administrative support. 
Ongoing consultant services will be reviewed and potential to replace with a staff position in 2023. Second program with significant changes, geographical information systems referred to as GIS. This program does not get the recognition it deserves, used by almost every department in one way or another. Raw data is brought to life and plotted in layers of a map, giving a clear visual and access to a wealth of information. The GIS system is a key component of the city asset management initiative. Included with the system is 3D modeling, which allows city planners and developers to see a true picture of buildings and structures. Third program with significant change is our IT security and data management. Network security is at the forefront of every municipality. It is critical to build and maintain this program in efforts to protect the city data. There are strategies in place that deliver layers of security but one wrong click of the mouse can be detrimental to the city. Therefore, we have a large focus on security education awareness. Educating staff on the potential security risks is the best layer of defense. We need to continue to invest in this program. Cybersecurity threats are increasing and the risk of a security breach also increases. The cost of reliable, robust security solutions, often cloud-driven, subscription-based, come with a high price tag for a municipality, municipality our size. The best and current practices in security will dictate, dictate how we navigate that path. The IT security and data management program will likely continue to see budget impacts within the next few years. Thank you, that's my presentation and I would be happy to answer your questions. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Harris, you're first. I have no questions for Trevor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blizzard, any questions? Well, just one in general. So with all this cloud, and this is on a personal level too, I keep wondering, is it more risky? You know, because when they say cloud, it's still the, the information is stored somewhere. It's just a remote from us. Would it be safer for the city to have its own storage and maybe own backup somewhere? Or is this, do they have two places that things are stored? Um, no, they're, they're still, we still have the data. We still store our data, um, back up our data locally, but um, just because it's in the cloud, um, we don't have that redundancy that, that, it can be misinterpreted how the cloud data is there. And if, if you lose that uh, connection to the cloud, you lose your data. So we do still have, we still do back up the data on premise on site to make sure we have our own copies as well. That's it for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Noyan. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. It's a very intriguing area of our uh, the department in the city and, and very important. My, my question for you is what you project as a potential cost in 2023 after the implementation of Microsoft Office 365. Do you foresee that we will be settled in by the end of 2022 and that things will be running extremely smoothly or do you foresee that this could carry qu quite a bit forward into 2023 and and the reason I ask is it looks like you might be looking for an, another staff position in 2023 whereas in my in my opinion I thought that it's it's something that it's kind of in the installation of this and there'll be software upgrades after everybody gets to, to, to know how to use it then we have a new smooth running software system for Microsoft Office. So I think there was two questions hopefully uh, Mr. Harder caught those. Okay um no, it, it's um, it, it's a big office or like 365. This project, it's a big, it's a it's a beast. It's going to go on into 2023 for sure. Um, even after that, there's the um, part of the project, the SharePoint project, which is um, taking all our data, putting it into a SharePoint repository, which is basically replacing our network drives. So all our data that we're putting into this SharePoint has to be, um, it's not just a simple copy and paste. So we need experts who know the, the software to come in and be able to do this for us, tag all the data so it's all searchable. Um, 
there's a lot to there's a lot more to it than than what one would realize when they're doing a project like this. So the ongoing administrative support of Office 365 will continue um, into the future. It'll be ongoing. So we will need um, either consultants helping us out to support it, or there'll be a, a, a additional staff will have to come on to um, continue supporting and providing that. Does that okay. does that help the question? Yeah, that that helps a lot. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Councillor Batoye. Um, thank you for your presentation, Trevor. Just one quick question. Um, so, um, Office Office three sixty five, we just were transitioning to. Does that give us larger storage space? It it'll give larger storage space on yes on the email side as well as your data side. So yes, it does. All right, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Macon. No questions for me, Trevor. Thank you for everything your department does to keep us moving. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Trevor, do your best and in and, and, and again in a reader's digest version to tell somebody like me who's pretty ignorant on computer stuff why we switched and the benefits to Office 365 over over our old system. Well, we Microsoft is forcing forcing our hand as well, but more so the the benefits that we're going to get from Office 365. We've already began to to see those benefits, and it's that collaborative um, that collaborative approach within Teams that allows us to be working to to collaborate on on documents in in real time. Um, there's a, a messaging a chat um, piece that will. Uh, takes care of a lot of the email, um, extra emails that go on. Everybody always sending emails. There's a chat piece that gets utilized more. There's um, teams in the sense that you can build a team of your department um, able to work on, um, to do your projects together and collaborate. So that's a big piece, the collaboration, the team piece. Um, your your email now you have access to it anywhere you are up to five devices so you can have it on your iPad your iPhone have it on your computer you can sit down at a computer at an internet cafe and you can access all your work all your documents whereas right now uh, up to this point we haven't been able to do that you have your your applications your data it's on your network and the only way you're going to access that is if you sign in remotely from home or if you go into the office and access your computer. So it's that flexibility of being mobile, um, that team efficiency, the collaborative um, piece, and um, being able to to sort and arrange data and manipulate it the way um, you would want to just makes it easier overall. Does that? Appreciate it. Yeah. That that answers my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm next in the speaking order. So with all this technology. Two questions. One, the cost goes up, and two, uh, people just can work twenty four seven from from anywhere, so they don't get a vacation. So, yes, the cost yeah, goes up. The cost the cost does go up. Yeah, it does cost more for the for Office three sixty five, but um, um, the benefits of it um, we feel are is worth it, um, and you can work all the time now. Well, we appreciate you working all the time. I don't like working all the time. <laughs> all right, I'll just see if there's anybody else on round uh, requiring a round two. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Noyan. Yeah, just Trevor, just further to, to Mayor Kotcher's uh, remarks. So they, they, this is a very interesting presentation because usually the the other ones are a bit justifiable that we were we're gaining a tangible you know a cost savings or something like that so i, I do realize what this this will do for uh for the entire city and our staff um do you do you foresee because every every line in your budget uh or proposal here for the budget has a slight increase uh over last year's approved budget and do you see that that being a, a linear trend here in into the upcoming years and is that how generally software costing happens 
So are you referring to just software in general, kind of that? Uh, sorry, all of your budget items. Sorry, I, I, I went away from that page. No, no, I'm not just referring to software. I'm, I'm, I'm referring to all of your, your five the programs. So, so is the question then, uh, I'm not sure he's catching the question. Is it just the cost escalation? Yeah, cost escalation being linear, is that what you foresee happening in the, the upcoming years? Uh, I think it's it's kind of it's gonna be um for some stuff it is gonna keep going up and other stuff will stay the same. Um I don't think we'll see very many instances where where there's gonna be that cost savings where things are gonna drop in technology. Um so for the most part it's it's both staying the same and also that trend of, of stuff going up as well. Yeah, okay. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh that will do it for you. So uh, thank you very much, Trevor, and your staff for all the work that you do. Okay, we're going to try and push through one more, and I will invite um, uh, Bettina on People Services to present. And just on this one, if there's uh, any questions or anything on COLA, we would hold those over and go on camera um, at the next at our next meeting, just so that. Uh, we know what the parameters are on that. I'll go ahead and congratulations, Fatina, on uh, being the new director. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Worship and members of council. My name is Bettina Ryan. I am the director of People Services, and I'm here to present the 2022 People Services Operating Budget, which is located in Section 16 of the budget document. The many programs and services that benefit citizens each day are impossible without people, engaged city staff that take pride in customer service and their community. The People Services Department, located on the lower level of City Hall, is made up of six full-time and one half-time team members that support the organization in six program areas, health and safety, payroll and benefits administration, recruitment and orientation, classification and compensation, labor relations and corporate wide training and development. I will highlight four of people services, six program areas. The 1st are the payroll and benefits administration and the recruitment and orientation programs. These program areas have seen a considerable increase in work volumes resulting from the pandemic, such as changes to work status and government reporting requirements. Our department will continue to review these program areas for efficiencies, including technology, process improvement, and increased support from the people services assistant role. The second is classification and compensation. As per the non-union staff compensation policy, our department will be conducting a comprehensive salary survey to ensure both internal and external equity. These first two initiatives are new budget requests, and I will be reviewing them shortly. Finally, as a result of limited training opportunities due to the pandemic, our department will be reviewing corporate wide training and development to look at new and creative ways of delivering training to all city staff and to ensure staff are up to date on mandatory and professional development training. People Services has program changes for 2022 in the program areas of payroll and benefits, recruitment and orientation, and classification and compensation. The payroll and benefits administration and recruitment and orientation programs are both impacted by the request for the administrative assistant increased hours that I will be speaking to on the next slide. The classification and compensation program houses the salary and wage survey. This is a one-time project that I will also be presenting in a few moments. There are also two additional budget requests within the budget document specific to compensation and market adjustments that will initially be presented in camera. The first request, number 12-0165 for $20,000 is for the salary and wage survey and is funded by the Health, Safety and Wellness Reserve. As per Council Policy HUM 
sector non union a formal market survey shall be conducted every third calendar year. The last in-house salary and wage survey was conducted in 2019 with the support of an external consultant. The city ut utilizes an external expert in this field to ensure the best information is gathered and analyzed. The survey focuses primarily on non-union staff as collective bargaining is utilized with the union. Surveys allow the city to align salaries closer to those offered in comparable neighboring municipalities. Under priority-based budgeting, this request supports the classification and compensation program, which falls into quartile three, scoring the highest in both demand and population served basic program attributes and highest in service excellence governance results. This survey will provide useful information to attract, support, and retain employees and determine various wage levels based on the market average. The second, request number 12-0217 for $63,380 is an administrative assistant FTE increase. As the city has grown, the demand for payroll, benefits, and recruitment duties has increased. This request, if approved, will increase the front counter coverage for the departments in the lower level of City Hall from two days per week to five days per week. Additional support will be provided to the payroll and recruitment sections, where we have seen an increase in responsibility and workload, in part due to COVID-19. Increased complexity with government reporting requirements, benefits administration, and meeting critical payroll processing deadlines has created additional workload pressures for our one payroll and benefits coordinator. Under priority-based budgeting, this request supports the payroll and benefits administration and recruitment and orientation programs, which fall into quartile three, scoring the highest in both mandate and population served basic program attributes and highest in operational excellence governance results. An increase of hours requested for this position will help alleviate these workload pressures and provide the support needed and allows the department to maintain operations to help support our 423 amazing people in Team Fort Sask. That concludes my presentation and I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Bettina. And I'll just confirm um, anything to deal with the non-COLA uh, non compensation would be in camera. Yes. Okay. And so I don't think we're going to have time for that one today, but that could be our first one at our uh, next budget meeting. And we could go in camera immediately at the beginning of the meeting to discuss that. So uh, you can ask questions on any of the other ones and we'll reserve that one for in camera at the start of our next meeting. Okay. So Councillor Blizzard, you're first. Sure, I'm going to start with the uh, council remuneration. So it says in here, is that a um, cost of living increase or that's just to adjust for uh, other communities comparing them? I believe we're presenting that one in camera. Oh, sorry. Alrighty, missed that. Um, Mr. Fleming, did you have a comment on that? Uh, to your worship, I do think council remuneration would be separate from staff uh, remuneration in that regard. So I think you could ask the question now. Yeah, it didn't seem like one that would be hidden, but so would that be just a uh, increase to comparable communities? Yes. Is there cost of living on top of that possibly? The cost of living is done separately. It's done annually. Oh. So there would be one done in January. Okay, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Noyan. Thank you, Councillor Blizzard. Just ask my question. Uh, so maybe you come back to me. Thanks. I have no questions. Thank you. Councillor Macon. Sorry, I was choking. Okay. Um, I guess, so for the administrative position, um, 
I guess, how do you make the determination to go from two to five days a week? Do you have any comments around that? Um, yes. I believe um, your, through your worship to Councillor Macon. So one of the main reasons would be, um, of course, with the increase of um, reporting um, for our pay and benefits coordinator um, for government reporting. Um, and also even with the uh, recruitment area, um, just a lot, a, a increase in, um, for this year in particular, there was an increase in um, the recruitment process for positions that were going through a temporary or casual and that, um, and in those areas. So when we're, what we're seeing is that we're having our um, payroll and benefits coordinator and our recruitment administrator asking for assistance just to meet deadlines um, in regards to having um, recruitment out in a timely manner. Um, and then also in the payroll side of things, we do have the payroll um, and benefits. So it's a biweekly payroll. So we have one week, which would be focused on payroll processing. And then the second week would be focused on um, just anything outside of the standard processing. So what's happening is just having our pay and benefits coordinator having to respond to benefits questions. Um, you know, we have people that have been retiring, retirement questions, those types of things. She's, it just sometimes is delayed in getting back. So having a support from that extra person um, can allow her to focus on those other areas. Thank you. I guess, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Councillor Kelly. Just some history on this, if you could please. For your department, when was the last time we added a position in part time or full time to your department? How many years ago? Through your worship to Councillor Kelly, we added a part time, so 0 0.5 FTE in 2017, and that was the People Services Assistant. Perfect. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My questions have been asked and answered. Councillor Harris. Tina, um, obviously, when I look at the structure of any organization, uh, which I did professionally for many years, um, it, it's not common in my experience to have payroll lumped under HR. Uh, as an HR professional, what is your experience relative to that? Because I, I see payroll as typically a financial related thing with interaction with with HR from a hiring and a compensation standpoint. What's your experience? Your worship to Councillor Harris. Um, for myself, I do see there's a, a connection between human resources and finance. Um, from my experience, they've always been connected. Um, prior to working for the city, um, I have worked for um, private industry. Um, and in those situations, it, the finance area did tend to take on the payroll. Um, so, but with municipalities, we're actually seeing other municipalities also starting to combine those um, two areas. Um, I believe a lot of the reason for that is with payroll, um, there's a connection, of course, with recruitment um, and, and that type of thing as well, getting all of that paperwork through. Um, and also when it comes to questions from staff, um, you know, in regards to um, perhaps changes with taxation and things like that, um, a human resources perspective can help with those areas or, you know, with the pandemic, of course, having to do, uh, you know, temporary layoffs or records of employment, um, that pay and benefits person um, would have that HR approach rather than just the finance side of things. Yeah, and that's a structural thing that ultimately is is determined through our senior management team. Uh, I was just curious what your role was because we're adding resources, but if we didn't add them here, we'd add them in finance because we have the function to uh, deliver. So thanks very much. Um, I, I won't belabor that point. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anything else on round two? Okay, thank you very much, Bettina. So I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Dance to summarize our day and uh, just uh, brief us on our start for the next day. 
Thank you, Your Worship. 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 Can, can I uh, just b before uh, Mr. Dance? Uh, there, there are two items that, that I would like to flag. Uh, that was I was going over them in my mind, and and I would like to to have them flagged. I haven't flagged anything yet, uh, and they're from earlier in the day. Can I do that now? Okay. If you'd like to tell me what they are, because we'll have to ask. Sorry, give me one second here. Oh. Sorry about that, John. Yeah, the, the first one is the West River <laughs> SB planting. It's 72 0114. And what are you asking? What what is it that you want from that? Because uh, just further discussion. Okay, I would have to okay, council. Um, is there opposition? Any opposition to that? I missed the reference, uh, Mayor Catcher. Could I have that again, please? Which request? So West River's Edge tree planting. That would be in parks, I think. Can you give us the number again, please? It's 72 0114. Mr. Fleming, did you have a comment or question? Uh, Your Worship, no, I didn't. I thought I might end up needing to say something, but I did not. So it's fine. Okay. So I would I would have to ask um Councillor Noyan, when you say further discussion, we would need to know what it is that you want to flesh out. Otherwise, I would probably require you to put a motion on because I probably wouldn't support this going forward without knowing, like flagging it without knowing. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. I I, I personally am in disagreement with uh, the money allocation and the project. And I would like to have the opportunity to to explain that and then. Then go from there with other members of council. Okay, um, so I'll ask uh, council: Is there any anyone that would object to having that flag to have more discussion on it? Councillor Harris, you're in opposition. Um, you know, um, Councillor Noyan is new, and uh, it's his first budget, and uh, he's raised an observation about the tree planting, which I totally disagree with. But I agree with the concept of having conversations if it helps a member of council um, come to grips with something that maybe they just need to get their their arms around. Um, I'm fully supportive of the tree planting program. It makes sense. There's carbon offsets. There's all kinds of stuff. So if it helps him process it better, well, then I'm okay with that. But other than that, I would probably not support it. From that standpoint, because I totally agree with the program. So it's up to everybody else too. That's my point. Okay. So unless I see actually, <clears throat> Councillor Kelly, we it might be appropriate right now just to take a minute and and talk about our budget process. So we come back at the end of this process and we review the flagged flagged items, but at that particular time. Any counselor can address any budget item and ask for it to be reconsidered by council and or removed. Is that correct? That's correct. And if so somebody this, felt st strongly right now that they wanted something removed, I mean, they can just as the uh, additional money for the uh, outdoor rink, if somebody felt strongly that they wanted to get into discussion and debate on it, they could actually put a motion on during during this portion of it and not flag it. All right, so given that information, then I will remove my request to flag this item at this time. Okay, I'm just going to go back to Council. Sorry, I'll come back to you in a second. Councillor Kelly was asking process. Well, and I asked that process to help everybody understand it. It doesn't need to be flagged to be readdressed before the budget process is over. The flagging That's correct. Is, the flagging is normally aimed at information. That's correct. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kelly. Yeah, I appreciate that. Was there a second one? 
Uh, no, I'm I'm going to uh, yeah. No, I'm I'm good. Sorry, and and I apologize, Mr. Dance, uh, interrupting before you. It's your okay. It's your first budget meeting. That's okay. Um, okay, so we will. Sorry, Your Worship. Just and and I agree with everything that's been said on process. <clears throat> it is a counselor is able to um, make resolutions uh, or make motions at the end. The flagging process does help administration though. So. Um, because it, it gives us a sense for what items will be coming back for debate. That's not th that certainly doesn't preclude anything from coming back. But um, yes, the flagging is attached to both information and it gives administration an idea of of um, what's coming. So what I can do though is I can talk to Councillor Noyan offline and find out what the other one was and go from there. So okay, thank you. Thank you I will go to you. Mr. Dance to uh, close us out before we adjourn. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just recap where we're at. So we have made it through uh, most of corporate services. So on Tuesday, when we come back, uh, Tuesday, the 23rd of November, we'll pick up with uh, corporate communications, legislative services, senior leadership, elected officials, user fees and charges and community grants and programs. On Tuesday, we have time specifics for the library and Heartland Housing at uh, 9 and 930. So we'll also talk about the timing, the best timing for in camera, um, whether we want to start a little bit earlier on Tuesday or do it uh, later in the day um, for that. So basically, we will be doing work on our flagged items and information requests and hopefully putting a package together for for the end of this week to be able to get out to Council. I think we're at uh, we are at 13 flags and then further information requests. I think there's about eight, approximately eight more uh, just information requests, but most of those flags have uh, information attached to them as well. So I think that's all I have. I assume many people have to get outside now and, and do some shoveling, so. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I will leave the logistics up to you on when we're going to go on camera to finish that one, because we will have to uh, adhere to the 9 o'clock and 9.30 on those two presentations. So thank you, everyone. And with that, we are adjourned at 4.06. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night.